My name is Kendall Hayes. I'm a 3L at the University of St. Thomas School of Law, and I am the symposium editor um, for the St. Thomas Journal of Law and Public Policy. I'd like to welcome you all to the symposium of revitalizing public goods. Before we get going, I just want to do a few introductions. First, I'd like to introduce the editor in chief, Thomas Maygard. He has been instrumental behind the scenes and is helping to put together the symposium, and he'll be doing some introductions today. Um, next, I'd like to introduce Dr. Reed, JLPP's faculty advisor and an esteemed professor at the school. This symposium was his brainchild and would not have been possible without his hard work. Um, Dr. Reed will be moderating, moderating the event today. And lastly, I'd like to introduce the Dean of the University of St. Thomas School of Law, Dean Vischer. Dean has, a, Vischer has agreed to say some few words to help us kick off the day. So please join me in welcoming Dean Vischer to the podium. Uh, thanks, Kendall, and welcome to St. Thomas, uh, everyone. I especially want to thank our student editors who've worked really hard putting this together, and uh, Dr. Reed, as well as our speakers for investing time in this really important discussion. Uh, before we begin, I would like to just briefly frame the conversation about public goods through the lens shaped by the fact that St. Thomas is a Catholic law school. Uh, to be clear, the Catholic Church is not prescribed a one-size-fits-all template uh, for the role of government in society, but the Church does chart a course for a community that aspires to take seriously the common good. And if we're going to think about an expanded role for government, we have to think about the common good. Today's invocations of the common good are often unhelpfully vacuous, but Aristotle got to the heart of the matter by linking social welfare with the possibility of conflicting values, a nascent embrace of value pluralism. In contrast to Plato, who attempted to eliminate potential grounds of conflict, such as private property and exclusive sexual relations, Aristotle defended the importance of interpersonal bonds. In Martha Nussbaum's words, Aristotle saw in the good city that the contingent conflict of values is a condition of the richness and vigor of civic life itself. Particular bonds and loyalties among citizens provide civic life with sources of motivation and concerns that could be found in no other way. Put simply, personal separateness is an essential ingredient of human social goodness. Fast forward to Thomas Aquinas, the namesake of our university, who made the link explicit. He acknowledged the place of pluralism when he recognized that prudence entails different actions depending on the community in which the actor is located. Subjects of a monarchy act prudently in a different way than citizens of a democracy. But every form of prudence, he insisted, will direct the individual to the common good on which her individual good depends. Ordering society according to the collective good has marked the range of totalitarian regimes across history, but a fixation on the collective good can also operate more subtly, not so much as the chosen end of civilization, but as the chosen means of securing laudable goals. The French Revolution famously enshrined the ideals of liberty and equality by imposing them on the society in an unmistakably top-down manner insisting that the principle of all sovereignty resides essentially in the nation and that no body or authority may exercise any authority that does not proceed directly from the nation. A single source of authority is inimical to the common good as is the opposite extreme of casting each individual as a self-sufficient atomistic sovereign. The French philosopher Jacques Maritain explains Quote, the common good is common because it is received in persons, each one of whom is a mirror of the whole. In Maritain's work, as elucidated by Patrick Brennan, quote, the common good is not the collection or a summation of private goods, neither, it is, neither is it the good of a whole such that the goods of the components are sacrificed to the good of the whole. Rather, it is the shared life of a political community of free persons living oriented toward justice, friendship, and the transcendent. 
The individual has a stake in the common good, even though she remains inferior and subordinated to the whole and must, as an organ of the whole, serve the common work. But she is not simply incorporated into the whole. She stands apart and her flourishing cannot be equated with the interests of the collective, though they are inescapably related. So the posture of humility required on the state's part is captured by the philosopher Joseph Piper, who observes that, quote, it is impossible to give a truly exhaustive definitive definition of the common good, for no one can state with complete finality what the potentialities of the human community are, what the human community fundamentally is, just as it is impossible to give an exhaustive account of everything contained in man's good for the sake of which man exists and which he has to realize in his life is to be said of him, that all of his potentialities have been brought to fruition. Put more concretely, a five-year state plan to increase industrial production is not problematic, but fatally destructive of the common good would be the elevation of such a plan to an exclusive standard to which not only the production of goods is subordinated, but also the work at the universities, the creative activity of the artist, and the use of leisure. The state, as society's only legitimate purveyor of coercive force, must act with deference toward the dimension of the common good that is not defined by the collective will. This is why it is so important that the state recognize and respect the rights needed to protect the human person from overbearing state incursions on individual and associational autonomy. The state self-restraint cannot be absolute, for the common good requires a level of social justice and order that only state authority can ensure. But the exercise of state authority must be premised on a vision of society that is not always apparent in today's rights-based discourse. Are the answers clear? Hardly. That's why I'll turn it over to the experts now. These are vital and difficult questions, and I'm grateful for their willingness to guide our exploration. Welcome to St. Thomas. We are glad you're here, and I'll turn it over to Dr. Reed. Dean Vischer, thank you for, uh, for that wonderful introduction, that wonderful welcome. And we should, um, we, we should ponder a bit further the uh, topics we will be addressing today. We'll be looking at the idea, the ideal of the public good, and we'll be addressing it in the context of, of a political uh, situation where we've seen the steady erosion of a neoliberal paradigm that came into place firmly in the 1980s or in the 1990s. Uh, scholars disagree in precisely its origin. We, uh, neoliberal paradigm that stressed trade, that stressed a, a reduced role for government, that stressed economic governmental austerity. There was a faith, a commitment to the ideal and idea of entrepreneurship, a, a, a belief, a, a stirring belief in, in the private sector privatization and, and a corresponding reduction of the concept of, of public goods. Recent political developments on the left and on the right make clear the limits of this paradigm. Indeed, there are those who argue that the neoliberal paradigm has run its course. Uh, and we should therefore ask the question, what comes next? How do we, can we revitalize a concept of public goods? And we've seen uh, uh, political philosophers, we've seen Pope Francis uh, uh, address this in, in his writings. We've seen political philosophers of both the left and the right begin to ad address this topic. It is uh, the neoliberal paradigm, uh, certainly if it has not run its course, it, it may be very nearly uh, to its end. And the question arises, what comes next? And we have here um, uh, gathered together a group of scholars who will ponder this question. We have the idea of public good. The public good could embrace things like parks, monuments, museums, or rights to uh, uh, basic goods like food, health care. Uh, the, the, the range of possibilities, in other words, is vast. The, the, the work is urgent. And we could spend days on this and, and, and gather together panels of, of dozens or hundreds of experts. We cannot, given our, our, our limitations, do that. But we have gathered here in the course of, uh, of today, we have gathered here scholars who will address uh, the public good 
as it relates to agriculture, as it relates to climate, as it re relates to private property and, 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 the, uh, and the public interest, as it relates to infrastructure. We have scholars here who look at education, look at public service, look at public health, look at the issues of labor and employment. Uh, the list is large, the list could be much larger. Uh, but uh, we, uh, we, we have, in other words, uh, we are, I hope, making a start on answering, I think, one of the great, urgent, compelling questions of the day. And I'd, again, like to welcome you all here and, and thank you all for being here. Well, good morning once again. And we are ready to introduce our keynote speaker, who is Professor Alfredo Saad Filo. He is Professor of Political Economy and International Development and Head of the Department of International Development at King's College, London. Uh, he um, has recently written a book. Uh, it was published in uh, earlier this year called The Age of Crisis, Neoliberalism, the Collapse of Democracy and the Pandemic. A and uh, in this book, he traces, develops the paradoxes of our day and he identifies paradoxes that include an economic paradox. We have simultaneously a vast accumulation of wealth uh, through uh, processes such as financialization. We see a declining uh, GDP. We see deteriorating employment conditions. We have a political paradox. We have the, the ossification, the, 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 the stiffening, the freezing up of representative democracy. Uh, the the uh, the uh, the uh, relative collapse of, the, of broad collaborative decision making. At the same time, we see decision making become the prerogative uh, of private uh, private unaccountable entities and agencies. Similarly, we see a rise uh, a paradox of authoritarianism. Politics has become celebrityhood. Politics has become centered around personalities, around individuals. It is politics a spectacle. Uh, where will this end? This is the subject of, uh, of Professor uh, Philo's book, The Age of Crisis. He's written provocatively, thoughtfully, importantly, on issues of neoliberalism over the, over the past uh, really two decades. I'll call attention to a couple of, of, of recent essays. One that came out, uh, was published last year and entitled um, COVID, uh, from COVID-19 to the end of, of neoliberalism. It is, uh, it, it, it is written primarily in Portuguese, but the uh, point of the, um, uh, of, of the article is, uh, the point uh, is to illustrate that neoliberalism, the pandemic is challenging fundamentally some ideals about neoliberalism as we see an emerging role for public authority, public health, uh, an emerging role for um, concerns like universal health care as a response to the, uh, to the uh, crisis of the pandemic. We see another article of his crisis in neoliberalism or, or the subtitle, the crisis of neoliberalism that stresses the, the uh, rise, the singular rise of, of, of uh, neoliberalism and its uh, relationship with financialization. It anticipates, I think very well, the emergence of the populist movements we've seen of the last five or seven years both on the left and on the right, I could go on. I think, however, I should introduce, uh, without further ado, um, uh, Professor Alfredo Saad Filo, and I want to thank you. Thank you uh, very much for being here and, and addressing these concerns with, with, with uh, our audience. Thank you very much, Dr. Reed. I'm absolutely delighted uh, to be here uh, with you um, this, uh, this morning. Uh, thank you for this invitation. It will be a pleasure to um, discuss these topics uh, with you. Um, first thing I would like to do is to try and share my screen if my uh, technical uh, incompetence uh, permits. So let's see if I can do this uh, properly. Can, can you see the title page? I should take that You're as a good. yes. Yes. Okay, fabulous. Thank you very much. So um, my um, address to you today focuses on neoliberalism um, and the uh, evolving, developing crises of neoliberalism and where can we uh, think uh, of alternatives to, uh, to transcend, to overcome um, neoliberalism. Um, 
Now, the, the first difficulty we have is that neoliberalism, as Dr. Reed mentioned previously, is a term that is used a lot in the social sciences and, uh, and, in, the, uh, and in the media, but usually often without a very clear content. And a lot of my work in this area has been to uh, try and contribute to the analytical grounding uh, uh, of this concept, because I think it is hugely important um, in order to understand um, society, the economy and politics uh, today. Now for all the talk that we see about neoliberalism, it is um, difficult and known to be difficult to try and uh, understand what it is. And the concept remains disputed, uh, heavily disputed within uh, the social sciences. So this is the first challenge that we have. Uh, yet, um, something that I believe can be um, defined and distinguished and examined uh, dominates um, ideology, uh, policymaking, uh, and social organization uh, today. And that is all beyond the economy. And one of the um, challenges for us now is, is to address what it is. Now, clearly, neoliberalism is conservative and neoliberal thought is conservative thought. It is associated with the political right, but it is not just any kind of uh, conservative um, thought. Neoliberal thought has uh, specific uh, features um, and those features and those ideas, they, they rule the world. They, they inform policymaking in most, not all countries, but in most countries, they are the also uh, the bedrock of the common sense of our age. Uh, and this makes them hugely important in our lives. They are the things that don't need to be discussed, that are accepted without uh, the need for a conversation about them. And they have, um, the neoliberal ideas have very clear principles. They have um, principles about the importance of property rights. Uh, then I have tried to illustrate those principles with the quotes uh, by prominent neoliberal thinkers that, that you have on, on screen. They have principles uh, that value uh, inequality, that um, look at distribution and that look at the economic role of the state. Principles that have to do with the meaning of liberty, uh, that have to do with the role of the individual uh, in society, that have to do with governance that have to do with the importance of ideas uh, and, the, uh, and the value of being able to control uh, what ideas are diffused uh, and how. Uh, and they have to do with the uh, notions of the efficiency of the public sector versus the private, private sector. So the notion of the collective, what is the role of the collective in social uh, life? This is all hugely important or structuring the ways in which society functions. Now, in my view, we live uh, today, and this is by no means accepted by everyone, but we live, in my view, we live today in the age of neoliberalism. Uh, and this is not just about um, dominant ideas uh, or uh, policies. Neoliberalism, in my view, is the current stage or the current phase or the current mode of existence of global uh, capitalism. It is a phase, a stage, a mode of existence that emerged after the end of the post-war uh, boom and that spread uh, from its main basis in the United States and in the United Kingdom, uh, spread throughout the global north through Atlanticism, and it spread uh, to the global south through the Washington Consensus. In my view, uh, the most important feature of neoliberalism is financialization. Financialization in the sense of the subordination of economic reproduction and social reproduction, uh, subordination of those forms of reproduction to the logic of finance, to the accumulation of financial capital in all forms that uh, financial capital takes. And the driver of this process of financialization, in my view, is the transfer of state capacity to allocate resources uh, from the state itself 
to a globally integrated financial system that is dominated by institutions, uh, public and private institutions based in the United States. And it is this process that has allowed finance to control the most important sources of capital and the most important levers uh, of uh, economic policy uh, in most countries. And it also permitted the restoration uh, of the US empire after the defeat um, in, the, in Vietnam, after the defeat with the Iranian uh, revolution and after the dollar crisis in the 1970s. Now, neoliberalism led to an extraordinary recovery of profitability uh, since the lows of um, profit rates um, in the turn from the 1970s to the 1980s. This is what you see on the first graph uh, on the top uh, in this slide. Um, so profitability recovered. You can see the recovery uh, from the mid 1980s. You can see the decline in profits uh, with the uh, global financial crisis around 2008, 9, uh, 10, but then profits recovered uh, until, until the onset of the um, recent pandemic or the still ongoing pandemic. Um, but financialization, while it permitted this recovery of profitability, also uh, increased immensely a sphere of speculation that is inseparable from the operation of finance uh, itself. This is what financial institutions uh, do. They transfer value, they permit investment to take place, and they fuel a sphere of autonomous uh, speculation. And in doing this, finance and the financial institutions have been appropriated an increasing share of the total value produced in the economy. Finance tends to employ more and more uh, people, and finance traditionally uh, has the highest salaries of all the major economic sectors. So the appropriation of increasing shares of value by uh, finance has tended to support the concentration of income. We'll come back to this. So in the United States, for example, and I use the United States, not just because you're based in the United States, but because uh, the data is more easily uh, available for the US and it is of course the most influential uh, economy within the neoliberal camp. Um, in the United States, the profits captured by financial institutions were around 10% of total profits uh, in the period following the Second World War. Uh, and they rose in the age of neoliberalism to, um, towards 40%. Uh, touching on 41% in 2002. The share declined uh, immediately after the global financial crisis, but very rapidly recovered to between 20 and 30% of total profits. Now these are, since finance is not directly produ uh, productive of value, these are transfers from the non-financial corporate sector, and they have contributed again to the uh, polarization of incomes uh, under uh, neoliberalism. The next significant feature of neoliberalism is the transnationalization of production and finance that in common uh, discourse is, we all call globalization in inverted commas. And this is about the international integration of the circuits of accumulation at the level of individual firms, no longer at the level of countries, but now at the level of individual firms. And then to support this process, uh, to underpin this process, the liberalization of trade, of domestic finance, and of international capital flows. Next is the state. Um, we're going to come back to this, but neoliberalism is not about the withdrawal of the state or the reduction of the size of the state or about the rolling back of the state in any significant way. It's not. Uh, this is a discourse for propaganda. This is a discourse for the masses. Uh, it's very clear, this notion within neoliberal thought. What neoliberalism uh, does have is a discourse for the masses, and this is the discourse where withdraw, the, the state is inefficient and the state should be uh, reduced in size, it should withdraw from social life. Uh, but in fact, the state needs to be strong. The neoliberal state has to be large. It has to be interventionist in a particular way. Uh, it is the neoliberal state that legitimizes neoliberalism itself in the ideological domain. It is the state that transfers, transfers to finance control over the sources of capital. It's the state that introduces the new 
neoliberal legal framework. It is the state that puts together the new industrial structure, the new financial structure. It is the state that privatizes public assets. It's the state that commercializes services, that withdraws social security. It's the state that imposes means-tested uh, benefits. It is the state that enforces private sector uh, performance criteria on the public institutions uh, themselves. It is, of course, the state that represses the, uh, the opposition. So neoliberalism uh, in this context, um, it uh, was able to lead to um, rising profit rates. It also led to growing inequality. Remember the importance of inequality for neoliberal uh, thought. It also had the consequence of leading to declining rates of investment and GDP growth, particularly in the advanced capitalist economies in the OECD even though neoliberalism had created unprecedentedly favorable conditions for accumulation worldwide. The West won the Cold War. Trade, finance, and capital movements have been liberalized worldwide. Competing states now provide unprecedented support to accumulation. Tax rates have been cut, transfers have been cut, welfare provision has been cut. The traditional sources of resistance have been defeated. Nationalist movements, nationalist governments in the global South, trade unions, peasant movements, left-wing political parties, defeated. And neoliberalism has achieved ideological hegemony. So you give neoliberalism all the conditions that it wanted, and what happens? Accumulation in the core countries has been slowing down consistently decade on decade for five or six decades already. So throughout the uh, age of neoliberalism uh, and between 2007 and 2020, the West suffered the longest economic calamity uh, and the weakest and most regressive economic recovery on record. And this is what I call the economic paradox of neoliberalism, that the achievement of extraordinarily favorable conditions for accumulation was associated with a complete inability to realize those conditions in the form of real economic prosperity. So if you look at uh, GDP growth rates in the advanced economies in the OECD, they have fallen. And if you look at the world as a whole, also uh, GDP growth rates have tended to uh, decline to the extent that very recently our period was referred to as the great stagnation. And this is true for evidently for individual countries uh, as well. Now, financialization has influenced social reproduction and in doing this, it has imposed social discipline in full uh, significant ways. First, capitalism has uh, spread, globalized neoliberal capitalism has spread across Eastern Europe, Asia, Sub-Saharan Africa, and Latin America in, the, in recent decades. And production taking place in those areas has been integrated with globalized circuits of accumulation. And this has had the consequence of increasing competition within national working classes and between working classes in different countries. Second, technological innovations and the restructuring of production and changes to the patterns of employment. And then associated with that, um, restrictions to wages, to subsidies, to benefits, to entitlement systems, to all sorts of non-market protections that had been introduced previously under Keynesian regimes or developmentalist regimes or Soviet style socialist regimes dismantled to a significant extent. Then neoliberalism has imposed restrictive monetary and fiscal policies, at least before the um, global financial crisis and had retrenched the welfare state and associated that with easy credit policies. The state doesn't provide, the state doesn't transfer from the rich to the poor, but the state allows the poor to borrow to provide for themselves. 
Now the consequence has been that the poor increasingly, particularly in Anglo-Saxon economies have tended to become tangled up into financial circuits. Now previously it was through their paychecks. Initially, decades and decades ago, you would be paid at the end of the week in cash. You receive an envelope and you go home. Then you start being paid at the bank, your bank account. Then you have your credit card, then you have your mortgage, then you have your pension invested in the stock market, then you have to pay for education, for health, you have to pay for social provision, and then pressures for debt repayment as debt accumulates ex uh, exerts an enormous amount of discipline on people under the threat that they might lose their house, they might lose their car, uh, they might lose their reputation and then they can't borrow uh, anymore. And the consequence has tended to be to push people to work longer and longer hours in multiple jobs with casual contracts, with temporary contracts in very, very stressful uh, conditions. This, all this, I summarize under financialization of social reproduction. And the consequence, once again, has been rising profits, uh, profit rates and rising inequality at the same time. For illustration, total household debt in the United States in 1975 was in the region $734 billion. By 2006, so before the global financial crisis, debt was $13 trillion just in the United States. Now, under these uh, pressures, um, workers and the poor in very large numbers have tended to be drawn and were drawn um, in the 1990s and early 2000s, drawn into the logic of asset inflation to meet their needs by using their credit cards uh, and by turning their houses and their pensions into cash machines so that they could draw money and pretend to be earning higher salaries that, than they actually were uh, earning. So in that sense, personal debt was a compensation for the lack of good jobs, was the compensation for the lack of stable jobs, was the compensation for the withdrawal uh, of state uh, provision of basic uh, goods uh, and services. Uh, and that personal debt helped to ensure the achievement of higher uh, levels of consumption consumption that was the be all and end all of neoliberalism. Consumption is the way in which you validate yourself in neoliberal uh, society. And consumption served to mask, to disguise the uh, structural problems of social reproduction under neoliberalism. This is what I capture under this broad notion of financialization uh, of social uh, reproduction. Now, this, uh, the implications for uh, distribution are widely known. This is uh, what became known as the uh, U-shaped curve after the work of Thomas Piketty in his book, Capital in the 21st Century, that came out in 2013 and really captured the moment and became an instant bestseller, even though it's a dry uh, book written by uh, an economist to uh, economists. Now, what the U-shaped curve shows in this graph for the main Anglo-Saxon economies is at the beginning of the 20th century, the top 10% in the distribution of income had between 20, what, 20 something percent of uh, total uh, national income. That proportion of income appropriated by the top 10% declined significantly uh, especially after the Second World War and under the impact of the welfare state. But then under neoliberalism, concentration of income uh, once again. So we're now back to where we were in terms of distribution, back to where we were uh, over 100 years uh, ago. This is a consequence of neoliberalism. In the case of the United States, absolutely uncontroversial. No one disputes that the wage share of national income has tended to decline. Given the size of the US economy, a decline of 5% of GDP is absolutely uh, massive uh, and implies a substantial transfer from wages to profits, which is essentially what's been going on here. If the wage share falls, the profit share correspondingly rises. The main reason for that uh, effect is that wages have tended to uh, stagnate. Uh, in the case of the United States, 
uh, hourly real wages tended to peak in the early 1970s, around 1972 or 73, uh, and then uh, to stagnate, grow very, very slowly in recent periods. I'm excluding the recent uh, adjustment after the pandemic because we still don't understand what's going on uh, there. But looking at the longer term picture, it's absolutely uncontroversial. Uh, real wages have tended to stagnate. Now, you can look at it in more detail. Uh, if you look at the at the uh, purple line, that's pro economic productivity. Productivity, uh, economic productivity in the United States is very, very regular. It rises about 2.5 to 2.75 percent per annum, and has done so since the Second World War. No change there. It's essentially a straight line. And until uh, the early 1970s, hourly wages were rising together with productivity. So if wages are rising together with productivity, everybody's gaining and the distribution of, e of income doesn't change. Now, in the beginning of the 1970s, as I uh, indicated previously, wages, uh, real wages stopped rising. So if you look at the lower green line, that is real wages. They basically stagnated and opened a wedge between productivity that continued to rise and wages that were stagnant. And what is here in the middle is the additional capture of profits. If wages are not rising, profits are rising correspondingly. And the um, darker green line in the middle, that's household income. How can household income uh, rise uh, a bit, but it did rise, uh, when uh, real wages are not rising? And the answer is because people are working longer hours. Households are working longer hours. This is um, retired people going back into the labor market. This is students uh, going back or going into the labor market. This is housewives exiting the home and going into, or ex partly exiting the home and going into the labor market. It's households working more for the same wages than their income rises. But the consequence is that you, you have to work more, more hours. Now, if you disaggregate wages, then again, the picture is very, very clear. For the lowest paid wages, um, in the United States, but it's exactly the same for the case of the UK and for most advanced economies, uh, perhaps less dramatic, but uh, still true. The lowest wages haven't moved uh, for uh, a very long time. But the, the, as you go up the distribution of wages, then they start to go up as well. So for the highest levels of wages, uh, wages have risen by what, 40, 30 or 40% uh, since 1973. So the poorer you are, the more stagnant your wage is, the richer you are, the more privileged you are, uh, the more your income rises. A picture of growing inequality uh, once again. If you look at the relationship between incomes and years of education, then you have a similar picture once again. If you have less years of education, less than high school in this case, wages have tended to decline uh, over time in the age of neoliberalism, declined by 20 something percent. The more years of education you have, the more your salaries tended to rise. And if you have an advanced um, degree, university plus, then your income increased by more than 30% in the age of neoliberalism. Inequality growing from another point of view. If you look at, um, Men uh, with only a high school uh, diploma, if you look at the uh, orange line, that shows incomes, real incomes tending to decline over time. And if you look at the blue line, that is the total number of jobs declining uh, as well. So, um, or, the, or the share of employment declining uh, as well. So you lose both ways if your income is, uh, your, if your level of education is lower, if your years of education are less, you tend to lose in terms of less opportunities for employment and because your income goes down uh, as well. And then if you look at uh, the accumulation uh, of uh, wealth at the top, this uh, illustration is for, from the uh, new book by Gabriel Zuckman and Emmanuel Saez, The Triumph of Injustice. Uh, the uh, bottom 50%, the, 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 the uh, pink orangey um, circles uh, crawling along the bottom of this, uh, of this graph, wealth of the bottom 50% of the population in the United States is roughly constant throughout the age of neoliberalism, while the wealth of the top 1% of the population has increased immensely 
in the same period of time. That is where those stagnant wages went. They went to the very richest uh, in society. And part of the reason why well, it's not just that wages stagnated, it's also that the tax rates uh, of the rich have converged towards the tax, uh, the taxes paid by the poor. And this is absolutely uh, shocking, uh, but it is true. So when some individual um, rich um, persons, particularly in the, in the United States, but elsewhere to complain that they are paying as uh, much tax as their secretary pays, even though they, their means are incomparably uh, more, this is correct. Taxation for the rich has declined enormously, while taxation for the poor hasn't moved very much uh, at all. Now, the consequence inevitably is this type of picture, a picture of prosperity for the rich. And the richer you are, the more prosperous economically you tend to become. The poorer you are, tendentially, the poorer you tend to become. A picture of divergence, a picture of inequality. And this is not just the case for the United States. You can go country after country uh, with the same, um, with very similar results. This is the, for Chile under the dictatorship of General Pinochet. It's exactly the same picture. The more, uh, the richer you are, if you are in the top 10%, your income rises by 50% throughout the dictatorship. The poorer you are linearly, the worse off uh, you become. An absolutely dramatic picture of inequality. The question is what are the processes that generate those distributional consequences. And one key process that I want to highlight is that neoliberalism restructured the economy very profoundly. And in doing this, changing the economic base of society, it created a very large array of what I call economic losers under neoliberalism, people who lost out economically lost out because millions of skilled jobs in particular and in the advanced economies have been eliminated because entire professions have vanished or were exported because employment opportunities in the public sector uh, declined because of privatizations and because of the retrenching of the public sector itself, because job stability declined and because pay and conditions and welfare uh, tended to deteriorate uh, as well. It was also similar. It's not just a working class problem. It's very similar for the middle class that increasingly, despite what superficially looks like, and it is in many ways a privileged economic position, they tend to be increasingly indebted, impoverished, anxious, and vulnerable. And it's not just a feeling, it is the reality of the middle class in many advanced economies. Now, in the advanced countries, those losses and those losers tend to be concentrated in the traditional skilled working class and among the poor. And that um, suggests that neoliberalism is the war of the rich against the poor. There is some truth to that, but neoliberalism is much more, uh, is much more than, uh, than just this. But also unquestionably, the consequence, is of, the consequence of neoliberalism is this one. This is not Photoshop. This, these are true images. The top one is in the city of Sao Paulo uh, in Brazil. Uh, and the bottom one is in Cape Town in South Africa. And this is the tendency under neoliberalism, the creation and the consolidation uh, of uh, patterns of drastic inequality. Now, historically, neoliberalism has been through uh, different periods uh, that are uh, divided uh, by the early 1990s and then by the global financial crisis. The first period is a period of transition, what I call a shock phase, very aggressive promotion of private capital, no regard for the consequences to establish neoliberalism as a fact on, in the ground. And that requires strong states, state intervention to contain labor, to destroy the left, to promote the transnational integration of capital and to put in place the new institutional frame uh, framework. A uh, phase that goes on from Chile in 1973 through um, Argentina to the US and the UK under Thatcher and Reagan uh, that closes historically uh, with the East Asian crisis in the mid-1990s. And we move into historically 
the second phase of neoliberalism, the, the third waste uh, phase, the mature phase. Um, this is a phase that is politically uh, exemplified, symbolized by Bill Clinton, by Tony Blair, by Gerhard Schroeder, a phase of consolidation of the hegemony of finance. It is a phase of state management of the new modalities of international integration of production. It's a phase of consolidation of neoliberal subjectivities through the colonization of the mind. And then people believe in neoliberalism. It is what it is. It is what exists out there, but it's now the right thing too. So at this point, there's no more space for the traditional left because society had changed, the economy had changed, and most people did not believe in uh, left-wing ideals uh, anymore. After the global financial crisis, we have a third period that is distinguished by the loss of legitimacy of neoliberalism. You give it everything it wants and it delivers the worst economic crisis in history. What is going on here? It's um, the loss of legitimacy because of the astronomical cost of salvaging finance instead of salvaging common families, instead of salvaging the poor, you salvage the banks. Why do you do that? That's the logic and the nature of neoliberalism. So the loss of legitimacy is a very significant development. For the first time, neoliberalism is maintained primarily by brute force. Now, in terms of uh, politics, uh, now there are two key tensions in neoliberal political theory that are very difficult to resolve. One is about the size of the state, the scope, the limits, the strength of the state. And the other is about the degree of democracy under neoliberalism. Now, usually, as I mentioned previously, the goal of the neoliberal reforms is presented as being to reduce the size of the state by some criteria, um, share of taxes in GDP, number of state-owned enterprises, number of civil servants, etc. That's completely irrelevant. And it's no surprise that when you look at this type of data, you will see no particular trend, even though society and the economy have changed uh, dramatically. The point is exactly what Hayek uh, highlights in the fourth bullet point here. It is the character of the volume of government intervention. So to look at the size of the state is completely irrelevant. To talk about rolling back the state is, is uh, misguided uh, in my view, because the neoliberal state is not there to extinguish itself. The neoliberal state is there to create a new type of government, a new type of society, a new type of citizenship, a new type of subjectivity towards what they see as a society of entrepreneurs, a society where there are no social problems. Unemployment is not a social problem. All problems are because of failures of the individual. There are no social problems at all. And in order to resolve those problems, you need to change individual behavior. You need to drill into people a change in behavior instead of asking for the state to intervene and, sa and save them. No one should be saved at the expense of anybody else is the logic of neoliberalism. So neoliberalism involves then the creation of a logic of competitiveness. Neoliberalism is a political rationality. Uh, it seeks to change the uh, action of the rulers and to change the conduct of the ruled. This is what it's about, essentially. And that creates a tension between neoliberalism and democracy. So in 1944, Hayek publishes The Road to Serfdom and he defends capitalism against central planning and he defends capitalism against the claim that capitalism leads to fascism. And Hayek says, absolutely not, that this does not happen. But what we need to do is to guarantee market freedom as the fundamental guarantee of, of, of liberty. And only in those circumstances, we can have democracy and political freedom uh, as well. Now, this does generate a set of tensions within neoliberal thought, tensions that are very difficult uh, to, um, to resolve. And that became um, humorously clear in the correspondence that uh, Hayek sent to the, the Times of London newspaper back in 1978, uh, defending Margaret Thatcher before Margaret Thatcher was prime minister. She was leader of the opposition at that time. Hayek was a privileged advisor. Uh, and Hayek was also reporting the joy that he had going to Chile and visiting Chile under General Pinochet and saying people are more free now than they were before. 
in the government of Salvador uh, Allende. So neoliberalism has a particular understanding of what freedom means, and it's essentially freedom of uh, to keep property, freedom to trade. That is the meaning of freedom. And democracy, political democracy, has to be a consequence of that, and it has to be subordinate to um, subordinate to that. Now. When we look at the ways in which neoliberalism has evolved over time, um, we see um, limitations, globalization of production, disintegrate systems of provision, creates patterns of employment that are undesirable, financial markets drain capital from production, create economic volatility, create economic instability and crises. Neoliberal policies reduce the coordination between economic sectors, those policies are not self-correcting. You cannot change policy effectively uh, in the age of neoliberalism and neoliberalism hollows out political uh, democracy and leads to the crisis of democracy that we witness uh, in the world uh, today. This I have um, highlighted uh, in the form of three paradoxes. I've mentioned the economic paradox. You give neoliberalism all the economic conditions uh, it might want, and it delivers crisis and instability. The political paradox is that as uh, neoliberal democracies uh, spread around the world, um, the political order, the, the democratic elements in the political order were undermined by the economic order of neoliberalism, leading to the rise of a spectacular, what I call spectacular political leaders. Uh, who uh, promised to address the problems of neoliberalism by imposing more neoliberalism together with different forms of personality cult. And this leads to the paradox of authoritarian neoliberalism, which is those spectacular leaders are committed to neoliberalism and committed to their own personal power uh, as well, um, but they are not able to address the problems of neoliberalism and pursue a politics of confrontation, division, and strife by way of not resolving all the problems, but shifting attention away uh, from their inability to address the desires, the wants that their own voters have expressed in voting for them. So what I see now, now is neoliberalism going into a prolonged period of crisis politics, uh, a crisis politics that cannot deliver stability and that is likely to lead to the emergence of new forms of fascism as neoliberal economies face crises after crises and prolonged stagnation and neoliberal politics confronts the disaggregation uh, of traditional forms of uh, democracy. In this, um, alternatives might emerge, alternatives that go all the way to utopian socialism, what Marx called the utopian socialism back in the 19th century, where social change comes from the progress of the human mind, comes from scientific discoveries, coming from, come from education, to social democracy that was dominant in Western Europe, at least, uh, in the post Second World War period, but social democracy that self destructed uh, by being unable to resolve the problems of unemployment, uh, decline of growth rates, uh, and rising inflation uh, in the 1970s. The Zapatista Initiative in Mexico, extremely interesting uh, grounds up um, initiative, but with no aspiration to capture power, no aspiration to change um, government policy. Or the pink tide in Latin America that um, achieved significant gains in poverty reduction, but was ultimately defeated in recent years, not having changed the, the economies of those Latin American countries that continue to be um, dependent on primary product exports and deindustrialize themselves. New left alternatives emerging um, in the United States in the UK, across Europe, but stumbling heavily against resistance, um, difficulties of organization and, um, and uh, successive experiences of uh, defeat, similar with anti-austerity uh, movements. So where are we then? And I will stop um, 
here. We have, a, we have looked at the material basis, what I call the material basis of neoliberalism. And we notice a tension between the deployment of democratic political forms uh, to implement exclusionary economic policies. You see the contradiction. I mean, democracy as an inclusive political system tasked with enforcing excluding uh, policies uh, on the economic domain. This leads necessarily, inevitably, to a state that is hostile to the majority of the population, even though a democratic state is supposed to respond to majority pressure. We have now then a structural political crisis. We have also a structural economic crisis under, under neoliberalism, a neoliberalism that is highly unstable, very strong in the ideological domain, but very unstable uh, as well. And I think. Uh, attempts or the creation of perspectives to transcend neoliberalism have to focus on, in my view, what defines and distinguishes the left, which is concerns with equality, with collectivity, with economic democracy, political democracy, in the restoration of the public sphere and the notion of public goods. And this requires a project of decommodification and definancialization of social reproduction, focusing, I suggest, on what is immediately urgent to the vast majority of people. That's health, education, transport, housing, uh, and so on, the public goods. If we can do this, and if we can mobilize around those areas, then I think we have a fighting chance of intervening on neoliberalism, transforming it, transcending it before before the next pandemic, before environmental catastrophe, because now neoliberalism will not be able, as we have seen, to address mass social problems, for example, a health pandemic or a mass social problem in the form of climate change. Now, there is scope for these programs. This has been demonstrated most recently in the United States through the Bernie Sanders campaign, through the Black Lives Matter movement, fantastic movement in the UK through the movement in support of Jeremy Corbyn in the Labour Party, in Greece through the Syriza administration, at least the rise of that administration, in Brazil through the Workers' Party, but each or in Spain through Podemos, each and every one of those experiences ended in failure. But each and every one of those experiences accumulated knowledge and understanding and experience that may serve us uh, well in future as new waves of mobilization against neoliberalism uh, emerge. I am a realist, I hope, but I am also very optimistic. Uh, optimistic that maybe we are starting to find forms of organization that are effective uh, and that we can now move on to build this new wave of movements that can finally transcend neoliberalism. I think this is what we have to do. Thank you very much and apologies for the time. Uh, Professor Saad Filo, thank you uh, for a wonderful presentation. Thank you for, uh, for serving as, as, as the perfect keynote for the, the event that we have today. I do have a question, and the question uh, comes from what I'm observing as a rather spontaneous, uh, discreet movement in the United States, and it's captured the imagination of some of the, uh, the economic press. It's called the Great Resignation. What we're seeing in the United States is, is the first spontaneous labor unrest, I think, since the 1930s. I don't know where it's going to lead. I don't think anyone knows where it's going to lead, but I'm wondering if you have any comments or observations on this movement. This is a fascinating process that I, I don't think anyone had anticipated. I think most economists were expecting uh, the economy to bounce back into basically what it was before, which was problematic in itself. But all of a sudden, exactly as you have described, there is this massive movement of workers, and not just in the United States, in the UK, uh, in um, perhaps less, uh, less dramatically, because the UK labor market is less, um, more rigid or less uh, flexible um, than the US uh, labor market. So there's a lot more mo mobility in the United States. 
I think the reason is that people have realized perhaps under the impact of the pandemic, under, under the, but this is just me um, su su suggesting something, realize that actually the job that they had before wasn't good. Actually, those jobs were terribly paid. And there has been a, a lot of research on what I sort of suggested here about the stagnation of wages and the way the ways in which workers have been disempowered and mistreated over a very long period of time. And maybe people are starting to say, I don't want to live like this. I want a job that is meaningful. I want a job that pays better. I want a job that allows me to satisfy my basic requirements as a citizen, as a human being in a, in a rich society. We're talking about immensely rich societies in material terms. So we should definitely consider that people want to realize their aspirations in um, significant ways. And they do not want to be mistreated uh, or threatened constantly with uh, job losses. There's a study of the World Bank not too long ago indicated that 75% of US workers have, had received threats from their bosses that they would lose their job uh, if they um, um, asked ask for pay increases, either because they would be dismissed or because the company would just close down and move uh, somewhere else. This is a dreadful situation to live in. Another point to, for us to consider is that this is the first time, this is the first generation in the history of capitalism where children will do worse economically than their parents did. So for three or 400 years, you could legitimize the, the economic sacrifices imposed on generations by saying, you hold on there, you bear with us because your children will do better than you did. And most of the time throughout history, this was actually true, but it is now no longer true. Now, how can you legitimize this? How can you ask people to sacrifice themselves to have terrible jobs, precarious jobs, earning very little money if their children will be even worse off than they are? This is a dramatic failure of neoliberalism. It's a dramatic failure of capitalism itself. So maybe, and in some ways I do hope that the great resignation carries on uh, and it shows uh, some spirit of uh, rebellion against the realities that we had before. I also hope that it consolidates into broader movements that are not just individuals looking for better paid jobs or better working conditions, fair enough, they should do that, but also turns into uh, wider movements for uh, better working conditions and higher salaries and a more equal society. Society is terribly unequal. If some millionaires can buy a rocket to fly out into space, what pointless exercise is that? While people starve and go bankrupt for lack of health care, this is an absurd state of affairs. It's immoral and it has to be changed. If it is to be changed through mass pressure, then there must be mass pressure to change it, I think. Well, thank you. I know one of our students has her hand up, uh, Dalia Estefanos. I, I'm sorry. Okay, um, I was just wondering, what is your insight regarding the rise of digital assets um, like cryptocurrency and how its tendency is to be more accessible to lower class individuals um, if you compare it to kind of the stock market now and how um, it's changing with digital assets and people who usually wouldn't invest are investing more and more now. And how do you see that impacting um, kind of the inequality capitalist trends in the next 10 to 20 years? It's a very important question and it's a very current topic. There, there, there's, a, there's an anecdote which I believe is, is not true, but there is this anecdote that in October 1929, the father of um, President Kennedy, uh, who was a very rich man and a big investor in the New York Stock Exchange, arrived in his office and he called in his team um, and he said, sell everything, sell all our shares, sell everything. And his advisor says, but why? Why would we do that? Stock market is doing so well. Economy is doing so well. We, we, we should keep on investing. And he said, sell everything. Because this morning I went to the shoe shine 
and I was having my shoe shined and, and the shoe shine boy started giving me tips uh, about shares I should invest in. And when the shoe shine boy gives you tips, this means the market is, is overblown, there is a bubble and it's time to get out. And the anecdote concludes that he did sell uh, everything and avoided the stock market crash uh, and became um, super rich uh, in the process, or at least preserved his wealth while everybody else uh, lost. The point of this uh, is that the people who win in financial markets are usually the rich and the powerful and the big institutions that can have a lot of people working, doing background research, people who have contacts, people who know how to trade, um, and the people who lose, the people who pay for the Ferraris and the Maseratis of the traders and the financial market operators are the poor people who are conned into investing in extremely volatile financial assets uh, and think that they're going to get rich quick when in fact they are just financing the bonuses of the rich guts. So I am personally extremely conservative with my money. I don't invest in anything that is remotely volatile. Maybe it's my fault. Um, but my impression is that uh, a frenzy is being created uh, around um, Bitcoin and other um, currencies that have no material existence and exist in order to uh, generate uh, speculation and uh, asset bubbles. I wouldn't trust that. Um, I think this is fundamentally a, a Ponzi scheme. Um, I would not recommend investing uh, in that, but then I wouldn't recommend investing in the stock market either. Um, my suggestion um, usually is, well, but then I'm an academic, I'm not an investor. My suggestion is to look critically at where uh, you're being asked to put your money and by who. Who is telling you to do uh, this type of, this pattern of investment as opposed to something else? And it, this is a society that pushes us to try and accumulate as much value as possible. And that makes it necessary to accumulate as much value as possible. And I think if we were content with decent, reasonable, stable lifestyles, perhaps we might all be a little bit happier. So I would approach that with an enormous dose of skepticism uh, and would tend to avoid it. I simply don't think that this is a democratic form of distribution of wealth. This is more a way to capture wealth from the poor in order to favor once again, the rich, the ones with the equipment, the information and the capacity to keep investing um, as opposed to uh, people who are just desperate for some form of protection against very adverse economic times. So, so then you would see uh, the Bitcoin phase as really a kind of pathology, the, the uh, pathology uh, of, um, of neoliberalism, that the, there's uh, a desperate class of people who simply uh, see this as, as the most rational choice among many irrational choices. I think that's a very, very nice way to put it. Uh, this, these are irrational times. I hope that uh, someday we can look back at these at these uh, days and months and years we've been living and, and and think, wow, how did we get into that into that situation? How did that happen to us? Uh, and I do hope that we can move to to a more stable uh, world. You go to work every day. You're producing value every day. You're contributing to social welfare every day. Let's just have stable lives. That will give an enormous contribution even to mental health for everybody. Society that provides more security to people uh, would be enormously positive for social welfare. Professor Saad Filo, uh, thank you. It's, it's 10 a.m. here locally and-, and um, uh, you, we one but, more Well, we do have one more question. May I? Oh, please, please. Thank you, thank you, okay. Well, thank you, Professor, for that uh, illuminating talk. It was very interesting. Uh, from what I got uh, from your talk, you ascribe centrality to financialization and say that it is the heart of neoliberalism. You also say that financialization 
uh, of social discipline is uh, something that we have to contend with. There's yet other point that I think we need to keep in mind. In countries as disparate as mainland China, Vietnam, Hungary, Poland, India, Turkey, Russia, I can go on and on, Saudi Arabia, we are beginning to see the rise of what John Keane refers to as new despotism. Unlike old despotism, which was all tyrannical and coercive and so on, this new despotism is uh, protean, it is seductive, and it operates through a combination of coercion and consent. And the linchpin of this new despotism is voluntary servitude. Now, given this, what might be, in your view, a viable solution for rolling back this process of financialization? Thank you. Thank you for that. It's a very, uh, very broad and very deep um, question. I'm not sure about the term voluntary servitude. Um, we'd have to sit down and talk about this a little more. But it is very clear that, as you pointed out, well, in some countries, despotism has been a state of affairs for a very long time, I think Saudi Arabia. But in other countries, this is relatively new. Uh, my own home country of Brazil is an, an example. Uh, of this, but then there are many other examples, uh, Turkey being another, or India, etc. It would be, I, I see those uh, processes as outcomes of the economic crisis of neoliberalism, together with the political crisis of neoliberal democracy. The consequence has been the disaggregation of all sources of opposition, the individualization, the fragmentation of the citizens, and then the projection of their agency, the attempt to resolve their anxieties, their difficulties, their very real problems, the projection of their potential agency into a leader, a leader that will act for them since individually they are disempowered and powerless. This leads to those spectacular political leaders that we have but they offer no solution. The solution will be through movements for democracy, for political democracy, the restoration of political democracy, and for the construction of economic democracy uh, as well. This will necessarily have to involve the rollback, the dismantling of financialization, because financialization uh, intrinsically is exclusionary, financialization intrinsically is speculative, financialization intrinsically uh, creates winners and losers for no particular reason than the operation of anonymous financial markets that benefit certain uh, agents, uh, as opposed to uh, often the vast majority. So I see those challenges that you have uh, outlined very well as being together political democracy, economic democracy, and definancialization. I add decommodification as well. The social provision of basic goods uh, to everyone on the basis of their existence as human beings. That's enough for you to qualify. You should have access to health. You should have access to transport. You should have access to housing because you're a person, because you're an individual in the, who lives in society. That's all there is to it. You contribute because you're here, because you exist. If we can think of forms of social organization along those lines, and they can take many different uh, shapes, uh, I think we can give substance to, the, to our opposition to uh, despotism. We can give substance to our hopes for the future because we cannot just do uh, politics on the basis of saying no to what exists. We have to be able to offer alternatives. And I think this type of alternative uh, could be compelling and could be credible uh, as well. It takes time, um, but given the failure of what exists, I think going along those lines and challenging financialization and challenging a lack, lack of democracy 
that is a promising way forward. Professor Saad Filo, again, th uh, thank you very much for being our keynote speaker and, and uh, what promises to be a day that uh, I hope begins to, begins, I stress begins, it's a very early stage of response, but begins to address some of the, the, uh, the elements of crisis you've so eloquently identified. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you so much, it's been a delight. Thank you everyone so much for coming this morning. Uh, fantastic keynote address to start the morning off and we will begin um, our, our first panel of the day on public goods, agriculture, climate and property. We will begin with a presentation by Professor Chad Marzen. Uh, Professor Marzen was born and raised on a corn and soybean farm in rural Iowa. In 2005, he graduated with a BA from Grinnell College and a JD from St. Louis University in 2008. He has authored and co-authored over 50 published and or forthcoming law review articles discussing various topics such as crop insurance, insurance law, and agricultural law. He currently serves as the American General Insurance Associate Professor of Insurance Law at Florida State University in the College of Business and is a member of the State Bars of Iowa and Nebraska. Everyone, please join me in welcoming Professor Chad Marzen. Thomas, for the introduction. I appreciate it. Um, first of all, before I get started, I wanted to thank um, the University of St. Thomas School of Law. Um, I wanted to thank uh, Dr. Reed. Um, Kendall Hayes, uh, Thomas, um, for, uh, for their hospitality uh, and the opportunity to speak here today. Uh, it's, uh, it's great being back in the Midwest. I'm sorry I couldn't bring um, some of the Florida weather back with me, um, but, uh, but many thanks to, to the university. It's a, it's, a, it's a wonderful institution of um, Catholic um, higher education committed to the common good. Uh, and so before we, uh, before I get started, or I'm going to get started now, uh, as I get started here, I wanted to show a couple of slides on the common good. So the common good, of course, has been a, a key, um, key principle in the Catholic intellectual tradition. I know Dean Vischer uh, very eloquently spoke about that earlier today, um, but I wanted to, uh, to provide a couple quotes. Um, politics is the most is a use of legitimate authority to attain the common good of society. So uh, this uh, presentation today on agriculture uh, is going to be a, a presentation that focuses on potential ways in which uh, bipartisan legislators, uh, legislators from across the aisle might find common ground in today's hyperpartisan world. Um, so that's gonna be the focus. And I think agriculture is a way where that common ground can be found. I think there's a number of areas, and my paper discusses a number of areas in agriculture where the common good can be promoted. And so we have a couple quotes here um, from Pope Benedict, um, Saint uh, Pope John Paul II, as well as um, Pope uh, Francis. Let's see. Political office and political responsibility thus constantly challenge those called to a service of their country to make every effort to protect those who live there and to create the conditions for a worthy and just future. If exercised with basic, basic respect for the life, freedom, and dignity of persons, political life can indeed become an outstanding form of charity. Um, and I think that can be found in agricultural policy. Uh, we can reach that ideal in our policy making. So, so what are some ways in which um, this common ground may be found? There's a lot of debate today over the Green New Deal. Lots of debate, lots of very strong opinions. But if we look beyond the debate, there are areas of common ground to address issues like climate risk uh, that our are, that are world faces. And one of uh, these areas where uh, bipartisan cooperation Think can be found is the promotion of cover crops. Um, there's a lot of benefits to cover crops um, and cover cropping. Um, it builds a, the uh, resiliency of the soil, the nutrients in the soil. It's, it's a very, very positive thing overall. And we see in the past year, 
Um, USDA's Risk Management Agency introduced a pandemic cover crop program. Um, so there was a financial incentive of uh, premium support of $5 per acre if the producer insured their cash crop and utilized a qualifying cover crop. Now, traditionally, interestingly enough, cover crops have not always been incentivized under the federal crop insurance program. There were a number of issues um, that arose um, with cover crops because insureds, producers, have to meet planning deadlines. Um, so um, there were some regulations a few years ago uh, where some farmers couldn't, couldn't utilize a cover crop because they would miss the insurability cutoff for their main cash crop. Now, if we look at legislation that's currently before Congress, we have the Cover Crop Flexibility Act 2021. We have two senators, uh, Senator Thune from South Dakota, um, conservative Republican, uh, Senator Savino from Michigan. Now, they both um, come together to uh, promote this bill. And it's been in the past couple of Congresses, um, but basically current law prohibits any grazing or harvesting of cover crops prior to November 1st this bill would remove this restriction, would promote the use of cover crops. Um, so I think if we look at things beyond the Green New Deal, like areas where there might be cooperation, cover cropping or the use of cover crops can certainly be incentivized. I think there's a lot of room for Republicans and Democrats to talk about incentives um, for producers who utilize these types of practices. So farmers markets. Moving on to farmers markets, uh, I wanted to talk about a few of these 10 different areas, um, but farmers markets are, are another I wanted to spend a few moments today talking about. Um, it's a major issue, the food deserts in the United States. Um, nearly 40 million people live in a food desert, meaning basically they, they don't have um, access readily available to, to healthy foods. Um, that's the, the, the driving distance is, is, a, is, a, is a big concern. And so um, we saw a lot of um, the rise of a lot of food insecurity issues uh, because of the pandemic. Um, we see these haunting images of the long food lines at food pantries. Um, but farmers markets really rose to the challenge um, during the pandemic. Um, I know in Florida, I was often, and I still do, almost every week go to the farmer's market in Tallahassee. Um, and I know probably some of you might be fans of the farmer's market. You know, outdoor, um, outdoor um, spacing, you can socially distance yourself, and there's a lot of access to, to food from, uh, healthy food from producers. Um, but if we look at legislation, there's the Healthy Food Access for All Americans Act. Um, and this would provide tax credits. Um, for, for um, grocery stores and food markets that um, either establish or renovate a food establishment in a food desert area. Um, and so this is legislation that's sponsored by Senator Warner of Virginia, uh, Senator Casey of uh, Pennsylvania, both Democrats, and then Senator Moran of Kansas, a Republican, and Senator Shelley Moore, capital of West Virginia, a Republican. So this is bipartisan bill. So another potential area of bipartisan cooperation to promote food market, uh, food uh, and farmers markets. Student loan relief. So if we look at student loans, there's a lot of debate over canceling student debt or um, relieving student loan burdens. Um, so 45 million Americans today, um, this is in the past year, the statistic, um, hold student loan debt in an aggr aggregate amount of approximately $1.7 trillion. Um, so student loan debt um, is, is certainly a significant issue for many um, in today's world. We look at young farmers or beginning farmers, um, someone who might not be in a several generation farm family, but they wanna get established in farming. They go to college, they get a degree in let's say agricultural economics. And they come out of school with $50,000 of, of student loan debt. And they need to start a farm. They want to buy a farm to, to start uh, becoming a producer. As we see in Minnesota and Iowa and a lot of surrounding states, that cost of farmland has dramatically increased in recent years. Um, in fact, uh, just this year in Iowa, any Iowans in the audience? I know there's probably some Iowans. 
there was a farm that sold for approximately $26,000 per acre, um, shattering the record uh, for farmland. So you compound, uh, let's say, the, 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 the difficulty of a first-time farmer. They, they have student loan debt, and then they have to compete with other producers, and then they have to compete with investors a lot of times. Um, the Young Farmers Success Act, um, uh, which was introduced in the last Congress, this is bipartisan legislation, would encompass farming and ranching within the definition of public service, um, making those uh, individuals um, who are farmers and ranchers uh, who have uh, student loans eligible for public service loan forgiveness. Um, this has been a proposal that's been, um, that's been pushed by the National Young Farmers Coalition and it's supported by a variety of agricultural groups. Um, so very much another opportunity for Republicans and Democrats to work together um, for the common good. Uh, pandemics, legislation to pro help prevent future pandemics. We're still in the midst of COVID-19, unfortunately. The uh, Preventing Future Pandemics Act um, would prohibit the purchase, sale, importation, or exportation of live wild animals for food or medicine within the United States. Still have a lot of debates over what to do with pandemic policy now, but it's not too early to start thinking about the next pandemic, about the next challenges that um, society may face. This legislation has 143 co-sponsors, um, number of Republicans, number of Democrats. Um, even though there's a lot of division over the response to the pandemic, this is one bill where there's a possibility of bipartisan cooperation moving forward. Uh, some other areas, um, where there might be a possibility for cooperation. The Student Agriculture Protection Act, this is another bipartisan bill, um, allows student agriculturalists um, to exclude up to $5,000 in gains from the sale of livestock crops or agricultural mechanics products um, from their gross income. Um, this would encompass a number of students who are involved in organizations like 4-H, as well as FFA, Future Farmers of America. Um, so this is another bipartisan piece of legislation. Uh, some other things to consider, um, programs to promote rural resilience, um, the mental health challenges faced by farmers and ranchers, public service campaigns to, to address and highlight um, these, these issues that face many producers. Um, Clean Fuels Deployment Act. Uh, this would provide, um, this is another bipartisan piece of legislation introduced in the last Congress that would um, provide grants um, for the development of uh, biofuels infrastructure within the United States. Um, so the biofuels industry, of course, is another industry that has a lot of support from both Republicans and Democrats. Um, so that's another opportunity. Um, another thing that potentially has, a, a, there's a possibility for bipartisan cooperation is considering the issue of hunger. It's approximately 40 million people that may be hungry in the United States, but there's not a select committee. There's not a, there's not a committee on hunger. So there was a, historically the House of Representatives had a committee on hunger from 1984 to 1993, um, and that committee lapsed. Um, but the issue of hunger in the United States um, is, is something um, that, you know, certainly Republicans and Democrats can come together to work for the common good, um, to reduce hunger, um, looking at different possibilities to do that. Um, and then finally, um, I wanted to talk a little bit about crop insurance. Um, I do a lot of writing in crop insurance, um, but there is a big issue now in crop insurance with regard to bad faith claims. Um, so a um, farmer who might have a crop insurance um, bad faith claim may or may not have that claim be preempted. Um, there's a division in the, in the case law right now on whether or not a farmer can pursue state law claims against a, um, a crop insurer that uh, has policies or sells and services policies that are reinsured by the federal government. That's an open uh, legal question right now. There's a lot of authority, a lot, a lot of cases that are, are emerging in this area. Uh, some of you might 
might see this. Uh, some, of, some of you students might, might see this issue as you start your careers. Um, but this is a, pot a potential area, a possible area for Congress to examine as they examine the farm bill and uh, crop insurance is whether there should be um, a cause of action under federal law for producers that, um, that encounter a bad faith situation um, to kind of resolve this split in authority over preemption. Uh, so that's a potential area. There's no legislation out there, but that's a potential area um, of potential bipartisan cooperation to provide producers remedies in their um, crop insurance disputes. Um, so I wanted to just kind of pose these few issues um, or, or pieces of legislation as, as potential areas of cooperation. I think there's a lot of room in agriculture. We live in a very hyper-partisan world. Um, but agriculture can be an area where there's a lot of common ground found that's for the good of all. Um, and so I want to thank everyone today. Thank everyone who's watching. Um, and uh, for the students here, um, the law is a, it's a wonderful calling. It's a wonderful vocation and a wonderful opportunity to work towards the common good. So thank you very much. If you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer any questions that you may have. Kendall, chat. I thought we'd do questions and answers at the conclusion of the four presentations. We'll have a better, better handle on, on time then. Well, thank you very much, Professor Marvin. Absolutely fantastic uh, presentation. We really, really appreciate you being here today. Thank you. Uh, next up, we are going to have a presentation from uh, Mr. Philippe Jardine. Uh, Mr. Jardim is a doctoral candidate at the State University of Rio de Janeiro, Brazil, and at British Schuler in Germany. He earned his Master in Urban Development at the Federal University of Pernambuco, Brazil, and is also the editor of the City Law Journal in Brazil. Everyone, please join me in welcoming uh, Mr. Philippe Jardim. Thank you so much. Uh, and I'm trying to upload the presentation. Can you listen to me? So it's ready now. Um, thank you again. And um, this is part of my research, my, my doctoral research. Uh, I'm from the Rio de Janeiro State University. In, in, and also I'm doing part of the uh, Friedrich Schiele Universität Jena in Germany. And today I'm going to talk a little bit about my Brazilian part of the research. But before um, started, I would like to ask you, um, have you ever thought how is going to be the earth in the following decades? How is going to be the cities, the environment? Um, well, the, unfortunately, the scientific reports do, doesn't show us good news because of the increase of the population the urban population specifically, and also about the uh, global warming consequences to the environment, uh, including to the food production. Um, so how um, we could defeat or to uh, mitigate the impact of these uh, consequences considering the food production is a team in for debate in in all over the world and for example we could have uh, solutions considering the uh, urban uh, vertical agriculture new ways to introduce insects in your diet 
or how to use the modified genetic seeds or how to use the technology like drones to help the control the, the agriculture uh, problems. And another way to face this big deal is uh, uh, with the urban agriculture, which is being a practice uh, getting more common in big cities. And the reason is, one of the reasons is because of the shorter way from the food to the house. So with the shorter way, you save more water, so save more water and uh, have less emissions of pollutants and you have less waste of food. So in different places, you have different possibilities of urban agriculture because of the weather, because of the law, because of different conditions. And today I'm going to speak about the Hortas Cariocas program in the Rio de Janeiro. And it was one of the uh, selected models of um, uh, sustainable development goals uh, by U the UN. Um, so the program was created in 2006 by the city hall. So we are talking about the local power, the, the, the public pol policy from the city hall. Uh, to fulfill uh, the public properties in the urban areas, um, in the urban area of Rio de Janeiro, uh, with uh, a possibility to provide food sovereignty, uh, social inclusion, and environmental protection. So, um, uh, this program also was trying to um, achieve uh, results considering that in, in the Rio de Janeiro city, uh, we had la, uh, high levels of inadequate or insufficient or too much expensive food. Um, in the, a lot of possibilities of edo properties and a lack of work and leisure options. So this program uh, is developed is uh, split in uh, 49 places considering 25 schools and 24 uh, communities, uh, poor areas of Rio de Janeiro. So for example, this is Manguinhos that was uh, an, an area uh, that was abandoned and was a place uh, for the criminality to, to use and to sell drugs, but uh, with the intervention of the state, it was uh, substituted by the Hortas Cariocas program. And now is the biggest community urban garden from America Latina, from Latin America. Uh, and it has two tons of food monthly to feed 800 families. And it counts with 21 works, workers. And the size is around uh, four football field size. So the product, uh, considering the product, you have fruits and vegetables. And for example, in 2020, we got 82 tons. Um, that was uh, one of the uh, biggest productions of last years. Uh, how it works. So first we need a, a request by an individual or a group. So the city how we mix the analysis of viability uh, to check the soil, to also check the, uh, the money possibilities. Uh, so if it's okay, they will buy the materials and they also can pay some a small amount of money monthly to, uh, to the people who is working um, there. So uh, in 2020, we got 216, uh, workers, and um, after the the buy the buy the uh, buy materials and pay the money, they really start the the work doing the training, preparing the soil, and it keeps in, uh, in development. So before the pandemic, fifty percent of the production were 
to the nation, like to schools or to the neighborhood. And the other 50% was uh, uh, they sell it in public fairs, in the street fairs. But uh, since March of 2020, uh, with the pandemic, 100% of the food uh, started to be donated. Uh, so in general terms, the, the garden keeps in this way, 50-50, uh, or it will get emancipated from the city hall and it can sell 100% of the food. Um, just a little note is the workers are not workers from the city hall. They are not, they don't have like worker relation with the city hall. They are considered like helpers. So this program has social results. Um, in the in the one of the reports that you can read about this program, you can find um, the interviews with some workers that left the criminality to uh, start a new life in this garden. Uh, also has some economic results because uh, at least 216 people has another uh, way to, to have your household income. And also have environmental results because the place is not more uh, full of trash or abandoned. Um, so we started to have an environmental consciousness also about to protect the nature and to the relation with the food. Unfortunately, there is a lack of regulation because there is no specific law to protect uh, this program. And also the, we have some problems to find the data. Uh, this is not so easy to understand uh, and to, to find the data, economic data, um, in the results data of the production also. Uh, but anyway, it got a really important uh, uh, paper uh, work during the pandemic because of the donation. And considering the future of the program, it's a little bit uh, complicated scenario because um, in, the, in the images, in the up, upper, upper image, you can see uh, of, of, uh, newspapers uh, announcing that uh, the program is going to grow up, but in the second message, uh, second uh, headline, you can see the program is going to, uh, is under investigation uh, because of the uh, economic control of it. So uh, even with, with this no, uh, news, Recently, we saw a, a, a big uh, news about that next year we are going to have more gardens. Um, to finish, um, this program uh, analysis can show, us, can show us that this is um, urban agriculture serving uh, as a tool to achieve the human rights. So we are talking to human rights, to the food, to the leisure, because also anyone from the neighborhood can go there and work as a volunteer. Uh, we are talking to access to the, uh, to the city, to the right to the city. Uh, we are talking to uh, different ways to, uh, of human rights, but also we are discussing what's the role of the law, of the public policies, of the city hall, considering the public goods. And also this is a sustainable local action, but has global relations as uh, you can see in the photo, in the, in the image, in the, in the right, uh, different relations uh, to, this, to just one program. Um, and thinking about it, discussing about it, uh, maybe this scenario could be better um, if you keep talking and acting um, in a good way. So just in case if you have any questions or want to contact me, please feel free.
Uh, Professor Jardim, if I could ask, please stay with us because I'll have questions. We'll have questions for you after the, the other panelists. Thank you. Thank you very much. Malcolm. <laughs> Yes, thank you so much for that wonderful presentation. I'm looking forward to hearing uh, some of the questions um, as well. Uh, next up, we'll be moving on to climate is a public good with a presentation by Professor Patrick A. Parento. Uh, professor Parento currently serves as a professor of law and senior counsel in the Environmental Advocacy Clinic at Vermont Law School. Uh, his current work fo focuses on addressing the challenges of climate change through teaching, publishing, public speaking, and litigation. His previous roles include serving as the director of the Environmental Law Center at Vermont Law School, vice president for conservation with the National Wildlife Federation in Washington, regional counsel to the New England Regional Office of the EPA in Boston, Commissioner of the Vermont Department of Environmental Conservation and counsel with the Perkins Coy Law Firm in Portland, Oregon. He has also received numerous awards in, these, in his three decades of work combating climate change. He is a fellow in the American College of Environmental Lawyers. In 2005, he received the National Wildlife Federation's Conservation Achievement Award in recognition of his contributions to wildlife conservation and environmental education. In 2016, he also received the uh, Harry Redberg Award in Excellence in Public Interest Environmental Law. In 2019, he was a Fulbright Scholar in Ireland. Professor Parento holds a BS from Regis University, a JD from Creighton University, and an LLM in Environmental Law from George Washington University. Everyone, please join me in welcoming Professor Parento. Oh, start the video. Thank you so much uh, for that kind introduction and uh, for the invitation to participate in this important symposium. I've already learned a great deal uh, listening to the other speakers, and I hope to be able to add a little something to the conversation today. Uh, as we are meeting here virtually, um, the delegates to the COP26 in Glasgow uh, are trying to finish up their work. They're supposed to conclude uh, later that today. Uh, there's a five hour difference, so they may be closing in on the deadline. Um, the current uh, focus of negotiation and, and wrangling, I guess you would call it, is over the first, for the first time in any uh, climate treaty to actually address the core problem of our climate crisis, which of course is fossil fuels. And none of the treaty language has ever addressed fossil fuels, which is somewhat ironic, but they are now trying to agree on some kind of language addressing the need to phase out and, and move forward and transition away uh, from an economy based on planet destroying fossil fuels. The current language states uh, phase out of unabated coal power and inefficient subsidies for fossil fuels. So that sort of tells you a lot about the difficulties of uh, international negotiations on climate and many other environmental issues. So I'm now going to uh, uh, share my screen with my PowerPoint presentation and work you through, walk you through um, some ideas. It's, it's a potpourri uh, of ideas about uh, how the climate emergency, the climate crisis fits into the concept of public goods um, and um, what to do about it. So you start with the classic definition of public goods, which um, represent extreme cases of um, market externalities, market failure. Many economists have called climate change or climate disruption um, the greatest example of market failure ever in the history of the human economy. Um, and it's a situation where all the consumers can enjoy the good, even if they don't pay for it. Uh, a pure public good, such as national defense, exhibits both. The, the, the characteristics of a public good are non-rivalry. The consumption of the good by one does not necessarily inhibit another's enjoyment of the good. And something called non-excludability, where it is impossible, practically, to prevent an individual from enjoying the benefits of the good, even if he or she has contributed uh, nothing to its provision. Um, the other related concept is, is, of course, the commons, in this case, the global commons. 
Um, and, and there are similarities and, and differences between the concept of the commons and public goods. Uh, in terms of the non-excludability uh, concept, both uh, the commons and the public goods concept share that uh, commonality. But for the, the, the non-rivalry principle of public goods, it's, it's, it's different. So um, th that could be true, could be said to be true of the commons. And the classic example, of course, of the commons are the village green, but also the ozone layer and the climate system itself. But when you get to the concept of uh, rivalry, um, consumption of the public good does not necessarily reduce the quantity available to others. And for public goods, I think it's best to understand that what we're talking about is a stable climate system. That is a system that more closely resembles the natural energy balance of the earth. Um, the system that has given us uh, the most unprecedented levels of biodiversity um, in, in the Earth's history, as well as the highest levels of, of human civilization and, and prosperity, notwithstanding uh, the inequities that we've been discussing so far. But certainly the most stable period of time in the Earth's history is now, and we're now passing through that uh, in, into the Anthropocene, as, as it is called. Uh, you're all familiar with Garrett Hardin's famous hypothesis of the tragedy of the commons, uh, which is really a concept of carrying capacity and also a concept of open access to these common goods. His example, of course, was the grazing example where individuals have an incentive to maximize uh, their return on their use of the commons. And what you get then is, is uh, uh, exceeding the carrying capacity of the natural system, in this case, pasturage um, that uh, supports uh, all of the economic activity and well-being of the community. We, we still have examples. There's lots of debate, of course, about um, how the tragedy of the commons plays out in different contexts. But we do have still uh, clear examples of, of how the tragedy of the commons works out, one of which, of course, portrayed here is the collapse of the cod fishery off of uh, the Grand Banks off of Canada. But we've seen the same thing off of Georgia's banks off the east coast of the United States, where you simply have uh, so much access, open access to the to the resource, in this case, the commercially valuable cod fishery, that you overfish it um, and, and, and exhaust it to the point where it can't reproduce itself and, and it collapses. And it's at the same time, you have the, the other problems of bycatch, which means that you're, you're using equipment like great nets that catch everything um, that, that's in the, in the water, and you throw away those non-viable or those non-commercial species of fish. But of course, by doing that, you're undermining the ecological integrity of the whole system. And then other forms of um, harvest using trawl mechanisms destroy the benthos and the habitat that supports the whole system. Corals are another example uh, of a commons. Uh, um, the, the famous uh, maritime scholar Hugo Grotius, Grotius referred to the oceans as the common heritage of mankind. Um, the coral reefs are uh, a, a, a tiny fraction of the Earth's surface, but they support over a quarter of the biodiversity on Earth. They support a, a number of, of commercial fisheries, and they support millions and millions of people with sustainable uh, nu nutrition and, and food and, and subsistence food. They're being uh, heavily impacted by both the warming of the oceans, 90% of the uh, human caused warming is in the oceans, as well as ocean acidification, which is literally dissolving the bottom of the food chain of the entire marine ecosystem. Um, so that leads to the question of, is the atmosphere a public trust resource? My good friend and colleague, uh, Professor Mary Wood, at the University of Oregon has written a great deal on this. She is really the intellectual capital behind the whole idea of nature's trust and a recognition that the atmosphere is part um, of our public trust um, and that the government has a fiduciary obligation to act to defend uh, and protect uh, the, the atmosphere and the stable climate system. There have been uh, court cases that have recognized the atmosphere as a public trust resource. Uh, these have been state court decisions, not federal court decisions. Uh, 
Uh, however, none of these decisions have gone the next step and actually imposed specific obligations uh, on the government at any level to take specific actions to uh, remove the threats uh, to the stability of the atmosphere and the climate systems. We haven't seen that in this country. We've seen it in other countries. We've seen it in the Netherlands. We've seen it in Germany. We've seen it in Ireland. We've seen it in the global south, in, in Colombia, in Ecuador. Uh, we've seen it in Pakistan. We've seen other courts and other legal regimes around the world recognizing this public trust uh, duty, uh, sometimes framed as a constitutional duty, oftentimes framed as a human rights-based duty. Uh, but in the United States, we're still looking for a, a major breakthrough uh, judicially. You know, one of the characteristics, of course, of, a, of an open resource or a commons is the free rider problem. And, um, you know, the, the idea that um, if you make it, if individuals and individual nations uh, make commitments to reduce emissions that are causing uh, climate disruption, uh, others will benefit from that without, uh, so to speak, lifting a finger or an oar, as in this uh, slide portrayal. Um, and and that, is, that is a significant problem with these international negotiations. It's why we've had 26 meetings uh, of the parties to these various climate treaties without yet uh, a clear uh, and forceful path forward in terms of specific actions that need to be taken within a very specific and shrinking time frame. It is indeed a collective action problem. Uh, the youth um, in Glasgow took to the streets last Saturday, 100,000 strong, uh, demanding that their elders, um, those of us that have uh, contributed to the problem that they will be inheriting, um, to stop talking uh, and get to uh, more specific actions. But collective action is, is the challenge. And um, the United States has, has always taken the position um, that although it understands the equity issue and it understands that there are countries that are suffering more from climate disruption and who are less responsible for the emissions that have caused it, uh, we still take the position that we will only sign on to treaties that involve the whole world, that's the Paris Agreement, of course, and that even though developing nations must be able to receive assistance to achieve their, their mitigation goals, their emission reduction goals, as well as dealing with the requirements of adaptation as, as the climate effects uh, accelerate, uh, but we take a very strong position that it requires the participation of, of everyone uh, to move forward. And, and that's what has led to stalemates uh, over and over again in, in these, these various international large gathering meetings. Another concept to keep in mind when you're talking about um, climate disruption is, is the exponential aspect of it. It's not linear. It's exponential, and, and the famous uh, French riddle involving the lily pads on the pond is a good reminder. If, 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 you know, if you have a situation where the number of lily pads doubles every day so that two uh, on the second day, four on the next, and eight on the next, uh, the question is, and the pond is full of lily pads on the 30th day, on which day is the pond half full? And the answer uh, is the 29th day. In many ways, that is where we are with the climate crisis. And that's why crisis is the appropriate term. The amount of time that we have to have a chance at holding temperatures below the goals of the Paris Agreement, which have now become 1.5 degrees Celsius measured over industrial revolution era, um, as opposed to the two degrees Celsius, which was sort of the original goal of the Paris Agreement. But the science has caught up and said, no, we're, we're actually experiencing, you might argue, dangerous interference with the climate system even now when you look at what happened this last year, but certainly at 1.5 degrees Celsius increase, you're looking at the loss of the island nations, you're looking at the loss of most of the world's coral reefs and so forth. The parallel is clear with the coronavirus pandemic and its exponential growth. Uh, there are now over 260 million people in the world that have contracted the coronavirus, over 5 million have died and it is not under control. Even in my state of Vermont, which has one of the highest, almost the highest rate of vaccination in the country, we've just had a surge of outbreaks uh, among vaccinated uh, individuals in Vermont. So this thing is not behind us. And um, it does raise the question of, is the atmosphere, what is it? Is it a receptacle for our waste 
Is there an assimilative capacity that the atmosphere it can act actually absorb so that economic activity based on, a, on a fossil fuels could, could continue. And the scientists have said there is a concept of a carbon budget, but the problem is that we burned through over half of that carbon budget. If we, if, and we're on, on track to burn through it by something like 2030 uh, without in incredibly strong measures to reverse uh, that, that exponential growth of, of emissions, and they are beginning to grow again, notwithstanding the slowdown uh, in response to the COVID pandemic. And you can see on this chart just how dramatically these emissions have grown, despite, as you can see on the right of the graph there, all of the treaties and agreements and promises and pledges that have been made. This graph is climbing, climbing, climbing. Um, and so we are definitely uh, racing time to have a chance. There's no guarantee actually, that we can stabilize the climate, probably not without carbon removal technologies, which are now currently in development, but not at the commercial proven scale that would be needed. But e even if we get a handle on the emissions, we're still looking at some pretty major impacts and some pretty significant uh, and extraordinary measures to return the climate to something like a more stable system. So the, the comparison actually between the COVID pandemic and the climate crisis is, is pretty clear. I mean, the thing that we talked about and have been talking about for almost two years now is this idea of flattening the curve of coronavirus infections through vaccination, through masking, through distancing, and so forth. And the idea was that we have to flatten the curve so that we don't exceed the healthcare system capacity of individual states in the United States as a whole. And if you think about uh, the climate crisis, it's the same concept. If we don't quickly flatten the curve of, of greenhouse gas emissions, we are rapidly exceeding the Earth's capacity, the carbon budget uh, that's designed to uh, try to stabilize and return to a more stable climate system. So unabated capitalism, unfettered capitalism, uh, is totally inconsistent with the idea uh, of maintaining uh, Earth's stability in terms of the climate. Um, and this is a difficult graph to grasp, uh, I know, online, but this is the work of the Stockholm Institute on examining what are called nine planetary boundaries. The, these, these are the boundaries within which human life, all life on the planet, uh, exist. And uh, there are nine of them, and we have already exceeded three of them. One of them is the, the, the safe zone, is the green zone that you see depicted, and the excess is the, is the red zones and there are we've already exceeded the planetary boundaries of, of three of these limits climate is one biodiversity is another and nitrogen which is the primary cause of dead zones around the oceans of the world and there are 450 of those and, and growing um, is the other planetary boundary we've already exceeded now as to uh, evidence of, of success stories the montreal protocol is clearly the most successful multi party environmental treaty ever. And it, it is the model for how to deal with the collective action problem, the free rider problem, um, and something that threatens the public good of the entire world. And it does, as this uh, slide portrays, adopt a carrot and stick approach. Um, the Montreal Protocol recognized that different countries were in different positions and ability to phase out the ozone depleting chemicals the chlorofluorinated carbons, the CFCs, and it set up a phased approach uh, for the developed countries, the industrialized countries, and the developing countries. It set up uh, uh, income transfer or, or payment programs to enable the developing countries to phase out uh, these ozone-depleting chemicals and, and to replace them with non-ozone-depleting chemicals. So it's a very elegant, very detailed structure that worked. It's also a structure that reacted to the science. The, the paper by Roland um, and um, 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 the other scientists who, who first discovered the problem with ozone depletion, uh, Sherwood Owens being, Roland being the main one, and Molina was the other one. Uh, the, the world paid attention to the science. The, the, the countries of the world came together and agreed that, that the threats from ozone depletion, which was exposing us to ultraviolet radiation, was real. And, that, and it was really cataracts in the eyes that scared people the most to, to, to react and take strong measures. 
the difference between the ozone depleting chemicals and, and the greenhouse gases, of course, is that there were substitutes for CFCs. The problem is the substitutes themselves were greenhouse gases, HCFCs and HFCs that are both very virulent, very powerful global warming agents, as well as ozone depleters. So now we're in the, the process of phasing out those substitutes with other substitutes. It's an ongoing process, but the Montreal Protocol is clearly the most outstanding example of the world coming together, responding to the science and taking meaningful action that has actually helped the climate as well as uh, the ozone layer itself. Now, in the last stages of this presentation, let me shift to assuming that, that the atmosphere is a public good and that a stable climate is a public good and that the government has some responsibility uh, to respond to it and protect it, uh, what can it do? And it, it is true that the United States stands almost alone in the world um, in still entertaining a, a debate about uh, how serious the problem is. We may have moved from, it's not a problem at all in some quarters, uh, but we haven't moved very far and we haven't made it a priority in our political, in our body politic. Uh, our divided politics uh, are, are they, they stand out in, in, in the world um, as, as a, a very serious challenge for democracy in the United States. The inability to cross these partisan lines and forge meaningful bipartisan um, uh, solutions to the climate crisis is, is very unique to the United States. All the countries of the world are struggling with what to do. Uh, but they're at least agreeing that it needs to be done and not debating how serious the issue is. But this poll uh, from the Pew Research Center is, is reason for hope that, that the public attitude, the public support for strong government action is moving in the right direction. And I'll leave it to you to look at these, these individual metrics that they, they compared. But overall, it, it, it does show uh, that, that America is getting closer to consensus on the need for strong action. We're not there yet entirely. So let's look at the tools that the United States uh, government, uh, and I'm gonna focus mostly at the federal national level, although there's obviously a great deal going on at the individual state levels and city municipal levels. But let's focus for a moment here on what are the tools to address the, the, the climate crisis. Our, our major statutory approach in terms of regulation is of course the Clean Air Act, and we're struggling over coming up with rules that will survive review in the Supreme Court, uh, regulating emissions from power plants and other industrial sources like cement plants, oil refineries, landfills, and others. Uh, we have more consensus on what needs to be done with fuel efficiency and uh, tailpipe emission standards from cars and trucks. The ships and planes uh, part of the challenge is gonna be the most difficult. And for that, we're gonna need uh, probably new forms of fuel to replace uh, fossil fuels. Um, the, the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission actually has a great deal to say about how fast we're gonna be able to move in implementing uh, renewable energy, wind and solar into the national grid system. Efficiency standards coming from the Department of Energy are part of it. Uh, Securities and Exchange Commission is developing carbon disclosure and financial risk disclosure requirements and rules now that will uh, in, in, enlighten and inform uh, shareholders and investors and the public in what kinds of uh, companies are engaged in activities that are either improving or not uh, on the emissions problem. And then the banks, uh, the, the Treasury Department is being pressured to require banks to start stress testing their portfolio of loans, uh, looking at climate risk. Infrastructure investment, we've just seen very uh, recently the passage of the bipartisan infrastructure bill, 1.2 trillion, lots of uh, good things in there for uh, clean energy and electric vehicles and, and lots of other infrastructure improvements on the grid and so forth. Uh, but the bigger bill, the Build Back Better, which has even more of uh, $550 billion for climate investments, that one is still tied up and we're waiting to see its, its fate. And of course, the national government is gonna to have to deal with the very severe problems and, and, and challenges of, of ensuring the cybersecurity. The more that we integrate our grid, the more that we have real-time pricing for energy and electricity, the more vulnerable it's gonna to be uh, to attack. Tax and fiscal policies are going quickly through these. 
Uh, we have seen an extension of the production tax credits for solar and wind. They have been very important to the promotion of solar and wind. Solar is, is the fastest growing energy system on earth. It's also the, least, the most cost effective. It's at costing out at three cents per kilowatt hour in the United States. It's out competing coal, gas, nuclear, and, and other forms of energy, but it's still a tiny fraction of our energy supply portfolio. So it needs to scale very, very fast and production tax credits is helping with that. Electric vehicles have, have been, been booming um, and car manufacturers, five of them, have committed to going totally to EV by 2030. Uh, ending fossil fuel subsidies is another major challenge which we have not yet dealt with. Carbon pricing, there is no national cap and trade. There are two, uh, uh, one regional cap and trade program in the Northeast and one uh, in California that have been quite successful at both reducing emissions and funding energy conservation and including targeting uh, frontline communities and environmental justice communities that need that kind of investment. We've been looking at various forms of taxes, fee and dividend, uh, still no consensus on that, but at some point I, I think, I believe some form of, of carbon taxation, carbon fee, I should say, uh, with probably some kind of dividend distribution will, will have to be part of the ultimate uh, climate strategy for the United States. And then of course we are talking about border adjustments to take account of, of carbon, uh, embedded carbon in international trade. Procurement is a huge area. I won't go into detail there in, in the interest of time. But the United States is the biggest purchaser of all kinds of uh, uh, equipment and vehicles and buildings and can drive the markets towards these cleaner sources that we need. The same with public lands and, and waters. The United States has become a net exporter of oil and gas instead of an importer, uh, but that has come at a huge cost to uh, our global emissions. And we, the United States government does have great control over over 300 million acres of public lands where a lot of this oil and gas leasing takes place as well as all of the offshore oil and gas. So phasing down those programs is key and then managing public lands for carbon sequestration in response to the president's 30 by 30, meaning 30% 30 conservation by 2030 is another part of it. But we are gonna need new fuels, green hydrogen or advanced biofuels, certainly need advanced battery technology, and ultimately are probably gonna need carbon removal. Very quickly then, I'll just touch on these, but there's also a lot happening in the private sector. And the combination, the public-private partnership, I think is gonna be key to finally getting a handle on this, this crisis. Um, so we're seeing the, the emergence of these environment and social governance programs everywhere in the world. Um, we're seeing a lot of greenwashing as well uh, in terms of the way companies are describing what they're doing and whether they're accurate or even honest. We're seeing a response in Europe uh, to very extensive regulation uh, called the taxonomy rule. Uh, to make sure that uh, what companies are saying they're doing is it's backed up by data and is honest and accurate, and that the banks and the financial institutions of the world are factoring those into the new investments that are being made, divesting from fossil, reinvesting in the new economy. These are all things that are happening. And then there's finally this clean energy investor investment accelerator concept known as the green banks and green bonds. And we're seeing these all emerging around the country. There's a proposal to have a national green bank. Um, the ratio of public to private investment is eight to one. So for every $1 of public money you invest in these accelerator banks, you get a private investment of $8. Um, and it's shown to be very successful in the places where it's being implemented. So this is some good news for us. This is, this is real progress. Again, it's a question of time and scale. Uh, to get this as far as we need to go. So I'll close with this famous statement attributed to Walt Kelly, although there's a lot of controversy about whether it really was Walt Kelly who coined it, but we are indeed confronted with insurmountable opportunities. Um, the opportunity here for us is to not only save the planet, because the planet actually doesn't need saving, but to save human civilization in the ways that we've come to know it, and to do so in a way that creates clean, safe, uh, air and water, and an, and an atmosphere that supports a climate system capable of supporting human life and all other life on Earth. 
And it, that is one heck of an opportunity. So we better get on with it. Thank you. And, and Professor Parento, uh, if you could stay with us uh, through the, um, the next presentation, because I'll, I'll have a question for you, and so will others, I'm sure. Certainly. Yes, thank you so much again for that wonderful, very, very informative presentation. We really appreciate uh, you presenting today. Thank you. Uh, for our final uh, presentation in the first panel, we will be focusing on property with a presentation by Dr. Lucas Clover Alcalea. Uh, Dr. Alcalea is a post-doctoral uh, associate at the Scheinman Institute on Conflict Resolution at Cornell University's IRL school, ILR school. He currently teaches a course on alternative dispute resolution at the school. Dr. Alcalea obtained his undergraduate law degree from the University of Aberdeen in 2010, his LLM from Edinburgh University, and his doc doctorate in uh, law from McGill University. He also has worked in a number of roles in the private and public sector in North America and Europe with a focus on international dispute resolution. His work has a twin focus on private justice and Catholic legal theory, and he has published articles in the McGill Journal of Dispute Resolution, Trusts and Trustees, and the Contemporary Asia Arbitration Review, among others. His doctoral thesis is also due to be published in spring 2022 by Edward Elger Publishing as The Arbitration of Trust Disputes. Everyone, please join me in welcoming Dr. Alcalea. So I think I can take my mask off when I'm at the podium, right? Absolutely. Great. Otherwise, my ears are going to fall off. Um, so it's not going to be perhaps as obviously exciting as other presentations because unfortunately it's about property law. But I'm hoping at least most of the audience won't fall asleep. So the full title of my paper is actually the problem of property looking back to the dark ages to get through the dark ages. But frankly, that was too wordy to put on the screen, which is why I decided to focus on feudalism and neo-feudalism. So it's generally accepted that there is significant inequality in the world today. I think most people will accept this. And I don't think anyone thinks that COVID-19 has made things get better. And in fact, there's been some research done on this that shows that the gap between the wealthiest and the poorest members of society has grown. So America's billionaires have grown about $2.1 trillion richer since COVID-19, and the number of billionaires has grown. So there was about 600 pre-COVID, and there's now 745. And the amount of wealth that's actually owned, so the $5 trillion in wealth held by those billionaires is greater than the $3 trillion in wealth held by the bottom 50% of US households. So the point here is that COVID-19 has accelerated the trend of what we want to call neo-feudalism. And the idea here is that there are a lot of people stuck in, I mean, particularly what you'd call kind of wage serfs. They're stuck in low-end and insecure jobs. They have very little hope of progression, either for themselves or for their family. Um, they don't have a lot of leisure time, time off, you know, watching Netflix, whatever it might be. They don't have a lot of holidays and the medical care is not exactly great, as I think you all know. On the other hand, those at the top of the neo-feudal pyramid, you, they have more opportunities for leisure time than any time in history. I mean, even a Roman emperor doesn't have even as much that he could have done in his spare time as a millionaire does today. If we think of all the things we could do, medical care, all these kind of things. And pre-COVID, you could travel anywhere you want in a six-star hotel on a private jet. So it's, the richest are better off than they've ever been. And in some sense, new feudalism is even worse than feudalism. And I realize that seems a bit controversial, but modern workers, I think at least in the US, arguably toil more and rest less than even medieval peasants. So there was a book done in the 1970s called The Overworked American that looked into this. And this is a quote from a decree of the Bishop of Durham, which is in the north of England in 1570. And the, the bishop said that the laboring man will take his rest long in the morning, a good piece of the day is spent before he come at his work. Then he must have his breakfast, which had to include meat, as you'll see later on. Um, when the clock smiteth, he'll cast down his burden in the midway, and whatsoever he is in hand with, he will leave it as it is. He may not lose his meat, what danger soever the work is in. At noon, he must have his sleeping time. So it's not just Spanish people who have siesta, like my family. It was actually a thing in England as well which spendeth a great part of the day. And when his hour cometh at night, he casteth down his tools. This is just England. And it's generally accepted that workers in medieval England probably worked more than people elsewhere in Europe. 
So the ancient regime in France guaranteed 52 Sundays, 90 rest days, and 38 holidays. Of course, holidays coming from holy days. So it was really the church that was involved in that. And in Spain, travelers noted that about five months of the year were holidays. Um, if we compare this to the US and Canada, I think it's about two weeks a year that you get holidays. Even for me, that was a surprise. In England, it's four weeks. France, my French friends, I don't know, six, seven weeks. Spain, I mean, I don't know how much, but it's a lot more. So even the point here to make out is that even now, before we get to the final stages of new feudalism, workers are worse off than in some sense medieval serfs were, at least when it comes to the amount of work. And then what does this have to do with kind of wealth, uh, property, the link between property, land and wealth? Well, nowadays we tend to think about wealth in terms of dollars or whatever currency we have. But in reality, it's money is only worth something because you can exchange it for something else. And that's usually a property right, or it's just property out and out. Now, it's true that the modern world is different from the Middle Ages when land was the primary form of wealth. So if you had a lot of land and you had control over that land, you're wealthy. Now we tend to think about wealth being money. But notwithstanding these differences, I think we all accept that land has considerable importance. So everyone needs to love, live somewhere. This is generally accepted. Psychologically and perhaps spiritually, everyone needs a place to call home. I think that's also not too controversial. And ultimately, unless we start making things in space, all goods that one exchanges for money are created, they're stored, and they're used on land somewhere. So my research is based on these links between land and wealth. And my argument is that if you want to address inequality of wealth, you actually have to deal with inequality of property, and in particular, inequality of land. Land is kind of the quintessential thing when we think of owning something. And land lends itself to an analysis of this kind, given that many of the concepts which form part of land law are actually feudal, surprisingly. And because of these feudal origins of much of modern land law, I've decided to look at the writings of Catholic Celestic scholars who wrote during the feudal period and who analyzed the concept of property. And there's quite a lot of synergies between what exists in feudal land law, even modern land law, and what these scholars wrote about in the Middle Ages and in the early Renaissance. So if we deal with the big questions, why do we have private property? I'm not sure that that's a question we actually think of very often. We just take it for granted. I have an iPhone, I can have a car and whatever else. But private property is not necessarily obvious. So for the scholastics, the basic answer was sin or the fall. So what happened in the Garden of Eden? So sin had a twofold importance. Firstly, it explained why private property existed at all. And secondly, it explained why private property was necessary. So there's a quote from Suarez, who's a famous Spanish theologian from the 1500s, I believe. And he wrote, in the former, the incorrupt state, so before the fall, the natural law demanded, for example, the liberty of all men, common ownership, so not private property and the like. Whereas in the corrupted state, it demands servitude, division of property, and so on. A conclusion which may be gathered from the digest and from the institutes. So the scholastics held that communal property would lead to conflict. Now, I realize that private property also leads to conflict, but they held it would lead to more conflict because greedy people would always take more than they needed and they would use violence against others to get it. And effectively the poor, those who weren't you know, physically strong or couldn't persuade others to defend them, wouldn't have any opportunity to be able to survive. They wouldn't have any food, for example. And additionally, they noted that men would be lazy when it came to common property, but not when it came to private property. So St. Thomas Aquinas says, every man is more careful to procure what is for himself alone than that which is common to all or to many, since each one would shirk the labor and leave to another that which concerns the community. In some sense, it's a very old way of putting the free rider problem or the tragedy of the commons. Domingo de Soto puts it much more memorably, even poetically. He says, there is no comparison between the burning love a man has for his own things and how lazy and weak he is for those things that are held in common. Now, I can also give some personal anecdotes. So in Spain, after after property passes on, if you haven't decided who you're going to divide it to into a will, which is what happened to my grandfather, it passes to all the children, so all my uncles and aunts. That property is sat there for 10 years. No one has done anything about it. If there's a family meeting, you can imagine how it goes. So it's common property. It's not exactly great. Um, and it, it's a classic anecdotal issue of the problem of the commons. And it certainly did lead to more argument than if someone just got it. You can also think about historical examples, although they're somewhat controversial. If we think about collectivization in the Soviet Union, Certainly that we know led to certain famines. We're not sure exactly the numbers in the Ukraine, but depending who you listen to, somewhere between three and 10 million. You can also think about kind of the Great Leap Forward, the Maoist policies. Again, we're talking about between 15 and 55 million deaths. 
the argument here is, although many things were involved in that, it's a fact that collectivization, the move away from private property had something to do with that, whether it's because people weren't as good at harvesting what was in common or because they didn't want to give up or for other political reasons. And this kind of backs from a historical perspective, this argument of the scholastics on private property. Now, what is private property? Which doesn't necessarily have to come before why we have it. So effectively what we're talking about here is ownership. I mean, that's what people think when they think of private property, think of owning something. So this, for the scholastics, ownership was merely a right of use. Um, it might have other things to attach to it. So it could be a right of exclusive use. It could be the right to sell it or defend it in the use of the law courts. But ultimately, it was just a glorified form of use. So it wasn't necessarily the kind of Roman example of uh, the right to abuse it, to use it, and to destroy it. This was a more kind of exaggerated view. And Domingo de Soto, who's also um, a Spanish theologian in the 1500s, he says that it's the authority and right which one has over anything to make use of it for their own benefit in any way permitted by the law. And we see here immediately there's a qualification. It's not the right to do anything that you want with that property. You can't just start putting poisonous chemicals or listen to music at 200 decibels, annoy all your neighbors when they're studying for final exams. There are limitations. It has to be something that's permitted by the law. And that is an inherent idea under the scholastic concept of ownership. And so what are the qualifications? What are the limitations on private property? Well, for the scholastics, private property wasn't its own end. It wasn't a goal of something that was inherently good in itself. You didn't just want to get more property for the sake of having more property, as perhaps, unfortunately, a lot of people today, I suppose, it, frankly, in all history have done. It was necessary so that one could survive and provide for one's family. And anything super abundant, anything that was really way beyond this should be given to the poor. So if you've got a Ferrari, a Maserati, a private jet, a helicopter, actually you should be better off giving a substantial amount of that money to the poor, to those that are in need. And anyone that was in absolute necessity could take another's property to save their life. Um, and there's a quote from John Dunn Scotus, who was a Scottish Franciscan theologian in the 1200s. He said that the right to provide what is needed to sustain one's nature is a way conceded to everybody in extreme necessity. And this was the common opinion of theologians in that time. You had Bonaventure, Thomas Aquinas, so on. So if you're starving or you know, you're dying of thirst and there's no other way to sustain yourself, actually, if you take that loaf of bread from a shop, you're not committing theft from a theological perspective because you need to, you need to survive and you have that duty to maintain yourself, to preserve your nature. And those who possess property should also willingly share it with others because between friends, all things are in common. This is a, a slightly odd way of putting it, but. For the scholastics, private property still had infused in it some of what was common property. So one of the reasons that, for example, Aristotle was very much against having communal property is that it reduced the opportunity to practice the virtue of charity. If no one owned anything, you couldn't give anything to anyone else. You couldn't build up fraternal bonds with your friends. Oh, yeah, you can use my PlayStation or you can have my notes, whatever else. And in a society that had private property, you could practice that virtue. Now, of course, it hasn't worked perfectly, but at least in theory, you could still do that. And this idea of fraternal bonds is one of the key justifications that the scholastics had for private property. So to be clear, it's not its own end, which is I think something that we should reflect on generally. And private property must yield to the common good or to the public good. And there's another quote from De Soto. So the head of state as a custodian society can oblige citizens to contribute whenever there is need in the same way that as the administrator of justice, he can deprive owners of the goods that they have or he can declare others inept to receive them to punish their crimes. So if there's an absolute need in society, you can redistribute that wealth in certain circumstances. I mean, there's an issue of prudence, but in theory, it's possible. Francisco Vittorio is even more blunt. He states that nobody owns things in such a way that he will never have to share them at some point. So this idea that we have of property is if I own it, no one else owns it, and I can do whatever I want with it, is not something that the scholastics believed in. And that is to say, men should not own things as if they were his, but rather as if they were common in such a way that one can easily share them to meet others' needs. So there is this odd idea that despite the scholastics very much preferring private property, they view it through the lens of communal property um, for various reasons. I think part of it was to do with that most of them were religious. They lived in communities where wealth and property was shared. They didn't individually have any. And what about the feudal system? Where does that tie into these kind of theological, or let's say moral theology points. Well, there are parallels between scholastic thought and feudalism. 
Three main parallels, the use of time to measure and divide rights over land, the feudal doctrine of Eskia and the feudal doctrine of eminent domain. If you haven't run into these yet, at least the, first, the last two, you're lucky, you will run into them, unfortunately. Time and rights over land. Now in the common law, there is a fourth dimension when it comes to land ownership. And this is really something that's unique to the common law. You don't see it in, for example, French property law or German property law, the idea of time. And this is a famous quote from Walsingham's case, which I believe is also in the 1500s. The land itself is one thing and the estate in land is another thing. For an estate is a time in the land or land for time. And there are diversities of estate which are no more than diversities of time. And really this quote illustrates a certain number of things. Effectively, no one actually owns land in itself. What you own is a right to use that land for a certain period of time. And this ties in neatly, in my view, with the scholastic's view of ownership. And it's worth pointing out that in the feudal system, not even the monarch technically owned land. What he had was a preeminent right over land. He had the best right that was possible, but no one thought that he actually owned it in the way that we think of ownership today, which is interesting, I think. And what about Eskia? This is an old French word. Um, and as I said, it's pretty technical, but it's a legal doctrine whereby if a tenant dies without heirs, the land comes back to the Lord from whom it is held. That's from Blackstone. And it hasn't changed that much in the 400, 500 odd years since Blackstone wrote. So in a leading US case, it has been stated that the theory of the law in the United States is that first and originally, the state was the proprietor of all real property and last and ultimately will be its proprietor. And what is commonly termed ownership is in fact, but tenancy. So Blackstone's quote about a tenant, he's not just talking about a tenant the way we would think it, he means anyone that owns land. If they die without heirs, that land goes back to the Lord from whom it is held, which these days generally is the state or the state acting in representation of the people. So when this tenancy expires or is exhausted, the real estate reverts to and falls back upon its original and ultimate proprietor, or in other words, it escates to the estate. Um, there's a historical reason for that. And frankly, it's because lawyers like using posh words. That's why we use Eskia and my view. And what about eminent domain? This is defined as the power of the sovereign to take property for public use without the owner's consent by the leading American textbook on the subject. It has been stated that eminent domain is a remnant of the ancient law of feudal tenure. That's the case there. And effectively the situation here was if the king decided that you'd done something very bad, or, or maybe you just hadn't given the gift that he liked at Christmas, he could revoke your land rights. Now, in England and Wales, this happened very rarely. There are examples, unfortunately, when we're talking about the persecution in Ireland, that he'd revoked the rights that he gave there. And there are also examples after certain uprisings in the 1400s. But this is the idea of being able to revoke. And of course, lower down the feudal hierarchy, other lords theoretically could also revoke rights over land. And in course of time, the power to revoke the grants of land was whittled away. The people still own the land and the power to take it back upon payment of just compensation if the taking back is for the use of the people. And obviously in a democratic society like the US, we substitute the people for the feudal law, but the basic concept is still there. So it's another example of a limitation of the right of private property. And it demonstrates in my view, the truth of Domingo de Soto's statement that the head of the state as a custodian society can oblige citizens to contribute whenever there is need. Presumably, you would exercise eminent domain when there's a genuine need. Now, I know that in reality, eminent domain is used in circumstances that it shouldn't be. But in theory, it's supposed to be for the public good, not just maybe someone wants a new shopping mall or to build a random building there. It should be for the public good. And what does all this have to do with revitalizing the public good? You might think this is a great talk about theology or about history, but what on earth does it have to do with revitalizing the public good, especially considering private property is not necessarily thought of as a public good. Well, I'm going to illustrate that with two examples. Firstly, is the idea of the right to exclude. So if you own something, you can exclude someone else from that thing. And I think the US land law, in my view, has an exaggerated view of the importance of the right to exclude with regards to ownership. So you've got Blackstone's view, again, very poetic, that ownership is that sole and despotic dominion which one man claims and exercises of the external things of the world in total exclusion of the right of any other individual in the universe. That wasn't true in Blackstone's day, by the way, and it isn't true now, but it is a very influential view. And it has been adopted by the US courts, by the Supreme Court in several important constitutional property cases. And one of the most recent of these is Cedar Point Nursery against Victoria Hasee. Now there was a California statute which allowed labor organizers on to grow as property for a certain number of hours, a certain number of days per year to organize for labor purposes. 
And the Supreme Court ruled that this was a violation of the grower's right to exclude because they could come onto the property. And the court quoted an earlier case stating the right to exclude is universally held to be a fundamental element of the property right and held that the government here has appropriated right of access, so being able to come onto the land. And that meant that California would need to compensate the growers for such a taking if it wanted to keep the rule on the books. Realistically, California is not going to compensate them, so it's probably just going to remove the law. Now, in reality, in my view, the court's view is misconceived. In both Scotland and England, there are extensive rights to undertake recreation and private land, or at least certain types of private land. And I don't think anyone thinks that land ownership in either jurisdiction has been abolished. And there's also the question of the common good. Well, doesn't the worker's right to have labor representation trump the owner's right just to have someone transiently on their property. I mean, these people aren't going around smashing all the growers' property and throwing parties. They're on there for a legitimate reason. And that's not something that the court grappled with. I don't know if it's realistic to expect California to pay compensation for this kind of transient use. You do also have the other side of it. So planning law affects almost every aspect of property ownership in the modern world. This is an extract from the New York State Building Code, and it tells you the number of millimeters of width that a stairway has to be. This is really, I would say, quite an extreme ingress into the right of ownership. And in theory, these rules are for the common good, but they can often cause hardship. So in the UK, there was a, I don't know if many of you guys have heard of it, there was a Greenfall Tower tragedy. So in a couple of hours, a tower block caught fire because of defective cladding and about 72 individuals died. And after that, they made very specific rules that all of the buildings that cladding had to be cladded. But the problem was that thousands of individuals are now stuck in homes that they can't sell, they can't mortgage, and they can't rent. And they are probably on the hook for those repairs themselves, unless the government will pay for it. And frankly, the government never wants to pay for anything. So they're not going to pay for it. Now, this is an example of the other extreme. You have the exaggeration of private properties excluding everyone else, but you also have the exaggeration of private property as well. If it's for the common good, we can tell you everything, including the millimeters of stairways, and you have to reclad your own home or you're homeless. Both are exaggerated. So I think th these sorts of rules led to the idea that ownership consists merely of socially derived privileges of use. But for the scholastics and for me, ownership isn't just a merely socially derived right. It's a natural right, which comes from the need that you have to preserve yourself and to preserve your family. So although private property can be regulated, and I think it's a good thing that it is, the core of that right can't be abolished without returning to communal property and all the problems that the scholastics illustrate. On the other hand, planning law does have a legitimate role. You shouldn't necessarily be throwing parties or building factories right next to domestic homes but it's a question of how far you take it. And I think the cladding situation is a classic case of going too far. So apologies for going over time, but thanks very much for listening. And I hope we didn't send anyone to sleep. And Thomas, let me pose a question to each of the panelists and then um, we'll open it more broadly. But I, I have a question first for, uh, for Professor Marzen. And um, that is uh, that um, uh, we have seen in the United States the rise of what I'm going to call latifundia. Bill Gates, it turns out, is the largest owner of farmland in the United States. Uh, he, uh, and we see Gates and other wealthy individuals use uh, farmland as a vehicle for speculation. Uh, I can see the prospect. I don't know whether you can, but I will propose the prospect for uh, bipartisanship in a fairly uh, radical area, and that is a dis uh, dispossessed rural populist right and a skeptical urban left coming together to challenge the, the emergence of uh, modern latifundia. I'll pose that question to you. Then to, uh, let me run through each. Professor Jardim, um, to... Um, uh, your, uh, a wonderful presentation, I, I should say, and I'm going to connect your presentation to a recent constitutional development in the United States. The state of Maine, uh, a, a small American state, but an independent-minded one, enacted recently, uh, a couple weeks ago, in fact, uh, adopted as a constitutional provision of food as a basic human right in part at least to protect small-scale small agriculture. How would you see uh, legal constitutional protections playing out in the model you, you've, uh, you've explored in Rio de Janeiro and, and elsewhere? Uh, 
Professor Parento, if, if, if I could ask you um, uh, the following, and that is, um, as I listened to your talk, I, I heard many references to the initiatives of individual nations, but uh, there is really a global trust here with climate change. We have seen the emergence uh, since the 1990s of, of various world courts involved, particularly in the area of trade, also in the protection of human rights. The World Trade Organization, for example, and the World Trade Organization has taken a few faltering steps towards recognizing environmental concerns as, as an externality that uh, should be taken account of. But let me suggest that perhaps what we need is a, a a perhaps a global or, an, or international court of climate change to regulate um, uh, a, a, and supervise developments in, in this area. And finally, uh, uh, Professor uh, 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 Alkalela, uh, uh, I've often toyed with the uh, language of the social character of private property. And, uh, and I've broken down the social character of private property. You can give, give many illustrations of American law, uh, common, the right of common carriers for the obligation of common carriers, for example, non-discrimination, the uh, licensing requirements that require nurses and doctors and others to, to provide treatment, uh, medical treatment, medical care in emergencies, easements, uh, the right of adverse possession, uh, uh, the doctrine of waste, limiting the, the ways in which you can dispose of, of, prop, uh, of property. Uh, would the uh, uh, characterization of your argument as a kind of social character of private property, would that help your argument uh, politically and legally to gain, uh, gain traction in the United States? I'll pose these questions to each of our, our panelists and, and please, in, in the order I've asked, uh, perhaps, um, Perhaps you all could respond, Professor Marzen. Yes, I, I certainly think there's a there's a great opportunity for the for the right and the left um, to to um, to find common ground with with this issue of uh, you know more and more concentrated ownership of, of farmland in a in a in a few individuals and a couple couple parts to that you know first time are, are addressing the the hurdles that first time um, farmers uh, face so like. Uh, my presentation went through um, the issue of, of student loan relief, but then there's also, um, you know, possibility of, of tax incentives and then um, uh, uh, bonds that, um, like the Aggie bonds program, I, I discussed the Aggie bonds program in my paper where um, the government um, issues um, bonds to, to state issuers, and then they in turn um, can, can issue um, loans to, to first-time farmers up to a certain amount under federal tax law. Now that amount is $450,000, um, but there has been an effort to try to increase that, um, particularly with the rise in, in farmland prices. And then the other part of that question, I think it, it presents a, a national security issue as well. Um, uh, you know, some of the investors are... are you know, based in the United States, but then, you know, more broadly, you know, who are uh, these investors? You know, are they, are they, um, you know, primarily interested in, in agricultural purposes or, um, you know, there, there could conceivably be a situation where, um, you know, a foreign government could actually um, concertedly um, um, look at, at the issue of land ownership and, and use that as a, as a, uh, as a, as a foreign policy prerogative. A sovereign wealth fund. Yes, absolutely. So I think there's, there's a, a national security issue there as well. And there's more and more policymakers that are raising that, um, that, that issue um, at the federal level mm -hmm. um, as, as a national security concern. But I certainly support for first time farmers. You know, there, there's, uh, there's a, I think a lot of opportunity for that, uh, for common ground to, to help first time farmers. Professor Jardine. Um, so thanks for the question. Considering food as a human right, you can find in the constitution of Brazil, uh, not only the food, but other, other important uh, considerations about uh, the human rights. Um, in the local level, you can find in the Rio de Janeiro law uh, constitution, um, the, the city law, 
in the city urbanistic regulations, you can find the urban agriculture uh, as, a, as a right. But as I mentioned in my presentation, uh, that's not enough because uh, the, the, the program uh, is, is does, does, it doesn't have a, a properly uh, regulation for Hortas Cariocas. It has a general regulation for urban agriculture. So the following uh, mayor of the city could just finish the program uh, or change it or make it smaller. So it's, it's, it's really vulnerable. Um, so the law is a really important thing, but not enough. We need the act of the, of the city hall. We need the, uh, popula the, the, the citizens uh, taking a look uh, on the program, participating on it. We need the university also contributing, criticizing. Uh, and this is what I'm trying to do with my, my thesis. So the law uh, is an important thing, but it's not enough. Thank you. So Professor Parento. Well, that's a great question, uh, Professor Reed. Um, the International Court of Justice in The Hague would be a potential forum for what you're suggesting. Uh, this is also known as the World Court. It was created back in 1946. Um, and it has to be initiated by either a vote of the General Assembly of the United Nations, the, the World Court is an arm of the UN. Uh, interestingly enough, it could also be uh, engaged by a request from the World Meteorological Organization, which of course is, is a climate science-based organization. That body has never requested an opinion from the World Court, but it could. And there is pressure coming from the island nations led by Vanuatu um, to, to make that, that referral from either the General Assembly or the World Meteorological Association. It would be in the form of an advisory opinion. It would not be binding. Uh, you know, sovereignty uh, inter intervenes here. And um, in order for the World Court to issue a binding decision, it would be more in the nature of arbitration where there was an agreement upon the parties to uh, abide by the decision of the world court and the United States of course would not be in a position to agree with that but but an advisory opinion depending on how the question is framed uh, could be very influential I think um, um, and it would have to be framed in the nature of um, our individual countries, um, taking actions that are causing and contributing to serious climate damage in other countries. I think that case can be made today. The, the science of, of attribution, of being able to attribute extreme events to the accelerated impact, the amplification impact that greenhouse gases are having is, is improving. The scientific community is, is able to literally quantify how much more damaging has a given hurricane, tropical storm, flood event, precipitation event, wildfire event, how much of the damage being done by these extreme weather events is attributable to human effect and to the emissions that are coming from the major contributors. So, so there's a case there to be framed and to be presented to at least that court. And I think it would be a good thing. And Professor Alka Leila. Thanks. Um, so I think I'd be, I'd be interested in looking the ideas of the social carrot of property. Um, my only concern is that, I, as I said, I'm not saying property is a socially derived right. So I know that when, if I analyze that, I don't want people to say, okay, well, let's say we all wake up one day and we decide we don't want the latest iPhone, we're just gonna have common property. I would still say, well, you know, even if everyone agrees that it's still wrong because it's a natural right to property. Mm -hmm. Um, in terms of gaining traction, I'm not, I'm not convinced myself the idea will gain traction, but I'm just putting it out there as an interesting idea, but I'm sufficiently jaded to think that I will not change people's love of, of an extreme view of private property. Um, I suppose, I, although the presentation was on private property, it would be the only way would be, you know, to focus more on the existing ideas of common property. 
So when it comes to, you know, even though it is minor things like hiking, there's been a lot of books done on the fact that actually you used to have the people had the right to walk around the US it was a lot more kind of recreational activity and that over time whittled down. And I think someone you could look at the, you know, the examples that have in Scotland, England, Norway and so on and look at, okay, well, this is no one necessarily like hates hikers. I don't think, okay, maybe some farmers, but generally you're not going to be super raging about it. So it's an easy way to sell the idea. And also perhaps the, the importance of common property generally, even though my presentation was on private property, I think given there's that lens of common property, um, but it's certainly something I'd be interested in looking at. Mm -hmm. It's just, I don't want to get the idea that it's a socially derived right. I want to really okay. emphasize that it's a natural right okay. with limitations, not that I own something. If you come onto my land because you need a pair to live, I can shoot you. That's not acceptable. Mm -hmm. We have to have some limitations on it, but it's a really good question. Thank you. Welcome back. We're going to get started for our next panel. First up, we have Dr. Matthew Totolo. He began his academic career in English literature, earning his doctorate from UCLA. He then pursued his law degree from the University of California, Berkeley, where he was an associate editor of the California Law Review. Before joining the faculty at West Virginia University, Professor Totolo was an associate at Latham and Watkins in Silicon Valley, California, where he practiced complex commercial litigation. Professor Totolo was a Fulbright Scholar in Spain in 2018 and 2019. His current research focuses on the 19th century American legal and political history. Dr. Totolo teaches American legal history as well as commercial law. He is currently completing yet another PhD, and this time in European and American history at West Virginia University. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Totolo to our panel. Hi, thanks for that introduction. Um, I am going to put up, I can share my screen, right? Let's see. Uh, yes. Try, yes, I can. Okay, good. Let's do it then. Sharing. Okay. Um, yeah, so thanks for inviting me uh, to do this. I wanted to, so what I'm going to talk about today is just the unfolding drama around the Biden infrastructure plan and what's happening at that level, I think it's really, I think it's a, a, a really pivotal moment for public goods politics in the United States. So I think this is a really great time to be having this conference. Um, really very well timed, I think. So what I'm gonna do today for the uh, time I have is to talk about three things. Um, the first is just the Biden legislative agenda and ask the question um, whether this legislative agenda represents in a, a really more expansive vision of public goods and a break with the uh, a break with the past. Second is I'll talk I'll ask why infrastructure and why that is so important um, and why that's why that has been on the agenda for a long time and why it's happening now. Then and I'll I'll talk a little bit about this perennial battle between hard and soft infrastructure. And lastly, I'll end with a cautionary note uh, about public-private partnerships, which are likely to be a large part of the Biden uh, of, of the infrastructure package and, and the way it unfolds. So, something you've probably heard about today in earlier panels, um, maybe in the keynote. Also, you've probably been talking a little bit about neoliberalism. So. I'm not going to belabor this point too much since it's a term I think people um, understand, <clears throat> but I'm going to I'll, I'll talk for some a minute about it. So we're in um, we're in the, I'd say um, had a 40 plus year bipartisan consensus that uh, around public goods that generally markets are better than government. Um, this period, some in the U.S. thought of as a, as conservatism uh, against liberalism is often now framed as a uh, uh, around the term neoliberalism. And it involved uh, welfare state rollback and um, other factors like de uh, massive deregulation in the banking sector and elsewhere, uh, deunionization um, in the United States and um, in the, uh, across the Western world. And what I wanna talk about today is this, what we've dealt with in the last 40 years with persistent underinvestment in public goods in the United States. And I think that's where the Biden plan really, really comes in. So um, you can see here on some charts, um, on the one on the right, you can see uh, public investment as a share of GDP. 
from the early 60s. Uh, and then this was projected into 2007. This was a chart from the late 90s. The trend's basically a high point in the middle of the 70s. And then you can see right around um, the Reagan era, beginning of the Reagan presidency, a, a drop in public investment as a share of GDP. The economy grew at a much faster rate than um, public investment, which, net, which did not keep up with the rate of growth in the economy. And you can see on the other side, uh, state and local spending on infrastructure as the federal government withdrew from infrastructure investments at the state and local levels, the states, states and cities had to step in and take on greater debt load and greater responsibility for our, uh, basic infrastructure. Um, here's another chart that might be helpful. Uh, this is an estimate of how much of, a, of an investment gap there is in certain kinds of hard infrastructure that we usually look at when we talk about hard infrastructure, roads, bridges, and transit with a um, two million estimated $2 trillion deficit, electricity, 934 billion, schools, uh, 870 billion, and down it goes, waterways, ports, airports, rail, water and wastewater. And of course the need, especially around ports, and waterways has gotten, and roads and bridges has gotten even more uh, pronounced and acute with COVID. So there's the there's a funding gap here. Um, okay, so Joe Biden takes the presidency um, this year and immediately announces some very big changes. And that model I talked about a minute ago of neoliberalism, kind of uh, shift to the private sector, shift away from robust federal government support for infrastructure and public services and so on. And so people immediately start writing and asking this question, um, is Joe Biden dismantling neoliberalism? Which is to say, is Joe Biden really departing from this bipartisan consensus around public goods? Um, and others have said the same, free market is dead. Well, what would replace it with a picture of Joe Biden? Um, the age of neoliberalism is ending in America, what will replace it? And uh, Biden, Biden and the waning of the neoliberal era. So I think a lot of people that, that were surprised, okay, were, were really taken aback and surprised by the ambition of the legislative ambition of the incoming Biden administration. He was always a defender of neoliberalism in a way, a, a centrist, right? He was a centrist in our, in our vocabulary. Uh, so I, for one, was really surprised. I was very surprised to see that kind of ambition, that ambitious uh, uh, project coming out of the early Biden, the Biden administration. And, and so there's a shift, I think, in a couple of ways. One is in the rhetoric and substance. So he says at the beginning of his presidency, uh, at the beginning of this year, it's going to create the strongest, most resilient, innovative economy in the world. It's not a plan that tinkers around the edges. OK, it's not a, the Clinton Obama, um, not the Clinton Obama approach. So he's distant, he's distancing himself from that, I think. It's a once in a generation investment in America, unlike anything we've seen or since we built since we built the interstate highway system. So he's invoking the New Deal and invoking mid-century liberalism. Um, and historians are already comparing him to LBJ or to, to the New Deal. Um, see the. Uh, yeah, so he's being compared to the he's being compared to FDR, right? And one of the, the historian Jonathan Alter, who wrote writes about um, FDR, says, yeah, people are comparing him and his project to the New Deal. Um, yeah, he's he's so the question is, is that really a fair comparison? And I think it is. It's too early to know for sure, but it is at least in terms of the the rhetoric uh, and the ambitious rhetoric and these infrastructure package that just got passed and the one that is um, that is being debated in Congress right now, he stacks up really well. And I have to agree with, with that assessment. Um, for Biden to really have a Rooseveltian presidency, he would have to take his considerable achievements for this year and keep it up. And I think that's, I think that's a fair and I think that's an accurate assessment in terms of his ambitions. This is probably the most ambitious set of uh, proposals we've seen uh, in, in several generations. Um, and as I say, more ambitious than many predicted based on, and certainly I predicted based on a cent his centrist record. Um, 
you know, if you compare Biden's approach to COVID with Obama's approach to the 08, 09 crisis, in terms of, in terms of Biden's, um, the, the direct support, you know, in, in that Biden is envisioning for the economy and for everyday citizens, I think it's much, much different kind of approach. And with the one point, um, this 1.9 trillion COVID relief package is a massive relief package that passed earlier this year. This 1.2 trillion infrastructure bill that I'm going to talk about in a minute. And so just the, the scope of the ambitions, I think, is remarkable here. Um, and I think this, in terms of the infrastructure um, bill, the law, the largest and most comprehensive approach to infrastructure investment in generations, I think. Um, Okay, so yes, I do think he's doing something that's different. I do think it's a departure from the past. But why infrastructure? Well, um, just a brief, you know, brief history here. So in the same time in the 1980s, as there's this disinvestment or withdrawal from public investment in the US, there becomes um, a infrastructure at that moment gets onto the gets onto the public radar. People are talking about our our crumbling infrastructure, and they've been talking about it for about 30 or 40 years, solid 40 years. And it, this becomes a really important uh, topic in everyday life in the US. People, people, it becomes part of common sense that there is this crumbling infrastructure. You have the American Society for Civil Engineers here. You can see that little logo on the right. They issue, a, uh, they issue a, a reports on the state of America's mostly hard infrastructure usually with a pretty bad grade, like C minus, um, D, Ds are not uncommon. And you know they've been doing this grading of American infrastructure since the 1980s and it's usually pretty bad. Um, and so it's not a coincidence that these two things are happening at once, that as federal investment is beginning to get withdrawn from infrastructure and there are these gaps in investment then it, people, people begin to notice this. Also why infrastructure, well, if you look at the polling on this uh, issue, the infrastructure polls really well, depending on when you ask and how you ask people, you, there's somewhere between the low 60s to the high 80s percentage of American support, increasing federal spending for roads, bridges, mass transit, and other infrastructure. So I would say there's bipartisan support, um, even where the one that, you know, a one trillion or one trillion plus price tag is mentioned, people still people still generally support, strongly support investment. And the second point I would raise is that there's support for both hard and soft infrastructure. Okay, I'm gonna talk about that distinction in a, in a second here. Um, so hard and soft infrastructure. Um, with hard infrastructure, this would be the physical things that are essential to the, the economy and quality of life soft infrastructure, institutions and basic technology services that are essential to the, uh, to the economy and quality of life. Another way, maybe a little bit more detailed way of explaining that, you know, hard infrastructure you know, refers to the large physical networks necessary for the functioning of a modern industrial nation. Soft infrastructure is what sometimes is called the caring economy. But here we're talking about all the institutions that are required to maintain the economic health, cultural, and social standards of a country, such as financial systems, the education, healthcare. So it's a very broad category. It's a very broad category of social investment in hard physical infrastructure and in this, this other larger category called the caring economy or soft infrastructure. So in terms of the bill that passed last week, this Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act is, <coughs> excuse me, Originally was pitched as a $3.5 trillion bill, now, now a $1.2 trillion bill. And you know, what's in it, you can, uh, roads and bridges, public transport, passenger rail, uh, there's investment in electric vehicle, charging station grid, rural, rural broadband, um, airports. Okay, so there's, there's a lot of specific, specific areas that will all be classified as hard infrastructure. And in this bill, I would classify as a, I would categorize as a sweeping, a sweeping bill, um, of which is pitched as, and I think accurately as the largest public investment in, in this category in generations, passed last Friday, I believe. So, okay, so there, that, that passed, it was, again, it was pitched as a, at a much higher level. It 
uh, arguably is not sufficient. We could we could talk about that. I don't think it's perfect. It's got problems in it, but and I, which I'm going to talk about. But it, it is it is at least ambitious and a very different approach from what you got from the Clinton the Clinton Obama um, bipartisan uh, neoliberal approach. But what about soft infrastructure? So I really like this tweet. Um, earlier this year from Bernie Sanders, um, because it kind of gets at this concept of infrastructure and what does it include. He says roads and bridges and tunnels are infrastructure. Yes, absolutely. Uh, but I think many of us see a crisis in human infrastructure in this country as well. Uh, when a working class family cannot find good quality, affordable childcare, that's human infrastructure. When a senior in Medicare cannot afford dental care, that's human infrastructure. Um, the truth is in many ways we are behind so many other countries throughout the world in providing for working families, the elderly and children. I think now's the time to begin addressing our physical infrastructure and our human infrastructure. So, okay, so the, the, I think what Sanders is calling attention to is the fact that they really, this is a very broad term, right? And what you categorize as infrastructure is really important because, because um, of that public support around investment in it popularity of it. So getting the what you're interested in investing in categorizes infrastructure is important. And you can see there's some debate here about what exactly is infrastructure. Okay. So the soft infrastructure side, so-called, um, is, is in the Build Better Act, which is now being debated. And we're going to see debates on this for a while. And this is a, what was again, started at, I think around three, 3.5 trillion is now being pitched at around 1.75 trillion. And this is investments in universal free preschool, childcare and elder care. The idea is creating a nationwide paid family leave policy, clean energy investment, affordable housing, lowering prescription drug costs. So a lot of this really has been on the wish list for liberals and progressives for a long time, but not really acted upon even, even for the most part in the, in the Obama uh, era. Um, so what I think you should look out for here in the coming weeks and months is a battle between progressives and centrists, okay? Progressives, at the way that this last few months has played out, progressives, uh, congressional progressives wanted to pass both the hard and the soft infrastructure packages together, but they, they weren't able to do that. And they wanted to do that because they wanted to make sure that both of these categories got, got the kind of really ambitious investment not just the hard infrastructure stuff, but all the other stuff, like expanding Medicare, childcare, um, and, and, and so on. <clears throat> so what you need to watch for for the next few months, uh, maybe longer, is the congressional debate around the size of this soft infrastructure bill. Um, watch out, watch for the congressional debate around what remains in the final version of the bill. And right now there's gonna be, there is a, issue around that the Congressional Budget Office, right, is currently work, working up an estimate for how this is going to be paid for. So look for, watch out for, watch for that, watch for the debate to be around that issue, the pay fors and well, how this is going to be, um, how this is gonna be paid for and what's gonna be in the bill can still open questions. Um, so the last thing I wanted to talk about was issues of concern with this bill, and there's, there, this is just one issue that, that I wanted to focus on with the hard infrastructure bill. And that's a section called public-private partnerships, <coughs> excuse me, private activity bonds and asset recycling. Um, this is part of the, how is this gonna get paid for? How is it gonna, how is it going to be implemented? And uh, one section, uh, proposed financing sources for new investment and it is written this way. There's closing tax loopholes, redirecting existing federal funds, some of it COVID funds, and public and public-private partnerships, private activity bonds, direct pay bonds, and asset recycling for infrastructure investment. It's for somebody like me who follows this public-private partnership stuff and privatization. Of course, this you know this immediately um, raises concerns about how this is going to be, uh, how this is going to work on a local and state level. So over the summer, um, and a group called Indivisible, which is a left-leaning advocacy group, sent a letter to Nancy Pelosi, I think it was in, yeah, it was in July, cautioning Congress about pro public-private partnerships, essentially where 
a government hires, this can be, this can mean a number of different things, but basically where government may hand over some assets to a private company to manage in exchange for, <clears throat> for fees collected as tolls and so on. Okay. There are a number of projects like this that have uh, unfolded around the country in the last few decades, some successful, some not. And, and so the caution, the caution in this letter was about handing over too many of these projects to the private sector, essentially, um, and, and being really cautious about this. For one thing, it's cheaper for governments for governments to borrow. The return on municipal bonds is much lower than what private equity investors expect. Uh, so ultimately, too, privatization can drive up the ultimate cost of infrastructure, which have to be paid in over the long, sometimes 40, 50 years or even longer, depending on the term of the lease. So the thing to look out, look out for as these projects get developed over the next you know, coming years is look out in your area for terms that are very with very long-term lease terms favoring private equity. So for example, some crumbling road in your area, your government decides to give it to a private to give it to a private company for 40 years in exchange for an upfront payment. Um, and then it returns to the government. We well, have to look, really be careful about that because you have to be concerned that this these kinds of arrangements can cede control over the infrastructure to private equity. You want to make sure that your local governments have retained policymaking authority over the assets. Um, so I thought this was a good this was a good letter, and it was important kind of important for the legislators to think about as they went into this um, drafting this bill. The other thing too is remember Donald Trump and Infrastructure Week and all that. He, you know when he had this proposal it had a lot of public private stuff in it. The Democrats were critical of that. Um, uh, here's Chuck Schumer, a private sector driven, this is 2017, a private sector driven infrastructure plan means tolls, 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 paid for by average working Americans. Um, it also means that infrastructure that can't be built with tolls like repairing schools will likely be left behind. Um, this is just a private money making operation for the big business buddies of the president. Okay, um, Schumer says again, the president's plan is a recipe for Trump tolls from the end of one, one end of America to the other. They don't want more tolls. Okay, so you can see this, th what's happening, right? The criticism of the of privatization of excessive, right? We wanna make sure that we're not just selling off all these public assets to private, to private sector um, who are then are gonna try to monetize them through excessive tolls. And that's the concern at the, at, at the bottom of this. So, um, I want to end with a kind of positive note here, with a with a positive uh, note from this legislation, which is uh, I, I was it was a very very long piece of legislation, but one of the sections here, section eleven five zero eight, requires that, um, for example, transportation projects carried out through public private partnerships um, use value for money analysis. So one of the one of the issues that that came up that's come up in the last uh, 20 years with projects is making sure that the projects get valued in the right way so that the government can decide whether that, you know, to understand the long-term impact both fiscally and politically in terms of handing over, you know, a potentially long-term lease, leases effectively, whether that's better for the government to have more control over or it's whether, whether that can be safely kind of franchised to a private sector provider. So this value, this is a good sign, I think, that there's a value for money analysis model for how these projects are going to be evaluated. So essentially, the idea is that P3s um, should only be considered if they, if they can be demonstrated that they will achieve additional value compared with other approaches, if there's an effective implementation structure, and if the objectives of all parties can be met within the partnership. So kind of not just who's the cheapest bidder for each project, right? But whether this is gonna be a long-term value for the public um, by using public sector comparative comparator analysis, which essentially is making sure the public sector can't do this cheaper and more efficiently, making sure that this is actually something that's going to be more efficiently done by the private sector or that the government can't do itself. And estimating the whole life cycle cost of these arrangements, we have to be really careful that Biden's plan doesn't turn into a big sell-off of public assets, and that you know that that's something that's going to have to be watched on the local level as well to make sure that this is this is being handled in a way that that you know redounds to the public, but uh, not to not just to private equity investors.
But I think overall, this is a positive sign this, that this kind of analysis is being used, uh, it hasn't commonly been used in the US. Um, and so I think it's good that it's in the bill. Uh, I just think that, you know, I think it means that states have to, are going to be required to evaluate long-term impact of these investments, not just short-term budgetary concerns, right? The equity firm giving you a $10 billion to fill up your city budget because you have a budget gap, but then over 40 years, it turns out that this is really a bad deal for the public. So I think it's a good sign. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, so I'll end there. Um, just uh, so in terms of this question about Biden and neoliberalism, I, I'm cautiously optimistic as a critic of this, um, of this particular of, of neoliberalism and, and, and particularly of this question of public investment, where I, which I think you know, I think we've had a chronic short, chronic underinvestment in public goods um, in the U.S. for several for decades. So I and I do think that in terms of its ambitions, this is the biggest approach to public goods since biggest shift in public goods since the New Deal, since the mid 60s anyway. Um, a couple of things to keep in mind, of course, is this distinction between hard and soft infrastructure, which will continue to be a fight between progressives and centrists on costs, as well as on what gets included in the bill, okay? And finally, I think issues to watch, um, I, I think we could be very, very careful, especially with the size of this bill, that that public-private partnerships, you know, um, are are done the right way when they are done, and that we have to think about cost effectiveness, but also public control over the assets, and we have to ensure that public assets are being valued fairly and with an eye to their long-term value to the, uh, to the public. Um, but with on that kind of optimistic note, I will uh, I will end there. Thank you, Dr. Totolo, for that incredibly timely and um, uh, impactful presentation. If you could stay on until the end, we'll do a little Q&A session with whatever time is remaining at the end of the panel. Next up, we have Timon Klein. He grew up in Dakar, Senegal, later becoming a native of Tennessee. Prior to earning his law degree at Rutgers Law School, he earned a Master's of Arts in Religion and at Westminster Theological Seminary in Philadelphia. He's currently a law clerk at the Office of the New Jersey Attorney General and a Craig Center Fellow at Westminster. He was previously a legal fellow at the Markup, and during law school, he interned for Judge Frida Wolfson in the U.S. District Court. He has served as the Associate Editor in, on the Rutgers Journal of Law and Religion and the Managing Editor of Law and Philosophy. He is a sought after and popular writer and academic. His work has appeared in various places such as American Mind, National Review, and the American Spectator. Please join me in welcoming Mr. Klein to our panel. Hey, well, thank you uh, so much. And thank you to the Journal of Law and Public Policy for hosting uh, this symposium and allowing me to be a brief part of it. Um, the title of my talk is uh, Well-Regulated for Well-Being. Uh, public health and public good in uh, 19th and early, early 20th century case law. Uh, the impetus for this uh, research is uh, probably rather predictably our own public health crisis, um, but not the pandemic as such. Uh, rather, I've been uh, fairly disappointed with the vast majority of, of public commentary uh, regarding public health measures, both in terms of their purported rationale and contemplation or lack thereof. Um, of proper form and means. Um, that's to say, it's, it's become apparent to me that, the, that we have lost in our public reason the ability to consider and explain uh, the basis and purpose of state action for the common good within our federal system, uh, which is the, the respect for subsidiarity and balance of the rights of individuals and the rights of society. Um, there seems to be limited serious talk of either in our present context. Um, the binary usually presented is usually that of, of either unmitigated or unthinking acquiescence to uh, the capital T experts um, or militant resistance to any kind of government action that might encroach the proverbial front lawn. Um, so what we have is a, is a conflict of uh, rights of society and rights of individuals, as I said. Um, sorely lacking in, in both is uh, any robust consideration of the common good classically conceived uh, which I'll, I'll assume familiarity with from an audience at a university that champions the venerable motto, all for the common good. Um, older American case law, though, in the, in the period in focus reflects a sort of different world uh, 
um, which I want to provide a very brief survey of with my uh, remaining time. Um, the, the cases in view are seemingly endless in their number, usually terse and filled with now foreign assumptions about the nature of man and society, uh, which are vestiges of participation in a centuries long conversation we now seem to have resigned from. Uh, but taking a chronological step backward and into them perhaps can help us chart a course forward or rather through uh, many of our present consternations. Um, the, the cases I refer to could be broadly categorized as state police power cases. Uh, this isn't merely a preliminary matter, but supplies much of the approach to public health by prior courts. Uh, state police power, of course, many will be familiar with, uh, was first fully articulated in the Massachusetts case of 1851, Commonwealth versus Alger. Um, it's the authority, uh, generally speaking, to regulate for health, safety, morals, and so on of the populace reserved to the states uh, in, in the 10th Amendment, but considered to be pre-existent inherent powers of the states inherited from their colonial status and delegated to them by the crown. Um, in the 18th and 19th century, the, the police powers uh, or, or police generally referred to broad regulatory power um, long before we had uh, police forces to, to use that uh, nomenclature. So as Thomas Cooley explains in his constitutional limitations, um, the, the power embraces a whole system of in, internal regulation by which the state seeks to preserve the public order and prevent offenses against the state. Um, as the Supreme Court put it in 1890, the police power includes all measures for the protection of life, health, property, welfare of inhabitants, and for the promotion of good order and the public morals, um, so otherwise known as the common good. Um, this had been the quintessential function of government acknowledged since uh, the 18th century and long before. Um, so you see in early documents like the Massachusetts Constitution of 1780, uh, making it abundantly clear that the government is, quote, for the common good, for the protection, safety, prosperity, and happiness of the people, um, and it's not for private interest. Uh, this assumption was still um, easily discernible, alive and well, in the antebellum years of the Republic and, and beyond to some extent. Um, people expected, as William Novak in his um, unparalleled study um, of, this, of this period it calls it the well-regulated society to uh, express the ex expectations of the people at the time. Government action was not alien. Um, it was not an incursion in their lives, but an intricate part of it. And uh, the notions of self-government were uh, essentially limited to participation in this process, not apart from it. Um, this expectation was the basis of this power and rooted in the states within our compound, not consolidated uh, republic, which Max Edling in his new book, Perfecting the Union, does a marvelous job of describing uh, this difference between the general powers for the general welfare of the union delegated to um, the, the federal government, which were external matters, and the much broader powers for regulating for the common good reserved to the states for internal matters. Um, this has been a, a, a this distinction has been a source of, of my disagreement with my friend Josh Hammer recently on the, the uses and abuses of the federal preamble for jurisprudential substance. But that's a a different topic. Um, in, in any case, the power of states to regulate for the good and, and the common good generally uh, was an unchallenged assumption. and it, it runs throughout these cases and is a, um, always in the background. Um, and this was being reserved for the states uh, was then in turn reserved for the legislatures as John Marshall Harlan puts it in the Jackson versus Massachusetts, now a much talked about case all of a sudden. Um, Legislatures would be the primary judges of what constituted the good and welfare of the Commonwealth. Um, this is because they are politically accountable and uh, to those people and best suited to assess common sentiments and common needs of the populace. Um, so they're accordingly uh, afforded a significant amount of deference um, and, and received from courts something what we would say is rational basis review, or as I simply like to call it, just review. Um, so long as proper interests of the, of the common good can be discerned and the, uh, the means of its pursuit reasonably fitted to that end, the policy in question would generally be upheld, which um, to invoke the, the angelic doctor is appropriate at the, at the event. Uh, th this conforms to Thomas Aquinas' uh, classic definition of law itself, right? A limits of reason for the common good uh, by one with care of the community and promulgated. Um, so this is not only a right of governments, but necessary leeway to enable them to be nimble legislative responders uh, to the particular interests and threats of society, especially as um, industrialization proceeded 
and uh, population density increased. Um, so what, what did this mean for uh, generally for the um, uh, conflicts with, with individual interests, which would be big questions today? Um, is the, the main Supreme Court put it in 1873 and in route upholding a, a rather brutal um, forced quarantine of children during a smallpox outbreak. Uh, the maxim salus populi supreme elects, the, the public welfare of the supreme, is the supreme law, um, is law of all courts and countries. The individual right sinks in, in the necessity to provide for the public good. Um, so Cicero's maxim was repeatedly thrown around by courts uh, rather ad nauseum, um, but, but some courts did give us a little more to chew on. So in 1857 case in the Pennsylvania Supreme Court um, explained that as individuals must in the nature of things have certain inherent and inalienable rights to be individuals, so society must have its inherent and inalienable rights to be society. Um, and this conformed to man's um, naturally social, sociable nature. Um, so the right and power of society to demand that each of its members shall contribute its just proportion to the common necessities is a natural and inalienable right for without there can be no organized society. Um, to, to quote another quote along the same lines, 1899, if the, if the purpose to be obtained is for the public health or comfort or the public weal generally, then the rights of the, individ of the individual must yield to the common good. Um, this is simply what it meant to the, them to be a part of society, which was a collective endeavor and a an ex natural expression of man's nature. Um, so, so challenges such as 14th Amendment challenges prior to incorporation um, and, and related objections were, were generally unacceptable to courts. Uh, Jacobson's bodily integrity argument, we might today say my body, my choice, uh, was barely entertained by Harlan in uh, 1905 and a, and a religious exemption was not even raised. Um, an Ohio court in 1908, a few years after Jacobson, uh, put, it, put it rather bluntly, the 14th Amendment of the Constitution was not designed to interfere with the power of the state to exercise its police powers to prescribe regulations to promote the health, peace, morals, education, and good order of the people. Um, so when, when push came to shove in general, there are exceptions. It was not um, individual autonomy or liberty as now predominantly conceived that filled the gaps, but rather the interests of the common good discerned by duly elected officials um, and, and as well as to those to whom they delegated authority. Um, so I've already alluded to, to cases dealing with public health, Jacobson being the most notorious, but want to do so briefly now more directly. Um, so query, what was the matter of, of uh, what was a matter of public health for which the police power could be exercised um, in the name of the common good. The question is not as, as simple as we might think. Um, in, the, in the period, the, these categories are not strictly delineated. Um, many cases are lumped simply into to problems of nuisance. Um, a, a court in New York in 1907 described that as any act which annoys, injures, or endangers the comfort, repose, health, or safety of, of a considerable number of people or offends public decency, so, so basically everything. Um, obstructing highways or navigable streams, uh, spreading infectious disease or selling contaminated food, these were all public nuisances per se. Um, and the general nuisances case tell, tell us very little about how public health as such was distinguished if at all. Um, an underappreciated part of this inquiry is a more holistic understanding of public health within the broader categories of the common good, and we'll return to that in a minute. But, um, something of what it, uh, of, of the meaning of public health, given in, in a more straightforward way, um, was at times discernible. So a court in 1850 um, reviewed an ord ordinance that authorized the city council to abate all nuisances of every description, which are or may be injuries to public health, and to pass ordinances uh, to do many things, including the suppression of disease. So this would be much more recognizable as a clear public health situation, uh, otherwise described as unwholesome food or poisoning the atmosphere, the air, um, they weren't worried about global warming quite yet, um, or introducing infectious uh, diseases. Um, other courts would just simply refer to these things as impending pestilence um, and the like. Um, of course, public sewage drainage, disposal of waste, and these types of things were all treated under this rubric. Um, but you would also regularly have um, public health spoken of in terms of public safety. So case in 1887 dealing with the negligence of handling poisonous drugs 
uh, was not uh, discussed as a matter of public safety, but rather of security. Um, other, other times courts didn't make explicit, explicit at all whether it was health, safety, or morals that were in view. Um, a regulation in 1909 um, of public dancing schools in New York where no intoxicating liquors could be sold and only people of good character could attend. Uh, this was justified as the preservation of peace and good, the suppression of vice, uh, and the preservation of health. So the, these were all lumped in together. Um, the Supreme Court treated an Iowa law banning uh, intoxicating liquors in 1873 as also a matter of public health. Um, so the, these are, all of this is kind of swirling around um, and, and the courts don't often feel uh, too much pressure to be uh, specific in which part of the common good as we would break it down um, was, was being treated. Um, but to return to the, the earlier and last point, um, part of this, the reason the distinctions are, are sometimes unclear is that well-being was a multifaceted um, consideration to these courts because they still recognize that the whole man, body and soul as a sociable creature was, was uh, in view. Um, which is a, a testament probably to the endurance of classical metaphysics um, and anthropology, which can be found um, as the basis of law in commentaries by James Kent and Nathaniel Chipman at the time, um, where moral philosophy still served as the, the starting block for all other inquiry. Um, so these con the connection between a holistic well-being and the common good was still strong, and this is most evident in uh, Sabbatarian cases or, or cases on Sabbath laws. Um, my favorite, favorite opening from any of these cases thus far from my own native Tennessee in 1878 said uh, plaintiffs were convicting of violating the Sabbath by hunting and shooting through the woods and fields with guns and pistols for squirrels and other game to the manifest corruption of the public morals to the evil example and common nuisance of all good citizens. Um, this was a violation of the Sabbath law against hunting and fishing and indictable because it disturbed the worship of others through the performance of secular labor but also because it was prejudicial to the morals and health and public health of the community. Um, the explanation of Sabbath laws their, and their purpose in many cases was something like um, the ordinary businesses, business of life shall be suspended in order that thereby the physical and moral well-being of the people may be advanced as a New York case put in 1896. Um, the public economy required this. This is all justified uh, also for sanitary reasons. Um, as well as labor considerations. Um, I, I, I let one last case uh, discussing this. It's in the interest of the state to have a strong, robust, healthy citizens, citizenry. Uh, laws to affect this purpose by protecting the citizen from overwork and requiring a general day of rest to restore his strength and preserve his health have an obvious connection to the public welfare, end quote. Um, so in other words, it was a matter of public health as much as it was a matter of moral and religious enrichment um, or perhaps the two were not as distinct as we would now insist. Um, so the day of rest was good even for those who did not observe it by keeping it holy as in Christian services. Um, to end with this, this robust approach to public health by past courts, we could surely admit that our uh, pandemic response in, um, in our present uh, could have been improved by a more holistic consideration of well-being as these courts um, lead us to consider. Uh, balancing interests of eliminating contagion with that of economic in the classical sense, meaning domestic life, and yes, even spiritual health. Um, surely the documented increase in suicides, abuse, and drug use during the past year, especially in densely populated areas, speak to this fact. Um, prior courts were deadly serious about deadly diseases. Um, sometimes the severe enforcement of public health orders attest to that, but they were equally deadly serious about other threats to the common good, um, invisible threats beyond airborne pathogens. Um, any, it's my contention that any revitalization of public health as a public good requires a recovery of this classical understanding of both human nature um, and societal well-being and human flourishing unto the common good. Thanks. Kendall, I saw a note from Matthew Totolo. It just, uh, is Matthew still there? I am, yes. Uh, you, you have to leave uh, by the, well, 2 p.m. Central, is that the case? Oh, I'm sorry, yeah, 2 p.m. Central, right. You're um, one hour ahead, I forgot, apologies, yeah.
So uh, should I put a question to you now that you might answer, then we'll move on to the other two panelists in case sure, I miss you. Sure, sure. The question is this, uh, you presented a, a wonderful technocratic summary of infrastructure. But my question is this, what does it say to the public philosophy that's been so much the centerpiece of, of our morning's discussion? We had a, a, our keynote speaker addressed uh, a public philosophy of neoliberalism that is defined very neatly and very uh, totalistically, if you will, by uh, and dominated by economists, Friedrich Hayek, Ludwig von Mises, Milton Friedman, um, and you're, uh, you're looking at a series of, of technocratic responses, but is there a more robust philosophical uh, support to your, your case? Right. Um, yeah, I, I, do think, I do think there is. So all those figures you mentioned and public choice theory is another one we could, we could talk about. You know, the philosophical underpinnings of the uh, what I would consider with withdrawal of state support for economic life in the late 20th and early 21st centuries is really based on a few, a few things. One of them is a deep skepticism about the power of government, that government at this level tends to do more harm than good when it quote unquote interferes with the economy at this level. So, I, uh, so that in particular, I think what Biden is doing essentially, and what the Congress is doing is um, uh, kind of cutting the Gordian knot we've been tied up in the last 40 years by, by legislative and executive power, by using government, not just by arguing for it, but by actually doing, actually using government power to, to show, or at least take the risk, the gamble that, go that government at that level can do something very good, can reorient uh, the, the relation between state and economy for the in the, in the name of the public good. So right, the, the, the idea of the public good, right, from your talk with Hayek and all this was uh, under neoliberalism was the idea that we should abandon that concept as dangerously totalitarian, right, in part, and they're formulating their theories in the shadow of the Second World War. Um, the idea is that essentially techno, is, is that a um, market-oriented technocratic approach was better than any kind of commitment to a, a, a loose and baggy concept like the public good, which is dangerously manipul manipulable by, by populism and populist demagogues and so on. Um, now that's, that, that's, that has its merits in some sense. I mean, it, there, were, there was a reason why they, they, you know, again, there was a reason in the mid middle of the 20th century that that argument was, was important um, and relevant. And it's, they're still, it's still important and relevant in, in a sense. I and mean, if we ever get to the point where um, we're talking about a centrally planned economy, for example, which this is nothing, this is not what that, that's not what's happening, then maybe those criticisms would be relevant again. But the, in terms of the philosophical underpinnings, the case I think is made in terms of the exercise of public power through the legislative process and through our, the system of government we've, um, you know, that, we, that we've developed. It's a, de it's a democratic thing. What I mean, I don't, I don't mean the Democratic Party, I mean a small d Democratic thing. It's in the sense that it's a popular, there's a popular mandate for infrastructure investment. Um, it's so that you're right. I, mean, I presented a technocratic, a technocratic essentially a case because I'm so in, I'm kind of perhaps because I'm taking the idea of public good as a given. Um, and, and you're probably right about that. But so I'm not sure what you guys talked about this morning, but um, the basic philosophy would be that you know, infrastructure in a sense is almost, is, is in this sense coextensive with, um, it's a technocratic translation of the public good into technocratic, uh, I guess, language and vocabulary. Um, precisely, I think, to avoid that dangerously ambiguous concept of the public good, which can be manipulated in, um, to, to dangerous ends, which is where the figures you're talking about, Hayek and so on, where, where they were coming from. Um, so I don't know if that answers your question, but um, it, it, I, it does. Sorry, it does. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Okay, perfect. Well, thank you for answering that question, and also thank you to Mr. Klein for your another timely presentation. Uh, up next, we have Professor Correa. 
He is an assistant professor of law at South Texas College of Law in Houston. His scholarship focuses on the intersection of legal theory and practice. His most recent work explores the role of the 13th Amendment to the United States Constitution plays in determining the validity of state criminal disenfranchisement laws with a particular emphasis on the relationship between voting rights and citizenship. Professor Correa earned his undergraduate degree at UCLA, his JD at Oklahoma City University of Law, and his LLM in legal theory at New York University School of Law. Prior to joining the faculty at South Texas College of Law, Professor Correa engaged in civil litigation and civil appeals specializing in commercial law. He is a United States Army veteran and a proud husband and father. Please join me in welcoming Professor Correa to our panel. Thank you very much, uh, Kendall and Dr. Reed, for hosting me or inviting me to, to speak. <clears throat> I'm going <clears> to <throat> let everyone in on a dirty secret before I start. Uh, for most of my political life, uh, adulthood, I've been uh, libertarian, very, very stringently libertarian. And then I had children uh, after I got married. And then the pandemic hit, and it, it forced me to, to rethink a lot of my basic assumptions uh, about the rights before the good, um, the, the, the underlying philosophy that has guided much of my decision making um, throughout life so far. Well, the pandemic really kind of hit, the, I had to hit the brakes a bit because what I saw, uh, unfortunately, was what everyone else was saying, uh, uh, an inability to kind of corral around uh, the, the basic good, just to, to look after one another. There was still this kind of impulse, this hyper individuality that is the hallmark a lot of, of what libertarianism stands for. And so uh, I had to reach deep inside and start rereading some of the, uh, the republicanism philosophy that I used to read and, and then some communitarian philosophy. And I ran across Patrick Deneen's work, Why Liberalism Failed, and it really did uh, strike a pretty positive note with me. It struck uh, against a lot of those um, assumptions I made uh, about the value of philosophical liberalism. Uh, so what I'm going to talk to you today about is meeting uh, uh, Patrick Deneen's challenge, which is to think of how we can create uh, better political practices, uh, not a better theory that uh, kind of uh, postdates liberalism, but better political practices that can really forge trust among people uh, and uh, in, in invite a public spirit, spiritedness inside them as well. So first and foremost, Patrick Deneen, uh, his recent work, Why Liberalism Failed, it, he points to a number of aspects in which liberalism, philosophical liberalism, contradicts itself. Uh, one of the two main points that I picked up on that I'm going to address today are that uh, Patrick Deneen argues that liberalism uh, is really about anti-culture. Uh, in, in that sense, uh, I think a lot of the uh, philosophical liberalism that many people come in contact with uh, via Thomas Hobbes and John Rawls, uh, even, uh, where the individual is thought of as having no culture at all, uh, just kind of stripped bare of everything that informs the person of who he or she is. In a lot of respects, uh, especially with Thomas Hobbes, uh, the individual has really no culture at all, because in the state of nature, uh, it's the war of all against all. Nobody wants to cooperate, and if no one's going to cooperate, you can't have the, the kind of culture that we have today, arts and sciences and things of that sort. The same is uh, true with John Rawls, and uh, the, the idea of the veil of ignorance in, in itself, it just kind of unencumbers the person from any, any uh, place uh, any really association, although the person is supposed to imagine a political space of which he or she is going to be a part. Um, but thinking in terms of what an unencumbered self does, what Deneen focuses on is that an unencumbered self is untethered to any associations. So there's really no strong connection to any association in the Tocquevillian sense. Uh, religion, uh, having a connection to a religion, a religion, having a connection to a community, those are all things that are there, but they're contingent. Uh, the sense that I can walk away from anyone at any time 
is exactly the, the type of uh, problem that Deneen finds in liberalism because a person cannot develop any culture, there's no connection. Uh, the other part is that the unencumbered self is untethered to any place. Uh, being in one uh, local community is just as good as being in the, the next local community. Uh, it's just good as moving from next state to next state. There's no deeply embedded uh, place to which one belongs. Uh, and there, again, going back to the associations, there's no, uh, no community to which any person really strongly belongs or needs to. Uh, the unencumbered self is also untethered to time. Uh, one of the uh, challenges or one of the uh, criticisms that Deneen has about the unencumbered self is that uh, there's no future looking. Everything is in the present, in, in the present to, uh, to just meet one's desires, to meet one's choice. And so we see uh, one of his criticisms is, is in the national government's uh, consistent uh, um, call to increase the debt for future generations to take care of. Uh, as far as uh, you know, many liberals are concerned, that's something that the future generation can take care of itself, can make new ways to figure out on its own. This passing on of debt uh, without thinking of the long-term impact to uh, future generations is one of the highlights that uh, Deneen focuses on when challenging liberalism uh, at its core. Uh, the, second, uh, the second point I'm going to bring up is that liberalism degrades citizenship, according to Patrick Deneen. Uh, one of the uh, hallmarks of the American uh, experiment, according to James Madison, was to figure out how to avoid any one faction kind of taking control at any given time. And so he famously argued that if we enlarge the sphere, uh, uh, then there would be no single faction that could ever uh, take hold. Uh, Patrick Bean kind, of, kind of looks at this uh, in, in this uh, phrase or this concept uh, in a very unique way. He, he says, and he argues uh, convincingly, that this is a way of just kind of uh, fusing distrust or making perpetual distrust the norm. And with perpetual distrust being the norm, it makes it hard for people to trust one another, obviously, when it comes to public policy. The other aspect of the Federalist Papers that both uh, Hamilton and Madison uh, both champion was the notion uh, against uh, individuals having a direct say on public policy. And this is uh, something that Madison touched on when he was describing what a republic, the difference between a democracy and a republic. Uh, according to Madison, a democracy, a pure democracy, was where people all showed up and voted on a given public policy. Whereas a republic, according to Madison, it was where uh, people voted for a representative. And the representative then would determine the, the public policy. Well, there's always been, according to Deneen, this uh, in liberal democracy, this contradiction. The contradiction being that progressives, on the one hand, will champion voting rights. And in fact, will, it will work to increase uh, the voting rights uh, available to, to all. But at the same time, uh, progressives champion a bureaucratic state that disassociates individuals, or, or actually it makes it uh, that individuals are further removed from the actual policy making. It's no longer a direct representative that's taking care of a lot of policy, but technocrats, uh, bureaucrats that are, are that, that are experts in certain fields uh, that are, are really tailoring public policy uh, in a direction that is best seen by those experts as more conducive to the public good. Doing so, however, it it, it diminishes public spiritedness in this regard. It strips people of their day-to-day -day ability to self-govern, to enter into practices that show them how to deal with these problems. It, it treats them as if they are inferior uh, in a lot of respects, that they are incapable of governing themselves. Now, there's the problem, uh, largely stated. So Patrick Deneen presents a challenge, and that challenge is this. How can we create uh, better practices, create new cultures, uh, viable cultures, economics grounded in virtuosity within households, creation of a civic fullest life. And taking that challenge up on its face, one of the things we have to think about is, well, first and foremost, how do we foster trust? If we can't foster trust between one another, uh, this whole experiment could really fall apart. Which brings me to kind of a radical proposition. And that's that 
the uh, powers of local, state, and national government to conscript individuals might be used to foster civic trust, cooperation, and public spiritedness. Now, so you know, I'm not arguing, or not, I'm not stating that the, you know, the United States should start the next world war for the, sense, for the sake of you know, domestic tranquility, nothing like that. But this is small scale steps that a local government, state government, and that the national government can take to put people together, to work towards something that's, that's good, uh, towards the general welfare. And at the same time, taking care of the area within which they live. Uh, now, to bolster the support of people working together and, and kind of developing the sense of trust and public spiritedness, contact theory is based on that very thing, that the, uh, uh, the more you come into contact with others with whom you are not familiar, with other, with other backgrounds with which you've never been a part, the more likely you are to, to want to uh, reciprocate uh, other types of foods with those people, to share uh, in, in your culture with those there are also civic engagement studies that show that, uh, for example, in jury service, uh, persons that uh, participate in jury service are more likely to engage in uh, other types of civic engagement, including voting, uh, than, than the general population of those who do not participate in jury service. So there are a lot of different types of uh, public works to which people can be put. Infrastructure, you know, constructing and maintaining, maintaining roads, other types of civic engagement, obviously jury service is already one of those to which if, you know, if you're called and summoned to jury service, you must appear. But there are ways that we can actually bolster jury service by diminishing the opportunities to get out of jury service and also by potentially diminishing the right of a defendant or uh, anyone to really uh, look for a bench trial as opposed to a jury trial. Uh, civic engagement also in, in terms of voting, uh, mandatory voting is one route that could be implemented, um, but also there are other routes of increasing the opportunities to vote. And then there's community and environmental stewardship. Uh, things like um, AmeriCorps, which is already in place, are kind of a, a geared toward that, uh, looking after the environment, looking after communities. These are all things that can be done. Now, the question is, would it be legal uh, in, in the sense of would it be constitutional for the government to start conscripting uh, people to start engaging in the public, in, in, their, in their environment, in the public sphere. And that's the, the challenge. Now the 13th Amendment on its face, I start with the 13th Amendment because it's the most clear cut case uh, of a challenge where somebody's uh, saying, you're putting me to work against my will, this is an involuntary servitude. Uh, well, the court, Supreme Court, when wrestling with this issue of what does, uh, what is involuntary servitude? Uh, what's the purpose behind the 13th Amendment? The court uh, in Butler versus Perry, the United States Supreme Court, held that the purpose of the 13th Amendment is liberty under the protection of effective government. Now, one of the things that obviously the, the 13th Amendment was, uh, was ratified following the Civil War really to free uh, uh, new slaves, but it put everybody, or the, sorry, free, uh, make free uh, former slaves following the Civil War. Um, but at the same time, the 13th Amendment, it just stated universal freedom. Now, a lot of people don't pay attention to the fact that the 13th Amendment actually has an exception built into it itself for punishment uh, for crime. Uh, notwithstanding that exception, uh, some of the first cases that popped up from the 13th Amendment uh, arose from private contracts uh, where somebody was being forced by statute to fulfill the obligation. Robertson versus Baldwin, the United States Supreme Court opinion in 1897 was the first time this issue arose. Uh, it was dealing with a private merchant seaman agreement and a federal law that punished anyone who deserted a ship to which he was contractually bound to see uh, through the voyage. Uh, the Supreme Court uh, had to wrestle hard with this because the 13th Amendment actually does not uh, have an exception for anything except for punishment for crime. So th the question was, well, if a private actor can't enslave or, or, or force somebody to perform a, a, something like an obligation or, or servitude, and the government can't under the 13th Amendment, then what kind of contracts would be valid? Can we even have a military anymore? And the Supreme Court had to look to the spirit of the 13th Amendment to create what's known as a civic duty exception today. Uh, this, the court in, in Baldwin ultimately determined that the merchant seaman agreement at issue was one of the uh, types of private contracts that 
from time immemorial were uh, backed by government because without those laws, the safety of the sea voyage and the passengers uh, and the other crew members would be greatly at risk. But at the same time, uh, that history also bears out that uh, the uh, the naval, uh, sorry, merchant uh, seamen uh, agreements also were a very big product of the uh, the uh, security and economic stability of nations. There are also uh, public and community infrastructure and well-being cases that show up. Uh, the slaughterhouse cases is probably one of the earliest ones. Uh, now, although the slaughterhouse case uh, found no 13th Amendment uh, problem because it was dealing with, uh, it was looking at the uh, problem through the lens of private, uh, sorry, about property, uh, the court goes into the, uh, the right of a state, for example, Louisiana in this case, to institute laws that protect the health and safety uh, of the public. Um, and in that case, it was that a the state had designated one location, a single corporation, to where everyone had to uh, take their animals to be slaughtered. That was to make sure that local uh, jurisdictions weren't having noxious, uh, you know, fumes around from slaughtering cattle. In Butler versus Perry, it was one of the first times a case arose where a, a local statute, or sorry, a state statute, required all able-bodied men uh, of the age of 20 or, or above to uh, work six times per year, 10 hours per day uh, on building and maintaining public roads and bridges. And the court held that this was something that government had in its ability to, uh, anytime somebody was uh, work, uh, building roads near, uh, bridges and roads near their location, the residence, this was something that was done in the colonial period and before, even in England. So the court found no problem with the local government conscripting uh, local residents to maintain the roads. Then you have cases of citizen obligation. The selective draft law cases and Hurtado are examples. This is uh, uh, the ability for the state or for the federal government or state to um, coerce somebody, basically use the coerce power of state to force somebody to show up to trial once pro properly summoned uh, to provide testimony. That's Hurtado. Uh, the selective draft law cases dealt with obviously the draft and have to fight in war. In both cases, the Supreme Court was focused on the, uh, the, the duties that an individual owes to the state or the federal government in this regard to promote the administration of justice on the one hand in Hurtado. It's not just to promote or help you know, a litigant, but it was about the administration of justice itself. And with respect to the selective uh, draft laws, the cases, it was really about the ability of, uh, or the, the duty of an individual to be called to fight for the state once his representative determines that there's a war. Well, I bring all this up just to show that there is a link, a strong link in the jurisprudence between civic duty, civic responsibility, and freedom. In this regard, they're, they're seemingly inseparable. Now, with this, uh, this inseparability uh, being present, it doesn't necessarily lead to a normative principle on its own that would justify this type of conscription. But if we look deep at the 13th Amendment's underlying purpose, and if we look deep at the 13th Amendment's underlying history, we will find that that normative principle is there. And that is this. The 13th Amendment was largely geared towards creating a new polity. It was for the first time that African Americans who were enslaved were being brought into a political space to which they were uh, not invited. The Dred Scott versus Sanford case made it very clear that a, a black person can never be a, a citizen because uh, there was a natural inferiority uh, in the race. The 13th Amendment undid all of that reasoning with respect to whether or not a, a black American could be free. Uh, not only that though, that the uh, Reconstruction, um, the radical Republicans believed that the 13th Amendment uh, also allowed the Congress to declare citizenship. The Civil Rights Act of 1866 included a uh, citizenship definition. Now this connection is a strong connection to be bringing the, the new, uh, newly freed slaves into a polity. And my proposal is that we can look at the Reconstruction Amendments as a whole as being polity centered. And in that regard, we may be able to find uh, an affirmative uh, guidance for Congress, for local and state governments to really bolster civic engagement. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Correa, for that insightful presentation.
I'll, I'll begin um, with, with uh, Timon uh, uh, Klein. And uh, Mr. Klein, um, I've read, are you, are you there? Yes, uh, I've read yeah. the 19th century opinions. I, 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 in an earlier stage of my own uh, research into legal history, I immersed myself in 19th century judicial thought. And it is a fascinating world. It's very different from our own, our own world. Um, and one thing you, you rightly point out is they have a different, it, it's, it, it is largely, as you point out, state-based in the sense that we're dealing now with discrete states, Wisconsin versus Indiana and so forth. Uh, but it is, um, and the, uh, the police power is robustly construed and it uh, creates a robust vision of the state that looks after the common good. It is not, however, at all neoliberal. It is not, however, at all free market. We have strict laws on usury, for example. We have um, strict laws, for example, regulating what, what was called at the time price gouging and, and sometimes still survive today in price gouging legislation, particularly in times of emergency, but not only then. Uh, I'm going to ask you, how far will you go in re-implementing, if you will, this 19th century, very alien worldview? Are you prepared to, to reinstitute usury laws and, and to return to a 19th century vision of common good economics? I'll pose that question to you. And to, uh, to uh, Daniel Correa, um, the civic duty except, uh, exemption, exception. I mean, I've looked at, I looked at Butler versus Perry in particular, but some of the other cases also, and there are two big problems there. And one is a kind of economic oppression, and another is a kind of, of race and economic, uh, economic based discrimination. But I have another question uh, actually in mind, and that's this. Yes, I agree that uh, liberal thought has has taken it on the chin recently. And Patrick Deneen has certainly dealt some, uh, some serious blows, but so also has Michael Sandel. Michael Sandel uh, has, I think, formulated a, a robust response to liberalism centered on uh, not uh, the, this kind of uh, nostalgic return to a, a, a conservative worldview, but instead, on an idea of dignity inherent in every human being. Uh, Sandel is quite suspicious, for example, of words like um, meritocracy, because meritocracy, in fact, conceals um, all sorts of judgments about the worthiness or unworthiness of, of, of human beings and human life. So my question to you is, why Deneen? Why not Michael Sandel? And then, uh, Badri, my, my question to you is, um, the uh, judiciary and the um, and the legislative responses you've proposed, I think standing behind your, your proposals has to be, and I'd love to hear you elucidate this, has to be a robust theory of affirmative rights, rights that are, are, are um, to a certain status, a certain economic well-being, a, a certain set of welfare rights. And so my question to you is, that has, uh, we, we've certainly seen efforts in that. Uh, Franklin Roosevelt in his four freedom speech and, and, and other, in other contexts tried to give life to a robust affirmative vision of rights. But what would you say to Americans today uh, struggling with, um, you know, with uh, a sense of public goods in the absence of a strong conception of affirmative rights? Mr. Klein, if sure. you could go first. Yeah, um, to, to your question as far as um, implementation of, of, of a sort of a one-to-one -one transportation of 19th century uh, regulatory regimes to the present, um, even though I, I do myself think uh, usury should be outlawed, um, what, part of the, uh, the principles I've um, extracted from those cases, which you'll no, no doubt be familiar with, is the um, necessity of uh, prudential judgment with the, the legislatures as well as the, the courts reviewing um, their regulations. Um, and part of that, that prudence that is often, um, how it's often made concrete is through uh, recognition of or reference to what the, what the court presumes to be the common sentiments of the populace. And you'll see this in a lot of the cases in particular, 
that um, that deal with uh, with Sabbath laws as, as well, but other other religious elements. And part of the justification for upholding, you know, X Y Z uh, privilege for certain uh, religious sects early on is that it's uh, it's the common religion, so it's the common sentiment, and there's judicial notice of those things. Uh, but that expands beyond the religious considerations as well. And so I think to get around to answering your question, the um, what I want to extract are the the principles of of legislating and considering the common good and doing so. Um, and but being prudential in the in the implementation and taking stock of the uh, the context and the historical development since then, which can't be reversed, and uh, what people are or are not willing to accept uh, has to be uh, considered in implementing any kind of regulation. But I I think um, there is there's room um, to to so at least draw analogies. So people are unready to roll back twenty one percent interest rates and credit cards. <laughs> that that could be the case, yeah. You, it, that's up to the uh, the, the legislature. People are not out. ready for this yet. Perhaps not. <laughs> Professor Correa. Well, uh, <clears throat> thank you very much for the question, uh, Dr. Reed. Uh, I actually I enjoy um, I very much enjoy Michael Sandel's work. Uh, the Charity of Merit uh, touches on a lot of the same themes that Patrick Deneen touches on, especially in terms of the technocratic turn that the country has taken, which has really kind of disempowered uh, everyday Americans, everyday people, uh, starting with the dignity uh, of every single person and uh, the degree to which we, everyone's entitled to the type, same type of equal respect. I think that that, that uh, starting with Patrick Panin, it wasn't that Patrick Panin made the best argument, I, I don't think. It was more that Patrick Panin posed a challenge that I found uh, more workable for what I was uh, wanting to present, which was how can we institute practices? And there are practices uh, that we can institute right away. In terms of dignity, I think the background uh, theory, theories of uh, uh, Michael Sandel, I think that they also can be incorporated dire directly into the, the topic that I have here, especially since uh, the 13th Amendment itself, when we're dealing with freedom, the whole basic assumption was that it was about human beings and, you know, just how much human, every single human being was endowed uh, with the same equal dignity. And even though it's not spelled out so neatly in the 13th Amendment, which is kind of crude, crudely uh, mirroring the uh, Northwest Ordinance, I think the 14th Amendment uh, does a better job of speaking to that type of dignity. Now, um, in terms of how that's going to inform the way courts think about these issues, uh, dignity is not something for, you know, foreign to a lot of courts, but I think focusing in terms of what courts are more prepared or more readily uh, able to handle something like uh, what's involuntary servitude, uh, what's equal protection, uh, what does citizenship entail? Those types of questions are a little more tangible for courts, and I think they're more easily ready to wrestle with. So something like a challenge to some of the proposals I have would be met with something that a court can wrestle with the right way. On, on the other hand, let me just quickly respond, and that is we do see courts, the Inter-American uh, Court of Human Rights, for example, giving a very uh, expansive understanding of, of human dignity. Certainly, uh, the judiciary's d dignity is not an unknown concept to judiciaries worldwide. I agree. I agree 100%. Uh, a lot of times, though, in, in terms of the United States Supreme Court, uh, dignity does pop up, and it's interesting. Uh, it dignity pops up with respect to liberty in, in, as a whole. Uh, Lawrence v. Texas is an example uh, where uh, the majority opinion talks about liberty in a broad scale, about what human beings are entitled to with their own individual life, and there and here is inside that certain type of dignity. And there are also other discussions of dignity at the United States Supreme Court. I think it's something that is workable. Uh, it's just not something that you see uh, kind of you don't see it laced throughout a lot of liberty-oriented uh, cases. And so I, I could reorient it or at least really focus on dignity, but in terms of what I can, uh, what Americans are willing to work with as far as the court's concerned, I think housing it in terms of what they're already familiar with is a little bit more direct. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much again. Uh, it's been a wonderful informative symposium so far and we got to, uh, one more panel. I'm sure it's going to be the same. It's going to be fantastic. Uh, this last panel will cover uh, public goods in the realms of education, public health, labor, and employment.
and we will begin with a presentation by Dr. Elizabeth Shu. Elizabeth Shu is the Executive Director of the Columbia University Center for Public Research and Leadership and a lecturer at Columbia Law School. She has held a series of distinguished roles in higher education, research, and leadership focused on P-12 education. Most recently, uh, Dr. Shu was the Deputy Director at CPRL, where she was responsible for overseeing the project portfolio, directing project work, and teaching the practice of organizational challenge, change. Sorry. She began her career as a classroom teacher and earned her PhD in education policy from Columbia University, her MS in teaching from Pace University, and her BA in English language and literature from Yale University. Everyone, please joining, join me in welcoming Elizabeth Shue. Thank you so much for having me. Um, I'm Liz Chu and I'm very happy to be here today and, and to start off this last session. Um, so I'd love to share some of the perspectives and the research that we've conducted over the past 18 months at Sea Pearl at Columbia. What we see when we look out into the world and um, very carefully at the United States situation is that we see that public education is under attack. We are witnessing an organized campaign that's underway to abolish public education as an unconstitutional burden on families' right to exercise their religions and control their children's exposure to ideas. That campaign successfully fired its opening round in the Supreme Court in 2020, the case Montana v. Espinoza, which invalidated laws forbidding transfer of public money to parochial schools. Fueling this effort are doubts about public education generated by families increased transparency into and participation in public education during the COVID-19 pandemic and some parents resistance to public schools introduction of students to the nation's history oppressing black native and other populations. Observers widely attributed, as I'm sure many of us know, the surprisingly poor showing of the Virginia Democratic gubernatorial candidate in the most recent election to his statement in defense of public education that I don't think parents should be telling schools what they should teach. Um, and according to the victorious Republican opponent, opponent, that comment transformed the governor's race from a campaign to a movement being led by Virginia's parents. As a Democratic critic of the campaign summarized the loss, you cannot tell a group of people who have had for 18 months or so to have homeschool their children that their opinion about their children's education doesn't matter. Over the coming years, families' role in public education and family moves in response, we believe, would, will well determine public education's fate. So at CPRL, we are laser focused on ensuring that that fate remains public and equity driven. Uh, so who are we at CEPRO? We might be unique amongst the presenters here. We are a research and policy center that's focused on training the next generation of equity-driven education leaders. Together, our students and faculty advance equity, particularly racial and socioeconomic equity through the deeply intertwined study and hands-on practice of structural change in public sector institutions with a focus on public education. We work in multidisciplinary teams across the fields of law, business, policy, education, and data sciences. And our students use the full range of constitutional tools, ranging from redesigning institutional structures from the classroom to the district, state, and federal levels, to legislative and regulatory reform, to community mobilization and activism, to state and federal litigation. In this process, we equip law students and students from those other professional schools that I mentioned with the skills, mental models, and inclusionary practices needed to transform public systems and undo the systemic and structural barriers and conditions that create and preserve inequity. Our students participate in projects with state departments of education, school districts, charter management organizations, philanthropies, and other leading education organizations to catalyze structural change and advance meaningful reforms that benefit kids. Today, I would love to share some of the research that's grown out of our last 18 months of work. I am going to share my screen to do that. Breaking the chair. So over the past um, 
last 18 months or so, we conducted a set of research. And the driving question of all of that research has been, how, we might, how might we design an education system that prepares every child of every race and background to thrive in school and in life? This means that we've asked questions around student-centered education and what that means to kids, families, community organizers, um, education nonprofits, and instructional leaders. We spent a lot of time looking at what education looked like in this very challenging moment, focusing on what the bright spots were and look, also looking at the recurring roadblocks. We've also looked at the key innovations that have helped families partner more effectively with their children's school and community. And most importantly, we've considered how educators and system leaders can leverage this moment of disruption to build a more equitable education system that works for all students. Hold on one second, please. Um, as is fitting for this, my kids are in quarantine and enjoying uh, day five of being in our home together. Um, uh, in the course of our um, research over the past 18 months, we conducted um, much of our research was qualitative, which is what we believe is crucial when you're trying to really understand what is happening on the ground. We conducted over 600 interviews and focus groups to understand how families were supporting their child in the moment, how teachers were working with families to do that, and what it looked like from the instructional perspective. And then we also interviewed students, um, community-based organizations, and educators and educa education system leaders. Um, we did a particularly deep dive into nine participating school systems across the country, um, where we conducted 294 interviews with family members, um, educators, and instructional leaders, and those uh, nine districts spanned across seven states. We wanted to get a really good sense of what this looked like in rural, um, rural districts, urban districts, mid-sized districts, large districts, and charter schools and non-charter schools. What we saw across our sites and that is fueling a lot of our revitalization work this year is that when students were supported by high quality materials, a family or caregiver who was closely involved in their own educational experience and the school partnering together, um, those students were learning more or the same as they would have in a typical year. So this doesn't mean all students were faring well. I'm sure we've all seen um, the really disturbing uh, data around learning loss, but this means that if you had this combination of the fundamental for um, students learning was held um, up at consistent rates or better rates than it had been in the past. Um, so for, for the educators in our midst, we've tried to draw attention to um, this well-known construct in the education field of the instructional core, which traditionally has consisted of three points of teacher, teacher student instruction materials to this four-pointed core um, that speaks to how the moment of learning occurred during the pandemic for students. We see this as a big equity play. Um, when you involve families, there's increased supportive and observational capacity, there's increased cultural and community knowledge, and there's an opportunity for co-production of the learning experience, um, thinking about how to bring four different sets of um, materials and actors together to provide the best possible outcomes for kids. A, a bunch of the dialogue in education right now is around equity, um, what that means, how to make it happen. I think what we saw here is that um, focusing on this connection between the school and the home enabled a real localized and authentic sense of cultural responsiveness that we haven't seen elsewhere. Um, and we've encouraged it to continue to occur over the course of this year. So this brings us to the path forward. Like I said, a bunch of our research over the past year and a half was to understand and help people make it through the moment, but perhaps more importantly, given the work that we do to build stronger education systems, we wanted to um, figure out how to use the moment of disruption to build stronger systems um, moving, moving into the future. So what we have seen um, is we, we proposed uh, a set of guiding principles um, that the systems that we are working with across the country and in Brazil can use to make sure that they're building stronger educational systems. The first is to focus on equity to reach equality and justice. Um, this is a pretty strong break from how we see education systems organized to date, where the, um, the guiding principle to date has been a quality of inputs, often um, uh, inputs that are quite distant from the core actions of teaching and learning. 
we encourage systems to uh, focus on learning being the constant with making other things, operations, instruction, and time the variables. Again, a strong break with the past, where in the past, the inputs are the constant um, and learning is the variable. Some kids get to do more of it and some kids get to do less. The third is a focus on democratic participation and partnership with families, allowing families and kids a real role to play in figuring out and determining uh, what the learning situation should be. The fourth is a focus on effective, not best practices to drive student learning. The idea there being that we're not looking for silver bullet solutions um, that were uh, deemed effective in you know, one RCT, but we are looking to understand contextualized effect efficacy and that every system is built to constantly learn how to become ever better instead of settling on um, what is current being the best possible. And the last is um, making sure that student opportunity and learning are transcending traditional boundaries so that we're continuing to take advantage of the ways that we've learned um, different education systems and different actors within each system can work across the siloed nature of uh, classroom walls, school walls, um, district boundaries, et cetera. Core to this, uh, we have started working to reconceptualize what the educational process looks like. Um, and with the systems that we're working with this year, um, we are um, very much focused on this idea of individualized student-centered learning. This is an idea that's um, taken some hold in some high-performing nations such as Finland um, and thinking about how to surround individual students with teams that dictate their educational programming so that that team, which would include students, families, teachers, community members, other professionals would come up with individualized school and learning plans, monitor progress toward those, work together to solve problems, um, and obviously celebrate successes. This type of um, educational model obviously changes the, the school function and the function of school leaders and teachers. Um, and so we see the core school functions, therefore, around designing operations and allocation of resources, expanding opportunities um, for student learning, building and supporting those school family partnerships. Um, and we see leaders and teachers working in different ways. And one of the biggest changes here is that it requires real team-based efforts as opposed to highly siloed and individualized efforts. When we look to the system level, um, we see many changes in these types of education systems as well, where the, the district or the center um, becomes uh, the, the actor that specifies standards, that um, mobilizes resources and supports, that it works to achieve those econ uh, economies of sale, scale, and that facilitates that transparency about what's working, what's not, what services are being provided, what's not, and what disparities do we see both in terms of service provision and in terms of outcomes. There's been a lot described in terms of the fact that um, the, uh, sorry, hold on one second. Um, we continue to hear that this is an opportunity for equity-driven transformation, even though we also see a lot of fatigue in the system for making change happen. So in our continued work, and right now we're moving into implementation to help some of these changes take hold, we hear from families that they still want individualized learning plans, they still want um, those plans because learning acceleration requires it. Um, they see the influx of federal funds that have come into the system as an opportunity to make bold changes. Um, they continue to want to have trusting relationships um, with their public institutions and want to build on the trust that was fostered where it was fostered um, over the course of the pandemic. Students continue to tell us that they want a voice in what transformation looks like and without having that type of democratic participation feel um, very skeptical about the possibility of revitalizing um, public education as an institution. And they wanna see that their schools are preparing them for those 21st century careers and the fact that they're gonna have many of those over the course of what is their career. And doing so requires um, 
uh, really activating the second principle I described in terms of changing how, where, and when learning takes place so that it is variable and tailored to learning goals as opposed to a highly constant um, input that's consistent across settings. We also hear from teachers that despite their fatigue, they want to carry forward the new strategies um, and the lessons learned from the past 18 months. Um, there's a lot of fatigue that comes with hearing the drumbeat of the negativity of the past 18 months, not recognizing some of the heroic efforts that educators went to. Um, and one of, those, one of those positive stories is the fact that many educators um, have learned about how to partner effectively with families even across cultural and racial divides, which in the past have been an inhibitor in the public education system. And teachers want to see how these um, individual level um, uh, innovations are fitting into their school-wide goals. I will say that um, I've mentioned now a couple of times that we are focused on um, the implementation phase of this in our work. And so um, we are doing a couple of things coming out of the publication of our most recent reports um, and the research that we conducted over the past couple of years. And I'm happy to speak to those as is useful. But um, one, we are engaged in activities with a number of systems, both charter and traditional district to help them take hold of um, the innovations that worked and move toward these um, adjusted governance structures that would allow them to activate those five principles, thinking about organizing all of their activity around the student as the individual. And, and with those um, systems and across those systems and the charter organizations that we're working with, we're taking a deep dive um, look into the various um, state rules and regs that need to be adjusted um, some of the flexibilities that need to be maintained to allow states, um, to allow those individual systems to go through the types of transformations I've described. We also are working with um, uh, national philanthropy um, to help build the field of nonprofits um, that are supporting uh, school home partnership because um, we do see this democratic participation piece as essential to preserving um, our public system of public education. And a number of uh, nonprofits have cropped up that want to be doing this work. And so we are helping them um, help their local communities and work with their districts to help families engage with schools around the art of teaching and learning. Um, those are a couple of the many efforts that we have on way. I'm happy um, to speak to others, but I think the real, um, the real takeaway from our work thus far is that yes, the pandemic was challenging. Yes, uh, there was a tremendous amount of um, uh, sadness, despair, chaos that happened in the system. Uh, no, we don't want to repeat it, but we do in fact still want to learn from that um, and come out uh, the other side with a stronger and more equitable education system. Thank you. That's what I thought. I do have a question for Professor Chu. Uh, are you still there, Professor Chu? You might not be. Uh, Professor Chu, are you still there? No. Yeah, maybe, well, yeah. And if, uh, and when she returns, if she, re yeah, I've got, I do have a question. Perfect. That sounds great. Well, thank you so much. Um, up next, we have a presentation from Dr. Ann LaFasso. Uh, Dr. LaFasso is a professor of law at West Virginia University, where she teaches an array of courses and serves as the co-director of the West Virginia United States Supreme Court Clinic. She writes extensively about labor law and focuses her scholarship both on public policy solutions to workplace issues and the jurisprudential foundations of laws governing the workplace. She is known for her theory reconceiving labor law as promoting human rights. She currently serves as the vice chair for the West Virginia Advisory Committee for the U.S. Commission on Civil Rights. Professor LaFasso is also a graduate of Harvard College, the University of Pennsylvania School of Law, and the University of Oxford, where she wrote her doctoral dissertation on mass economic dismissals. Everyone, please join me in welcoming Dr. Anne LaFasso. <laughs> 
Well, thank you very much. Uh, I hope everyone can see and hear me. I just want to check the time I have. Do I have 15 minutes? Yeah. Okay, 15 great. To 20. 15 to 20. Okay, that's terrific. So I just want to thank so much uh, the Dean and Dr. Reed, who I've known for a few years now, um, Kendall, uh, the other students of the Law Journal, um, the other speakers and all the invisible workers who made today possible. I personally really appreciate all of your efforts, especially since I've been having major computer difficulties. Um, my talk is called Reimagining Labor as a Public Good, Deprivatizing Aspects of Work. Um, I'm gonna look at, I'm gonna have four sections to my, my presentation. I'm gonna start with the idea of neoliberalism and its effect on labor. Then I'm gonna look at historical attempts to curb the excesses of capitalism in regard to the workplace, looking at both uh, Teddy Roosevelt's um, progressivism and the New Deal under FDR. And then I'm gonna look at public goods theory and um, look specifically and highlight specifically that under under goods theory and how we char characterize goods, services, and resources that labor is typically viewed as a public good. And then I'm gonna ask the question, can we reimagine labor as a public good in a manner that, that accounts for human flourishing and try to give at least some potential solutions to, to that question. So first, as we heard this morning in the excellent keynote speak, by the excellent, excellent keynote speaker, um, neoliberalism values inequality, although it will justify that inequality as being based on merit. It also values individual liberty, but it, it does so from a particular point of view. And in the workplace, that point of view is invariably the employer's point of view. So we'll talk about how that affects workers in a second. It also values individual responsibility for one's own fate. It values that wealth accumulation and maximization. It claims to value competition, but we'll see that it actually in, in practice tends toward monopolistic behavior, or at least a, a lot of oligopolistic behavior. Um, it claims to have a minimum role for the government, but as we heard today, that really isn't a minimum role. It's actually quite a large role. And that role is enhancing private sector efficiency. Um, it discourages, it tries to minimize the welfare state and, the, as, and justifies that on the idea that the welfare state somehow discourages human motivation to work. It tends to eschew social problems and reimagine them as individual problems. It views firms as pro profit motivated, which is not a particularly controversial statement. And finance tends to control the main sources of capital and allocation of resources. And most, if not all of this, we heard this morning during the keynote. Now, neoliberalism's effect or, um, on labor is that it views labor as a factor of production, just like land, just like capital, just like a factory, just like anything else. Human labor, human labor is just a factor of production. And if you go into any economics class that talks about something to do with labor, you'll hear the idea that labor is a factor of production. It thereby ignores the human aspects of labor, particularly um, the values of dignity and autonomy. And as we stated earlier, liberty is viewed from the employer's point of view, not the worker's point of view. So while the neoliberal paradigm will su suggest that it is the paradigm that augments liberty, it's always at the expense of the liberty and freedom of workers. In fact, Hayek, who we also heard a little bit of today, famously wrote that workers will take any job on threat of starvation. And that's what they need, threat of starvation to take jobs. Actually, we're hearing some of that rhetoric today with the, um, the great, um, uh, what is it called, leaving the, leaving the work, exit of the workplace. So historical attempts to curb capitalism's excesses is my next section. We have Theodore Roosevelt here, and he is um, founder of the Progressive Party, uh, or at least the presidential founder. There were many progressives before him. Um, and his is very much a re reaction to the social and economic ills of the 19th century. So 
he believes in this idea of, well, business is getting big, business is abusive, and therefore we have to curb these abuses using antitrust laws. So we'll chop down, get more competition, we'll chop down business and that will be enough. And then we'll regulate corporations in order to uh, sorry, curtail these uh, business abuses. And he also promoted uh, enhanced consumer protection laws. And he's associated with the idea of the square deal, which um, was associated with him, although he didn't coin the phrase, based on his so uh, allegedly equal treatment of labor and management in mediating the famous 1902 anthracite coal strike. Under his administration, however, there was there was no um, uh, there was no National Labor Relations Act, nor was there even immunization of labor activity. So labor activity remained um, unregulated in many ways, um, became increasingly illegal during his time. Now, FDR saw things differently. He thought that businesses should be free to grow, but also that government and labor should be free to grow as a counterforce to business. So he views these um, market failures of, of business as social problems that one, government can fix, but also two, if not government through sort of a statutory flaw of rights for workers to walk, that labor could actually fix it through by um, collectivizing labor and then they can engage in collective bargaining. Now, government statutory flaw of rights originally was, um, temporary work relief programs and things like that, kind of like what we saw, not so much that we saw work relief, but the type of, type of temporary programs that we saw immediately in the pandemic. Um, then more uh, long-term solutions were the National Labor Relations Act, the Fair Labor Standards Act, and social security benefits such as unemployment, widows benefit for, and children, and retirement benefits. So what you see is that that the conception here under the New Deal is that, oops, sorry, labor is a countervailing power to business acknowledging its political, not just economic, political, not just economic nature of labor. So he's also, or this conception would include some sort of consumer protection. The public is our consumers of, of output and they wanna use this output and businesses are profit motivated and want to exploit inputs including labor as an input. So the idea is that unions collectivize their power, their power being their labor power, because individual labor power just doesn't have the kind of bargaining power vis-a-vis uh, um, -vis the collectivized business power. When you think about it, businesses are always growing. That's the nature of capitalism is wealth accumulation, capital accumulation. And so this is a way to counteract that. Again, none of this should be particularly um, controversial in terms of its description, though people can disagree with the philosophy behind this. So I want to move on to my third section, which is public goods theory. So economists have assigned two fundamental characteristics to goods, services, and resources, excludability and rivalry. We heard about that in the panel today in um, I think it was the environment as a public good or, or one of the talks that was something to that effect. And so I'll be brief in this section so that we, we just, I will summarize it so that we don't go over material that we've already talked about today. So excludability is the degree to which a good service or resource can be limited to only paying customers or conversely, the degree to which a supplier, producer or other managing body such as the government can prevent free consumption of a good. Rivalry is the degree to which one's, one consumer's consumption prevents simultaneous consumption by other consumers or reduces the ability of another person to consume it. Okay, so even with that relatively simple language in explaining that, there's still difficult concepts if you haven't had uh, public um, economics. And so oh, these are all the different types of goods you can have. So I'd like to give some examples of this. So rivalrous goods, are, there means the rival risk in consumption. When someone consumes a unit of that good, that good is no longer available for others to consume. And they can either be durable or non-durable. So non-durable means it's destroyed after use. So think of any kind of um, like an apple or a pear or any kind of food. You consume it and then no one else can use it. But a rival of this good that's durable is no one can use a hammer 
when you're using it, but when you're done with it, someone else can use that hammer. So, but often, sorry, non-rivalrous goods are typically intangible goods. So they can be consumed by one consumer and consumed by many consumers um, without preventing simultaneous consumption by others. So think of clean air, scenic views, broadcast television, national defense or public safety. Anti-rivalrous we're not gonna go into, but that um, is something just because I can't help myself and I like to be thorough. That's usually something that we talk about in intellectual property. Now, excludable or non-excludable um, goods, um, this is just a history of the literature that discussed this. And the important thing here is that um, basically this comes out of the 1950s and up through the 1990s, this is constantly being developed by economists um, with the idea that excludability may not be excludable versus non-excludable, but there might be a, it might be a continuous characteristic so that a good could theoretically be fully excludable or fully non-excludable or something in between. So an example of an excludable, excludable good would be um, when you make someone pay for something like going to the movies. And semi-excludable would be copyright infringement where you normally want someone to pay for it, but people can pirate the software. And a non-excludable good would be something like the lighthouse here or the scenic view here. Now, a public good has two defining characteristics. It's non-excludable and it's non-rivalrous. That means, as just to repeat, a good that is costly or in, impossible to exclude someone from using is non-excludable. So national defense, street lamps, lighthouses, and non-rivalrous. That means a good can't be, that can be used by more than one person. So collective consumption of the good um, is a good which all enjoy in common in the sense that each individual's consumption of such a good leads to no subtractions from any other individual's consumption of that good, national defense. When we have an army, you can't say, oh, I opt out and they can't defend me. So normally private goods and public goods are sort of the opposite, as you can see from this diagram. So private goods are rivalrous and excludable and public goods are non-rivalrous and non-excludable. The other two we're not gonna really talk about here, but for completeness sake, I've added them here to the slides. And this is just examples of a private good would be like land, food, clothing. A lot of these are notice factors of production, inputs. Public goods tend to be stuff, again, like national defense. Okay, this is just other stuff. So labor and work have typically been treated in the United States as a private good. So that means it's rivalrous, can only be possessed or consumed by a single user, um, may be subject to strong demand and fierce competition, which factors that could drive up prices. What's the price of labor? That's what's called a wage. And it could be durable or non-durable. So which I'll explain in a second. I know we talked about the concept, but I wanted to talk, say just a little bit about how we might think about that in, labor, in terms of labor. And um, excludable, it's excludable, a private good. So slavery was what I would call a durable good, private good. It's really horrible to talk about uh, humans in this way, but humans were treated as chattel in this country. They were privatized. Um, they were sold, alienated. So that's what selling is under property law. We had actually a really good discussion today, I think a little bit about that as well, Ex excludable. And durable because although there was some very bad treatment of slaves, extremely bad, it would still not be a good idea for slave owners to, to um, completely consume, um, that means wear out or even kill a slave because then they wouldn't get the work out of them. Although one thing, I was trying to think about something that could be non-durable and possibly, although I would never want to compare indentured servitude to slavery, because it was only a temporary private good and something you don't own but only lease, this would suggest it would be non-durable, that the so-called leaseholder wouldn't care if he or she, well, it would be he at the time, wore out the indentured servant. So there would be bad treatment in a different way 
both are horrible, horrible institutions, and I'm certainly not comparing the evils of slavery to those of indentured servitude. But I am just making a point about durability. So what I'm, my challenge here today was to sort of rethink about this neoliberal paradigm and whether or not there's a public goods paradigm that we can, we can conceive of with labor. And so I started thinking about, well, what are public goods? National defense, firefighting, police defense, infrastructure such as roads, but there's also soft infrastructure, okay? And also um, there's positive externalities that are, are, that are um, part of public goods oh, that are associated with public goods. So for example, education is a public good, but you can have, um, you can, you can have education as both a public education or private education and you still have that positive externality that happens with education. And we already spoke about the free market, uh, free rider uh, problem in markets, that markets are not good um, in, um, uh, in dealing with the free rider, so I'm not gonna go over that. Okay, so can we find, moving to my next section, can we find a model that accounts for human flourishing, a model for labor? So I just want to start with the obvious that I think is really a no-go right now in the United States. And I don't, you know, I'm certainly I think in my lifetime, and that is socialism. Uh, I think that we, uh, our first speaker was excellent in presenting this view. Um, and, but the United States has proven itself to be very skeptical of these types of views. But we could imagine a situation where well, labor as a public good would be the government would provide jobs for people. Now, having said that, in a pandemic situation or in um, like in the New Deal, the temporary solutions when there were no jobs, uh, we have done things like that. So we can imagine when the government would step in and provide for people. So there is a certain amount of, we can reconceptualize as a labor as a public good in that way. But what I'm looking for is something that might be something that we could actually get through Congress. So I decided to look at flourishing economics. So what is flourishing economics? And this would give workers something other than money, although money is really important, we're going to talk about that. Um, and also the other human capital responses to infrastructure. So government could, if you, I, you think about this, can invest in workers, subsidize um, businesses to invest in workers or invest in human infrastructure. Okay, so the idea behind flourishing economics is that wealth is not just the accumulation of material things, but the conditions of well-being. And there's many, many, I much, um, there are many sources on this, but the conditions of well-being would be some, things like basic needs for health and safety, human shelter, meaningful work, meaningful wealth, um, uh, community belonging, lifelong education, free movement, including transportation and environment. So how would we implement these conditions in a completely capitalist society? These would be very incremental. So they might look like affordable health benefits, um, health and safety like OSHA, things that we've actually done in our capitalist society. They might look at, well, you get a certain income, all right, to, in order to pay for your shelter. You get, um, uh, you know, maybe you get free choice in what you want to do. So you need to have a, a public education system. Uh, we really haven't been good at a livable wage, but we have done minimum wage acts, all right. And we've had, um, we we've also been interested in um, providing a statutory floor of rights, which enhances the working conditions of any of any job. Uh, we have added acts that talk about job training. Um, we've started doing telecommuting in jobs, starting with the government in the 1990s, where there was doing and more so, especially after the pandemic. And we also see um, some innovative employers bringing nature into the workplace with, with large um, natural light and open spaces and things like that. All right, so I'm not talking about climate change, which is a whole nother aspect, but I'm talking about just for the work. But let's get bolder. And I only have two more slides, so I'm just gonna take one or two more minutes. Um, universal healthcare could be a way of freeing, freeing employers from the burden of contributing to healthcare. 
And that was the idea behind Obamacare originally. But Obamacare, as you know, was cut back to Romney care, which was more of a capitalist solution to a, or a purely free market solution to, um, to the idea that in order for workers to flourish, they need health care. So we sort of missed that boat. And I don't know if we're going to have that opportunity again for a long time. What about a fair and living wage? Well, that's been, how do we implement that is really the question. Do we do it through unions with the, um, with the um, fight for 15, which has been somewhat successful, but places like West Virginia, where I'm from, um, have been very, um, have not wanted to have a 15, and you think about it, it is a lower standard of living here. So it's easier for say New York to absorb that than the economy in West Virginia, not suggesting that they shouldn't, just making an observation. There's also alternatives to um, money compensation, such as flexible schedules to accommodate chair, care, uh, child care. I loved uh, Professor Chu today, where she um, obviously had to accommodate her children. I thought that was a great example of how we're doing things like that. Um, but then we could also do other needs like and wants if people want to do other than childcare, although I think the childcare should be privileged among those, I can answer questions about that. What are the best ways to do to augment conditions of employment? Is it through a union model or a statutory model? Um, and meaningful work, the problem with that is it means different things for different people. But what it should at least mean is job training opportunities and educational opportunities so that workers can have the kind of job that they want. And then this free movement is really about commuting. So that's about infrastructure, which is why I would lump roads and high-speed rail in with computers. So, and let's just get concrete. This will be my last point. Um, in addition to this job retraining and income replacement, I think one thing we could do is take the WARN Act, which requires advance notice for a large employer. It has to be a very large employer, uh, the WARN Act, um, whenever they're doing a mass economic dismissal. And I'm suggesting what they do, and they do do this in Europe, they've done it with much success for many decades, is that instead of um, only having a bargaining representative, if you have a union, that if there's gonna be a mass dis economic dismissal or plant closing at your firm, that you are entitled at that point to a bargaining representative, even if you're not unionized. And I can speak more about that if you wish. So that's my presentation. Thank you so much for having me. And I did go over by three minutes and but thank you for your patience. Professor LaFosso, thank you so much for that uh, wonderful presentation. We really, really appreciate it. That was excellent. Uh, third on this panel is gonna be a presentation by Mr. D. Caleb Smith. Uh, Mr. Smith is a PhD candidate in the history department at Tulane University. Uh, before Tulane, he obtained his bachelor's degree in social science secondary education from Delta State University and a master's degree in history from Jackson State University. Smith has served as an instructor of record in the university's history department and center for public service. He has taught courses on United States and African American history. And aside from his uh, historical studies, Smith has taught courses on social justice and community engagement. He is also a past recipient of the Andrew Mellon Graduate Fellowship in Community Engagement and the American Society Legal History Small Research Grant. Everyone, please join me in welcoming Mr. D. Caleb Smith. Thank you for that warm welcome. Um, let me share my screen. All right, race law and aluminum, Harris, A. Parson, and 20 years of workplace struggle. Um, this essay presentation is a short insight to my forthcoming dissertation, uh, been on the shop floor too long, black labor after the 1964 Civil Rights Act. But this paper specifically is a result of me stumbling across uh, roughly 20 plus boxes of Harris Parsons' um, exhaustive Title VII lawsuit in the Amistad Research Center in New Orleans. 
Um, historian, mentioned, his, historian Timothy Minchin notes that the 1964 Civil Rights Act is often looked at as a culmination of protest. However, um, he notes that after the 1964 Civil Rights Act, and specifically Title VII, becomes effective, uh, we see that the Southern workplace enters another struggle that is institutionalized in the courts. Um, I use Harris Parsons' story in explaining the reality of employment discrimination from the shop floor to the courtroom. Um, on June 13th, 1984, the Daily Review of Morgan City, Louisiana featured a column titled Suit Result Stands. Uh, they stated that the United States Supreme Court refused to review an 18 year long legal struggle of a Kaiser Aluminum and Chemical Corporation worker who successfully sued the company over racial discrimination. A black laborer by the name of Harris A. Pars began his legal case against Kaiser in 1966 after the company failed to promote him to the position of foreman. He claimed that the company's decision to deny him his promotion was racially motivated. After a 1980 trial, the United States District Court of New Orleans awarded Parson more than $113,000 in back pay and interest, and the rest of the class over $3 million spread up across them. Harris Parson was a well-known union activist in the Kaiser Chalmette plant. Until 1968, he served as a steward for Local 225 of the Aluminum Workers International Union. After Kaiser entered a collective bargaining agreement with the United Mine Workers of America International Union District 50 in 1969, he became the recording secretary for District 50 and later the vice president of the union until 1972. During Parsons' tenure at the Chevrolet plant, he, had, he held several positions in low-level jobs and used his union leadership to advocate for job promotions among other Black employees. Despite Parsons' clear record of leadership, he was no prominent national or statewide figure. This essay allows for a reinterpretation of the civil rights movement by reaching beyond dominant narratives of protest demonstrations or major political figures in order to highlight how everyday workers use Title VII of the 1964 Civil Rights Act, which prohibited employers and unions and employment agencies from discriminating in hiring, firing, and job promotions because of race, religion, and national origin. To date, scholars of Louisiana have not approached the state's Black freedom movement of the 1950s and beyond through a labor and legal lens. The forthcoming pages navigates from the shop floor to the courtroom in order to argue that Black workers were essential to the law's effectiveness as their complaints shaped how the 1964 Civil Rights Act would desegregate workplaces nationwide. To complement their efforts, this essay vividly explains how civil rights lawyers seized on the ambiguity of the law to favor Black workers. In Louisiana, the collaboration of CORE, or the Congress of Racial Equality, and the Lawyers' Constitution Constitutional Defense Committee, the LCDC, led Black workers to successful class action suits statewide. Thus far, the legal deal, legal, legal duo's efforts are absent from histories of Title VII's aftermath. Looking at uh, the Kaiser Aluminum and Chemical Company, um, their, in, their endeavors in Louisiana, throughout the nation and abroad, the Parson uh, versus Kaiser story begins with the Kaiser Aluminum and Chemicals Company's expansion to Louisiana. The company shall met plant with the backbone of the St. Bernard Parish, Parish Parish's economy for nearly 30 years since its establishment in 1951. When construction of the $70 million plant finished, United States Representative F. Edward Aber called it one of the biggest booms in the economy in the state's history. For decades, the plant churned out uh, 275 metric tons of metal a year and employed 2,700 workers as its annual payrolls, payroll rose to a high of $95 million annually. Of those two 2,700 workers, roughly 400 of them were African-American. Um, the Kaiser's, the Chalmette plant was Kaiser's second endeavor in the state with its first in Baton Rouge. Uh, by 1960, Kaiser saw, uh, sought ventures in Australia and New Zealand. Two years after, uh, the Oakland, California-based company created the Kaiser Aluminum and McKinney Company in the Republic of South Africa and the Kaiser Aluminum work in West Germany. Uh, you also see Great Britain, Jamaica, and South Africa, as, as well as as Great Britain, New Zealand, Jamaica, and South Africa's other abroad markets. Looking at the Equal Employment Commission um, investigation of 1966, um, the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission um, was established from the 1964 Civil Rights Act and became effective and it was developed uh, when Title VII law became effective on July 2nd, 1965. In the investigation of Harris A. Parsons, 
The EEOC found that racial segregation existed at the time the agency received complaints. Both management and local 225 admitted that the company removed all blacks only and whites only signs within the plant in 1964, but segregated locker rooms, lunch rooms, and drinking fountains were still present in Kaiser Chalmette plant at the time Parson and Williams filed complaints. Representatives from the Kaiser's management department and local 225 union stated, stated that they were reluctant to desegregate the plant because of the racial atmosphere of the community in which the plant was located and the communities in which most employees live. Management contended that the segregated facilities remained as a result of an agreement made from a committee of employees, which included four African-Americans. After an on-site visit to the Kaiser Shao Med plant, the EEOC confirmed that the statements of Parson were true. Lunch rooms, shower rooms, locker rooms, and other space within the facility all had dividing walls to, desi to, to, to designate which areas African-Americans could use and which ones whites could use. Drinking fountains were electric coolers from which whites drank and auxiliary units fed by pipes from the parent fountain in which African-Americans drank. Kaiser Chalmette plant housed showers and locker rooms in two buildings near the main gate. In the case of the lunchrooms, African-Americans ate downstairs and whites ate upstairs. The African-American sections of the facility were small and poorly lit. The EEOC poster was only found on one bulletin throughout the plant. This was on a board used by the visitors of the plant. Both, both the Kaiser Company and Local 225 blamed each other for the present conditions of the plant. The union stated that the lack of affirmative action stemmed from the fact that no complaints were on file from workers. Kaiser's management claimed that no action was taken because complaints cannot be upon, could, could not be acted upon without union initiation and involvement. The EEOC said that management and union officials seemed satisfied with the status quo. The EEOC concluded that the segregated facilities and discrimination and employment practices would not be eliminated until the Kaiser Company and Local 225 actively worked together to improve the situation. The union insisted that all employees be assigned locker space. Since race dictated locker space, if there were no lockers in the African-American space, then white applicants would be hired and black applicants would be denied. The EEOC, the EEOC argued that locker space held the key to explain the racial disparities and opportunities uh, within the plant. The EEOC found reasonable cause to believe that Kaiser and Local 225 engaged in discriminatory practice and issued Parson the right to sue um, in August of 1967. All right. Harris Parson's case will not go to trial until 1973. Um, during, uh, during the time that he and other Black workers of Chalmette were awaiting trial, uh, we see that Title VII is in its early exploratory years um, in the first roughly uh, five to seven years of existence of becoming effective, rather. Um, we look at quarrels. Um, is the first Title VII case uh, ruled in favor of Black employees? Um, the court finds that the defendants have, initial, have intentionally engaged in unlawful employment agencies, pr employment practice, excuse me, by discriminating on the ground of race against quarrels and other African Americans similarly situated. Next, we see United States and Local 189. This case originates in Bugaloosa, Louisiana, roughly um, 70 miles or 40 minutes north of New Orleans. Um, the court ruled that seniority provisions of existing collective bargaining contracts that froze African Americans in low wage and dead end jobs violated Title VII. The court ruled that the, that the job seniority system was discriminatory and unlawful, and then ordered the defendants to abolish the job seniority system and established a system of meal seniority in those cases where one or more competing employees is an African-American hired prior to, this, to a certain date. In neither case, Quarles nor Local 89, did the court find that challenged seniority systems purposely disadvantage African-American workers. The decision in Quarles and Local, nine, Local 80, 189 did not deprive white employees of the positions they obtained and the pay they received as a result of prior discrimination. More importantly, the courts did not compensate black employees for their losses during the years of discrimination. Looking at Hicks versus Crown Zeller Batch, also originating out of Bugaloosa. This is the this was the first Title VII case uh, by trial to address uh, bias employment testing practices. Um, the Hicks case is the first district court level to address bias standardized testing in the workplace. This decision declared the Crown company's testing program unlawful. 
the case surrounds the use of the one look test, which also which asks totally non job related questions and targeted employees with little formal education, mostly African American. Um, the next case is Griggs. This is a Supreme Court ruling also seen as the Brown versus Board of Education of Employment Discrimination Law. Um, the US Supreme Court issued its decision in Griggs versus Duke Power Company in 1971, stated that under the act, practices, procedures, and tests neutral on face and even neutral in terms of intent cannot be maintained if they operate to freeze the status quo of prior discriminatory employment practices. The standard and limits of Griggs point directly to the Parsons store. Kaiser Chalmette plant, like many other Southern industries of the time, used the Wonderlook test, which many African-Americans and lawyers of the time of the period pointed out that was biased and placed blacks at a disadvantage. Aside from testing, Kaiser's referral process uh, of foreman applicants was inconsistent, where one foreman explained an applicant must express interest in the position. Another employee said that the applicant must be asked if he is interested in a supervisory position in 1972. Um, and the Roe decision coming from George on the district court level, we see uh, this is a leading case that prohibits uh, bias and subjective job refer referral prices. Now let's look at the Parson trials. The Parson trials um, began in 1973. Um, a final ruling was given in 1974 uh, by Judge Fred J. Casper. He noted that the process of the process for the selection of foreman is untainted by any overtones of racial discrimination. Um, Judge Fred J. Casper, Judge. Um, Judge Fred J. Casper judged Parsons' case as if his uh, as if his complaint was filed in 1973 during the time of the trial. At the time, there was one African American worker uh, promoted uh, or in a supervisory position. However, it was only the, this only this one African American employee was the supervisor of janitorial services at the time. Um, in 1978, um, this is the first court ruling in favor of the black workers for Parson and for Parson and the other black workers of the Chalmette Kaiser plant. Uh, here we see Judge John R. Brown, the district court judge erred in judging Parson's individual claim as if his promotion request had been processed under procedure adopted six years later. We conclude that the plaintiff's evidence of racial disparities in the promotions to foreman after 1965, the exclusion of blacks from such positions prior to 1965, and the testimony by individual class members of discrimination they suffered make a prima facie case of discrimination practices in the selection of foreman. Uh, Parsons' case would then go to the district court level in 1980. And by 1985, um, the courts would solidify roughly $3 million and back pay remedy for the uh, black works a part of the class action lawsuit. At the time, um, the African American workers of Shout Met um, won the Parson versus Kaiser case. Uh, the once 400 African American workers laboring in the plant um, was now down to under 100. With failed union and company negotiations to reopen the plant, the Parson case still haunted the Kaiser Company two years after its settlement. In December of 1987, the Crowley Post Signal newspaper mentioned the 18 year long discrimination case in conversation with Kaiser's industrial downfall. The corporation sought reimbursement from their insurance company for over $3 million in damages in the firm, damages the firm had to pay for discrimination against Black workers in the Chalmette plant. The, the fifth U.S. Circuit Court of Appeals upheld a lower court ruling that said Kaiser failed to give the insurance company of North America written notice of litigation in a timely manner. The article offers a complex, offers complex inquiries as to the relationship between the Parson case and the downfall of Kaiser Chalmette plant. The fact that Kaiser Corporation took insurance company of North America to court in attempts to retain damages from the Parson lawsuit years want to question the role in which the court case played in the definite the plant's definite closure. It is reasonable to argue that the 18 year long, that the 18 year long legal struggle solidified the downfall of, of the Shalmet plant. However, it can be argued that it played a role, even if a minor one. The newspapers that cite layoffs and union negotiation at Kaiser Shalmet plant during the 1980s are not race specific. The archival records that pertain to the court case do not mention how many black workers were laid off or how many were working the 
working at the time labor numbers to labor numbers diminished at the plant. With less than 100 workers total in the plant as of 1985, the majority of the once five, 400 black workers in the plant were obviously displaced. The period in which black workers received back pay was a blessing in disguise. At least they left with some financial pay, which was more than Kaiser could pay workers black or white during the period of mass layoffs. In the black work, if the black workers had won the 1973 trial, Kaiser would have been forced to promote them. However, there was no escaping the layoffs of the 1980s. With the Supreme Court denying a review of Parson's individual case in 1984 and the final settlement of the class approved in, in early January of 1985, the courts did not take into account the diminishing workforce at the Chalmette plant and calculated Parsons' back pay according to the difference between a foreman's salary and wages he actually earned during the period from September 1967 to June of 1982 with interest. The courts also adjusted Parsons' pension accordingly. As for the other African-American workers, the Louisiana District Court awarded back pay with pension adjustments based on individual claims. As a group, they received a substantial financial award that Kaiser could not afford to pay employees at all three Louisiana plants combined. From a pessimistic view, the Parson case is only a minimal or limited victory. When considering the back pay settlements took place after the plant failed to its knees, the law never corrected discrimination. Harris A. Parson and the rest of African-American employees involved in the case received justice only through financial remedy. Throughout the duration of the court case, black workers still labored in the same departments as they did when the 1973 trial took place. Parson himself was never promoted to the position of foreman. Whether the story of black workers and shower made plan is one of simply justice served or a limited victory is based on the tone of the reader. Regardless of how the story is viewed, the Parson case has a place in legal and labor history. The, is, the, the case is well cited from law reviews on affirmative action in the workplace to textbooks explains, explaining the development of employment discrimination law. Of course, I side of Louisiana used the 1978 precedent. 1978 appeals court decision in the Parson legal struggle as precedents in other Title VII cases in the future. Thank you. Mr. Smith, thank you so much for that wonderful and informative presentation. We really appreciate it. Um, one thing I forgot to say to the panelists too is we will have time for questions uh, after the panel is finished up. Um, so if you guys uh, are able to stay on, then we'll uh, get those questions asked once all the speakers have gone as well. Uh, our final presenter for the third panel is Professor Jennifer Will. Uh, professor Will is an assistant professor of legal studies at Hamlin University in St. Paul, Minnesota where she teaches employment law and legal research and writing to undergraduates and graduate students. Before she started her academic career, she first practiced at a large private law firm in Minneapolis and later is in-house employment counsel for a healthcare organization in the Twin Cities. Professor Will is a graduate of the University of Michigan Law School, where she was also a member of the Michigan Law Review. Everyone, please uh, join me in welcoming Professor Will. Thank you, Tom. And thank you, Professor Reed. I am grateful to the journal um, for the opportunity to be here. And I'm grateful to all of you who are still here for the last panel and the last speaker. I know you're all thinking about the clock and I'm gonna talk about the clock, so stay tuned. Um, as Thomas mentioned, I practiced employment law. I don't know if it was in my bio for almost 20 years before I started teaching. So today I'd like to talk about employment law reform. And specifically in the context of this conference, I wanna talk about the common good and uh, the public good that arises from uh, work-life balance and employee well-being. Um, and specifically, I wanna talk about the work week. And when I say work week, I'm guessing most of you are thinking, oh, Monday through Friday, nine to five, right? And that's not surprising because that work week has been with us pretty much since the days of Henry Ford. And when I say work week, you might also think about the Federal Fair Labor Standards Act, which was passed in 1938 following labor movements in the United States. And the primary purpose of the Fair Labor Standards Act was to protect factory workers from abuse. And one of the ways that the FLSA, as it's known, does that is to provide overtime pay to factory workers. And, um, excuse me. It's been a long day for me too, <laughs> as I 
as I sit and listen to all these speakers, I've got ideas in my head. Um, so at any rate, the focus of the FLSA was to protect factory workers from abuse. Um, and shortly after the FLSA was passed, the overtime threshold was set at 40 hours. And that's the standard that's been with us pretty much ever since. So there's two things I want you to know about the Fair Labor Standards Act. Um, one of them is that it was really designed at the heyday of the assembly line. The other thing that I want you to know is at that time, households with a primary breadwinner and a full-time homemaker were fairly common. That was 80 years ago. If you fast forward to today, and we have many more dual income households and many more single parent households. And when there isn't someone at home full time, taking care of all the domestic duties that we saw Professor Chu taking care of today, um, it's really challenging to find work-life balance when you're also working a 40 hour work week. Now, the other change that has happened since 1938 is that the economy in the United States has moved from prim primarily and predominantly a manufacturing economy to a service economy. So we have far fewer of those factory workers, so-called blue collar workers who are working on assembly lines. We have far, uh, far greater numbers of exempt service employees who are not subject to overtime protections. And what happens as a result of that, there is no limit on white collar work weeks. There's no limit um, or disincentive to work long hours as a white collar worker because employers don't have to pay overtime costs associated with white collar work. Um, so white collar workers not only work the 40 hour work week, they not only work from nine to five, but they often work outside those hours as well. So work-life conflict um, has been a problem. It's been an increasing problem for decades and we've made progress in trying to resolve that problem, but we haven't fixed it. And what I want to suggest today is that one of the primary reasons is the work week itself. Our rigid, unexamined assumptions about the 40 hour work week that has been with us for almost 80 years. So I want to talk about the fact that the 40 hour work week doesn't fit the modern family anymore. It doesn't fit the modern worker anymore. And I wanna suggest that we eliminate employer imposed office hours for what I'm gonna call remote ready white collar workers. And you're all like, okay, wait a minute. I've been sitting here for eight hours. Did she just say she wants to eliminate employer imposed office hours for white collar workers? And yes, I did. I really think we should rethink the work week, um, but I'm gonna talk you through how I get there. Okay, so this is what I uh, plan to cover in the next 15 minutes or so. I wanna talk about the nuts and bolts of the FLSA, um, just to make sure that we are all on the same page in terms of what the law provides. Uh, and then I wanna take a closer look at those demographic changes that I just described, how the workforce has evolved, but the FLSA has really not. And then I wanna talk about two solutions that have been commonly advanced um, for work-life conflicts. One of them is workplace uh, flexibility policies and the other one is four-day work weeks. These are both great ideas, um, but I am gonna to suggest to all of you that they have fallen short in part because they fail to examine the 40-hour work week itself as this unquestioned norm. So I'd like to suggest a completely different approach to white collar overwork where we don't have a formal work week. And I wanna show you how I think we could accomplish that by revising the FLSA. Where am I pointing to get this to advance? I'm good? There we go. Okay, thank you. Um, so first, some nuts and bolts of the FLSA. So you are probably all familiar. Fair Labor Standards Act requires employers to pay minimum wage, requires employers to pay overtime for hours worked in excess of 40 hours in a single work week. Um, but the FLSA does not apply to all workers. It never has applied to all workers. It contains a number of exemptions to the minimum wage and overtime requirements. And that's what we mean when we talk about an exempt worker. They are exempt from minimum wage and overtime. Um, so among the most well-known are the exemptions are the ones that we commonly refer to as those white collar exemptions. And most people think, and it's a common mis misconception, they think, oh, I get paid a salary, therefore I'm exempt. And it's not quite that simple. The Fair Labor Standards Act actually imposes under the regulations three tests. Um, before a worker can be treated as exempt from those overtime protections. So the first test is a salary level test. You're not just paid a salary, but it's a high enough, it's a salary at a high enough level to qualify under the regulations. 
Second, the worker has to be paid on a salary basis. So that means it has to be a true salary. It can't be an hourly wage in disguise. And the regulations have some rules about what it means to be paid on a salary basis. And we're gonna look at those in a moment. And then uh, finally, there is a duties test. So not just any salary worker can qualify for exemption, at least under the white collar exemptions, the duties have to be executive, administrative, professional, or in some cases now computer related in order for an employee to qualify for the white collar exemption. And in a nutshell, um, that's pretty much what the FLSA provides. And there have been some minor modest changes over the years, uh, but otherwise that basic scheme has been in place pretty much since the second world war. So how have things changed since then? The FSLA, FLSA really has not changed, but our workforce has changed a lot. I already mentioned the fact that we have far more women in the workplace now. Uh, we also have far more exempt service workers uh, because we move to that service economy and we have more technology. So as a result, a big part of our service economy, so that service economy grew, but technology also grew. So a big part of our service economy now consists of what we call knowledge workers. And knowledge workers, you know, they do their work up here. We no longer need a physical place to do physical work for knowledge work. And in fact, we don't need a physical place to do virtual work anymore either. And we used to, not that long ago. Uh, you used to actually have to go to your office to do the cognitive work because that's where all your files were. And then you had to go to your physical office to do your cognitive work because that's where your desktop was with the high-speed internet connection, right? But the rapid evolution of technology has brought us to a place where people can truly work from anywhere, anytime. And that brings us to a compounded pressures on the white collar workers where they really are working anywhere, anytime. They're not only working from nine to five, but they're working evenings, nights, and weekends too. And it's interesting, one of our panelists referred earlier today to a work uh, called The Overworked American. And that was actually from the 1970s, documenting the increase in working hours in the United States. Um, and it launched this huge debate about whether Americans are really working more now than they were. Um, in, at earlier points in history. And there's a, a, a book that I actually quote quite a bit in the paper I submitted for this um, symposium called The Time Divide. It talks about the fact that, believe it or not, average working hours in the United States have not increased dramatically over the years. They have become increasingly bifurcated. So the average has stayed the same, but we have some workers who are working far fewer hours than they would like they are our precarious workers in the gig economy who are cobbling together part-time jobs to make a living. And at the other extreme, we have workers who are working far more hours than they would like. And it's difficult for people to find jobs in between that accommodate a more reasonable schedule. And for my purposes today, I'm focusing on those white collar workers who are working the extreme hours because I see an opportunity to help solve that problem that might also uh, indirectly benefit our precarious workers as well. First, I wanna talk briefly about solutions that we've tried before or that we're talking about now to try to fix this work-life balance. So one I'm sure you're all familiar with is this notion of workplace flexibility. We talk about it all the time. We've made huge progress with workplace flexibility. So the Federal Family and Medical Leave Act was the first major statute um, that brought workers some relief. It gives um, covered employees, at least, uh, the opportunity to take up to 12 paid, uh, weeks of unpaid family and medical leave. Most states now have similar statutes. And uh, most employers, certainly large employers, have put in place their own workplace flexibility accommodations. They allow part-time work and flex-time work. Um, and these are all essential and really important policies to promote work-life balance. Um, but I see two drawbacks to them. One is they tend to only be available for qualifying reasons. That's actually a term under the FMLA, but it applies broadly to a lot of these workplace policies and leaves. If you have a covered reason for leave, you can take the leave. If you have a really good reason to be absent from work, but it doesn't fit the four corners of the statute or the policy, then you're out of luck. So that's one drawback with these policies. The other drawback I see is that um, the, the the way that workplace flexibility policies work, I mean, it kind of begs the question, flexibility as compared to what? These policies assume without question that the 40 hour work week is the norm, 
And so they treat the need to be away from work as some kind of anomaly, this weird exception, even though most of us most of the time are gonna have a need to be away from work during normal office hours. But this kind of exceptionality and exceptions-based approach um, runs the risk of, well, it does in fact um, create the risk of, of stigma for employees who take advantage of those work-life policies. Uh, there's a term for it in the literature, flexibility stigma. Um, and so even though these are very essential laws and policies and they've taken us a long way, they're not getting us all the way where um, I think most of us would like to be in terms of work-life balance. So one alternate solution that's getting a lot of press lately, and I don't know if the rest of you noticed this during the pandemic, I lost track of the number of articles I saw that were talking about four day work weeks and shorter work weeks, and we should all work one day less. And uh, the great thing about th that idea is that if all of us worked one day less, you wouldn't have that stigma, and all of us would have ideally a more reasonable work week, more manageable work week, opportunity for personal and family time. And in addition, advocates of the four day work week talk about some potential for work spreading. Again, we've got that time divide. Some people don't have enough work. Some people have really more than they would like, optimally. If we had shorter work weeks for everyone, um, could, we, could we reach a more reasonable mean? All, again, great ideas. The drawback that I see with the four day work week solution um, is that you know, a four day work week is still, still a work week and a shorter schedule is still a schedule. So if your day off is supposed to be Wednesday, but you can't get in to see the dentist until Thursday, you're going to encounter the same work-life conflict that you otherwise would under a conventional schedule. But there is another way to approach work and it's not new. And since many of you are from the Twin Cities, you may be familiar with this approach, but about 20 years ago, two human resources professionals at Best Buy pioneered an approach that they call a results only work environment or a row. And a more modern iteration of that is referred to as a star. But the idea under a row is that employees can work anywhere, anytime, as long as they get the work done. In fact, they can do whatever they want, whenever they want, as long as the work gets done. So the idea behind a row is that it's based on performance, and achievement, not on logging hours. And when they rolled out Row at Best Buy, they actually studied it. There were two social science professors from the University of Minnesota who studied it as a natural experiment unfolding in real time. And they interviewed employees and they watched the process unfold. And the research shows that a Row dramatically reduces employee perceptions of work-life conflicts. It improves employee well-being. It improves morale. It in no way detracted from productivity and it improved retention. So it was benefiting employers as well. So what the research is showing us that is that a row has the potential to dramatically transform employee well-being in the way that we work. And you're thinking, okay, this was 20 years ago. How come I've never heard of it? How come we're not all doing this now? Um, well, one concern that arose um, from Best Buy's perspective during, and the program went on for years, the implementation and testing of it, was an issue around collaboration. And uh, during the economic downturn, new CEO at the helm of Best Buy said, you know, we, we just need all hands on deck. Um, what I would submit to you is that a role was simply ahead of its time. Because even in the short time since Best Buy discontinued the row, Technology has continued to advance, particularly collaborative technologies. And so I'm thinking here of Zoom and Google Meet and WebEx, and I don't know what kind of, I don't know what we're using today for this conference, but our ability to collaborate remotely is dramatically improved. And so I'm looking at the situation we're in now and saying, now is the time for a row. Now is the time for a results only work environment. And so employment lawyer that I am, I asked myself, okay, you know, because the row was a, an HR initiative. They were kind of ignoring actually um, what were the legal implications. They said, yeah, we got to figure that out, but we're doing this great thing with our workers. So I looked at it and thought, what could we do from a legal standpoint if we wanted to start to think about our wage and hour laws in a different way? And in the context of this conference, if we're thinking about revitalizing public goods, 
how can we revitalize the FLSA? And the answer I found uh, was actually in the salary basis regulations for the FLSA. So remember I mentioned at the beginning that there are actually three tests to qualify for the white, car white collar exemption. And one of them is that you have to be paid on a salary basis. And don't panic, I am not gonna discuss this entire regulatory scheme. I just wanna make you aware that it's there. There's a lot that goes into the salary basis test, um, but I'm gonna take you directly to the general rule. This is what the general rule says for the salary basis test under the Fair Labor Standards Act. It says to be paid on a salary basis, an exempt employee must receive the full salary for any week in which the employee performs any work without regard to the number of days or hours worked. Now the emphasis on the slide is mine, but that is what the regulation says right now. That's what the current regulations say and what they have said for decades, without regard to the number of days or hours worked. So I want you to notice here that already the regulations contemplate that days and hours worked are not of paramount importance for uh, white collar workers. The other thing I want you to notice here is the white collar on the white collar worker. I spent a fair amount of time trying to find a stock photo with a prominent white collar. I'm not sure it shows up on the screen as well as I would like it to, but I spent time on that because I want to argue for the no collar approach to exemptions. So I'm proposing that we change the test for exemption to add language and, and the green language is mine. It's inserted in the regulation that you just looked at. So nothing else has changed, but I'm suggesting that we could add language that says exempt employees must not be expected to keep regular office hours or report for scheduled shifts during the week. And I think that until now by requiring white collar workers to be in the office from nine to five, we have essentially been treating them like white collar workers. And that's not surprising because until very recently, you had to be at work to work. Like if you weren't at work, you weren't working. So employers had a very legitimate reason to be tracking attendance, but that is no longer true. And if employees do not be, need to be in the building from nine to five to get their work done, there is no reason for us to hold them captive there and hold that time captive from other uses um, because they can get their done, work done more freely on a different schedule. So I see no collars in our future of work. Um, I think if white collar workers were free from standard hours, uh, working hours, they would have more flexibility and fluidity to integrate work life obligations and do work, professional work when it's appropriate to that work and do personal work when it's appropriate um, to personal demands. The other benefit that I potentially see of this approach is that obviously there's gonna be some people currently classified as white collar workers who can't be given that kind of scheduling freedom. They can only still do their jobs at work. Somebody who works in a healthcare clinic, for example, assisting with patient care. And my response to that is, okay, if we really need to tie up their time from nine to five, then we really should be treating them like hourly workers and paying them overtime. So the suggestion that I'm making is that we redefine the exemptions and it would mean that some workers are reclassified as non-exempt those workers would then become entitled to overtime protections. And so you'd have, um, and I know I'm getting short on time here, but you'd have pressures working both ways. You'd have those newly no collar employees who have the scheduling freedom to be as efficient as possible with their time and might still work as much, but in a more flexible way, or they might work less because they can use their time more efficiently. And on the other hand, you'd have newly reclassified non-exempt workers whose employers now suddenly have an incentive um, in the form of overtime to be more thoughtful about their hours and perhaps spread the work, which was the logic of the FLSA from the beginning and could help us address some of the precarious work issues that I mentioned earlier as well. Um, so this is, that's my vision of the new world of work. And I had hoped to save some time for questions at this point, I'm not sure I've done that, but thank you all again for hanging in there to the end of the day. Thomas, I, I, I do have a question for each of our, our speakers, and I'll begin with Professor LaFasso. And uh, Professor LaFasso, um, I'm going to hearken back to conversations we had uh, several years ago and ask you, uh, because uh, we, we did talk about this, what role Catholic theories of, of labor might play in, uh, in the model you set forward? I know we've talked about the encyclicals of of John Paul II, we've talked about the uh, the work of Pope Francis, and we've talked about uh, John Paul II's uh, encyclical uh, Laborum Exercens. Uh, 
on the um, on uh, his work on labor and uh, his uh, exalting of the uh, dignity and humanity of work. And we've also spoken about Pope Francis and, and Pope Francis's uh, admonition that we must avoid an economy that kills. How does that uh, color uh, your presentation today? Um, and then I'm going to turn to uh, Mr. Smith, Caleb Smith, wonderful presentation. A oh, wonderful presentation, very good, very deep, very rich archival research. And, uh, but I do have a question. And, and the question uh, uh, pertains to some uh, contemporary implications of your work. And, and you reach the conclusion uh, that um, damages were paid, there were no promotions granted. Uh, and, and all of this actually leads to a fairly tragic sense of, of, um, uh, of only partial relief uh, granted. So let me ask, uh, uh, relating your presentation to uh, larger themes about the public good, uh, would a more active judicial oversight of employment relations, would a, a, a system of remedies that ensures not only back pay, that ensures not only the payment of damages, but ensures uh, courts actively involved in ensuring that uh, workers be promoted, workers be retained, that workers have, have their rights ensured and guaranteed in the workplace. Would that uh, help to serve and promote the public good? And then um, uh, Professor Will, um, uh, Two observations, really. First, I'll begin. Uh, I saw the news at noon today. I took a brief break and checked the news. And uh, we are seeing even more labor unrest than we saw in the month of August. The quit rate is higher than it was in August. We set another record. Four million people quit their jobs in the month of September, which is a truly astonishing figure. Uh, and uh, which speaks to, I think, a, a deep dissatisfaction with the workplace. But let me also ask, with uh, the um, with the row star system you outlined, there is a potential for abuse, isn't there? The tasks might become more complicated. The tasks might be uh, seen to be prolonged. Uh, they're left undefined, ill-defined. There is a potential for, uh, if we don't have some set hourly limit to the work week, the work week becomes even more expansive than it already is. Uh, how do we remedy that problem? So I'll, I'll pose these questions to each of, e each of you three. Thank you. Okay, so I assume that I'm going first since I was asked first. So thank you for the, that question. And because of that question, I will add a section to the paper on how this fits into Catholic thought. Um, I think it fits very well into Catholic social thought insofar as that focuses on the humanity of labor as does do all of my theories. And in fact, I'm very influenced by Catholic social thinking as you know. So the idea is that um, labor is not a commodity. So it's not to be seen as merely a factor of production, that, um, that you have to think about the dignity of the worker and how, and part of that is their spiritual well-being, which, um, and part, that would go in very well with, that part of it would also go in very well with the idea of human flourishing theory. So the economics that has been coming out on human, human flourishing fits really nicely into Catholic social theory. Um, that is very, you know, this is not just Pope Francis, this is um, even the more conservative popes that have written, as you know, for over a century about how important it is for workers to be treated with dignity and um, respect in the workplace. And that, um, as I think probably everyone, um, or most, the, at least the Catholic students in this room would know, that the popes have talked about the excesses of capitalism. Um, and they also have concerns about the excesses of socialism. But my, my um, proposal is I expressly did not, I expressly put aside and bracketed um, this as a socialist reform and instead talked about how this can be viewed 
even boldly within a capitalist system like the United, an advanced capitalist society like the United States. So I think it fits in really nicely in the, but through the values of human dignity and the, the, um, the negation of labor as a commodity. And, and, and if I could follow up, Laborum Exertions is one of the most fascinating encyclicals I, I've ever read because John Paul II takes Karl Marx very seriously and seems to admit that Marx is at least half right. That there right. is a real danger of commodification of labor. There is a real danger of, of, of dehumanizing work. And he, he sees this as a real danger and he wants to create a, an alternative system that is not capitalist, but also not socialist. Yes. I think one of the problems that we have in the United States is that we hear the term, if we talk about Marx or anything we don't like traditionally, it becomes radioactive and we don't, then we're not able to learn about the good aspects of those society. We're actually seeing it right now when we're making radioactive um, all critical race theory based on misunderstandings of critical race theory. We're seeing, we see it all the time on things. So we've seen it clearly with, um, with Marxism, and yet Marxism, um, Marx's thinking was a, was out of a concern for the worker being truly um, devastated and treated inhumanely during um, the 19th century. So I think anyone today would agree with with those concerns about the exploitation of labor. But Marx's conception of exploitation, most of us would agree with, but we would never want to ever cite Marx for that, for fear of being called a, a communist, not even a socialist. Mr. Smith. Uh, you're, you're, your microphone is muted. Yeah, no, you're good. Sorry, sorry. But the answer to the question uh, I was asked was yes. Um, through the latter through the 1970s, 80s, and even the 90s, we see that the complaints and the the trials based on black labor actually open up avenues for other minority groups such as women, immigrants, um, and those of the LGBTQ um, presentation. They also benefit from um, a lot of the barriers of discrimination being broken or being diminished uh, by black worker complaints. And, and should the courts be more active in ensuring promotions and, and, uh, and overseeing employment relations? Yes, yes, they, they, they should. And by 1972, the EEOC is more aggressive with this uh, when the EEOC finally has the ability to issue cease and desist orders. Um, so we see a lot of the affirmative action policies um, also being, I guess you could say, advocated um, and pushed forward by the EEOC. Thank you. Professor Will. So I neglected to bring a pen with me, but I think you asked me three questions. <laughs> great, great resignation, potential for abuse, potential for unlimited work weeks. Right. So great resignation, I think, is a fascinating phenomenon that really does reflect deep dissatisfaction with work arrangements available to most Americans in the United States today. And I am optimistic that some of what I envision for a no-collar workplace is going to happen organically because employees have already been working remotely. They have already tasted this opportunity to not commute, to pick up their child from school at three o'clock and then get back to their desk. And it's gonna be really hard to go back. So I think there will be some organic development arising out of that as well. And especially when employees are willing to walk as part of the great resignation, mm -hmm. if they can't keep some of those benefits, I am optimistic that we're gonna see a lot of what I'm proposing here from a government standpoint, just organically. In terms of the possibility for abuse, so the HR professionals at Best Buy who designed Roe um, also wrote a book with a very colorful title that I won't quote here about work and about Roe. And they responded to that criticism because people often, the managers in the rollout sessions would say, well, how are we gonna, how will we know if employees are working? And they said, okay, how do you know they're working now? <laughs> because when you're doing exempt cognitive work, it's not visible. And they could be sitting at their computer daydreaming about what they're gonna have for dinner, or they could be sitting at their computer on Zillow or Facebook or any number of other. So the idea is that if you can 
truly focus, if we can get away from this idea as time as a measure of productivity, and you can really define objectives um, and benchmarks and milestones and measure the performance, that you will um, be in a better position even to protect against those abuses than you are now with a time measured economy uh, or arrangement. And then with respect to um, the potential for runaway work weeks, I mean, I would say, frankly, based on what I've observed from my own peers that were already there, I mean, there's just, there's just no limit. There's no, there's no, there's no limit. Well, the interesting thing is a couple of things. So the research shows that um, even employees who work 45, 50, 60 hour work weeks, that the flexibility is more valuable to them than the time. So once you get beyond a certain like critical mass of hours, having that flexibility and the, the row authors of this book will even say, your work hours may not go down, they may even go up, but your perceived work-life conflict, the actual conflicts you experience between your work obligations and your home obligations are diminished because you have more scheduling autonomy to, to work around those things. So work hours may not go down, they may go up, um, but the research says workers prefer that. Um, but interestingly enough, the most recent research shows that it doesn't happen. So um, the STAR is this kind of subsequent iteration of Roe. Um, the Best Buy team and those sociologists from the U designed a, a new um, but very similar uh, work um, program to a Roe, and they studied it and they published a book in 2020 called Overload. Um, and they, they specifically studied ours and concluded that it, they did not actually increase. You know, on an individual basis, of course, some people's hours went up and some people's hours went down, but on, on an average basis, they did not. So I think that was your three. Yes, thank you. All right, well, I will make my closing remarks really short, but I just wanted to thank a handful of people. Um, thank you for all the speakers that spoke today. Um, your insight and information was incredibly valuable and was super timely and all related in a very like co cohesive way, even though it was very different topics. Um, I'd also like to thank everyone at St. Thomas that helped put this together. So Angela Bizek, Carrie Hilger, Henry Bishop, and a huge, huge, huge thank you to Xander for helping us out and making this hybrid symposium possible. Um, I also wanna thank everyone on JLPP, specifically Thomas and my amazing committee for helping to plan this event. And for all of you that are still here in person, I really appreciate it. Um, and then lastly, I just wanna thank Dr. Reed for all your support, um, assisting in this symposium and making it happen. Well, thank you. And that concludes our and I symposium. I wanna thank Kendall and Thomas and everybody else. Thank you. <laughs>